Section 44 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. German Wounded in the Gallery of Mirrors, Versailles, by Victor Bachereau Reverchon, French artist, 1842. Painting, page 248. In the Palace of Versailles there is one room, the superb Gallery of Mirrors, that has seen strange vicissitudes. It was built by Mansart in 1678. It is 240 feet long and 43 feet high, and has 34 great mirrors. It is richly ornamented with paintings and trophies, and is the most splendid room in the whole splendid palace. During the siege of Paris by the Germans, the floors were trod by softly stepping nurses instead of nobles and mighty potentates, and the mirrors reflected cots of wounded soldiers instead of the exquisite gowns of beautiful women and the insignia of royalty. For the most magnificent apartment of Versailles was turned into a hospital for wounded German soldiers. The palace has had an eventful history. At first, Louis XIII built a tiny hunting lodge in the woods and planned a great chateau. Louis XIV, instead of a chateau, built a magnificent palace, lavishing vast sums upon it. In 1682, the court came to Versailles, and for over a hundred years it was the principal residence of the French kings. Here, Marie Antoinette, played at being a peasant dairymaid. The great halls have been the scene of important historical events. Here was signed the Treaty of Peace between France and England, in which Great Britain recognised the independence of the United States. Here the Paris mob swarmed and drove Louis XVI and his Queen to Paris for safety. In the Franco-Prussian War, the Germans used the palace's headquarters and it was here that, on January the 18th, 1871, the King of Prussia was proclaimed German Emperor. The inscription on the central building, to all the glories of France, is justified by the collection within. Hall after hall is filled with pictures commemorating historical events, with statues, busts, and portraits of famous people, plans of important battles, allegorical paintings, views of royal palaces, and arms of crusaders and kings. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Sung for LibriVox.org by... Alan Mapstone. The Watch on the Rhine by Max Schneckenberger. This was a favourite song of the German soldiers during the war of 1870. The Editor. A voice resounds like thunder peal, mid dashing waves and clang of steel. The Rhine, the Rhine, the German Rhine, who guards today my stream divine. Dear fatherland, no danger thine, firm stand thy sons to watch the Rhine. They stand a hundred thousand strong, quick to avenge their country's wrong. With filial love their bosoms swell, they'll guard the sacred landmark well. Dear fatherland, no danger thine, firm stand thy sons to watch the Rhine. 
the dead of an heroic race from heaven look down and meet this gaze he swears with dauntless heart o rhine be german as this breast of mine dear fatherland no danger thine firm stand thy sons to watch the rhine while flows one drop of german blood or sword remains to guard thy flood while rifle rests in patriot hand no foe shall tread thy sacred strand dear fatherland no danger thine firm stand thy sons to watch the rhine our oath resounds the river flows in golden light our banner glows our hearts will guard thy stream divine the rhine the rhine the german rhine dear fatherland no danger thine firm stand thy sons to watch the rhine End of section 45. This recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. Germany, Part 8. Modern Germany. Historical Note. The success of the Prussian arms aroused national pride. A closer union was again the cry, and in 1871, King William I of Prussia was proclaimed German Emperor, this title to be hereditary in the Prussian dynasty. With the consolidation of all the German states under the leadership of Prussia, and the recognition of the new empire as the dominant military power on the continent of Europe, Germany entered upon a period of great prosperity. Emperor William I was succeeded by his son, Frederick III, whose short reign was followed in 1888 by the accession to the throne of William II, the present emperor. This most independent of princes regarded nothing as too small for his attention, nothing as too great for his control. During his reign, Germany has built up a colonial empire, created a powerful navy and merchant marine, extended her commercial and industrial activities throughout the world, and increased her manufactures more rapidly than any other country. The German Empire of today is a union of 26 states under the presidency of the King of Prussia, who has the title of German Emperor. The Reichstag, or Parliament, represents the nation as a whole and consists of about 400 members who are elected for five years each. The executive power is held by the Emperor and the Cabinet is responsible to him and not to Parliament, as in England. End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, edited by Eva March Tappen, Section 47, Bismarck in the Reichstag and at Home, about 1880, by George Makepeace Toll. Karl Otto Eduard Leopold von Bismarck Schönhausen to give his full quota of names, was born in 1815. He followed the traditions of his ancestors and entered the public service. At the accession of William I, he became the head of the Prussian cabinet and minister of foreign affairs. His aim was to drive Austria out of the confederation to unite Germany and to bring it to the front rank among the nations of Europe. 
the seven weeks war in eighteen sixty six broke the union between prussia and austria and made it plain that prussia was the most powerful of the german states bismarck's next aim was to win the south german states and in pursuit of this he was more than willing to push on a war with france the success of the german army brought about an enthusiasm and strength of patriotism that resulted in the coronation of william in eighteen seventy one as german emperor now that the empire was established the great chancellor aimed at the victories of peace he skilfully kept clear of international entanglements and formed such alliances as would best conduce to the greatness of the country between him and the emperor william i there was a strong and sincere attachment but when after the short reign of frederick william the second came to the throne trouble arose bismarck had ruled the land for too many years to submit to an autocratic young man of twenty-nine the result was the minister's resignation he died in eighteen ninety eight as has been well said he found germany a group of jealous kingdoms and principalities the shuttlecock of austria and france he left it a united nation one of the world's great powers and the dominant force on the continent of europe the editor it is interesting to observe bismarck as in the legislative palace at berlin he sits on the central bench of the reichstag which is set apart for the imperial ministers he usually enters just before the house is called to order and with a haughty nod here and there sits plump down into his chair apparently unconscious of the multitude of eyes that are fixed upon him he begins at once his work of signing papers glancing rapidly over dispatches and giving orders to the secretaries who stand by now and then he throws a quick glance across the chamber then settles down again folds his arms across his breast and seems to be carrying on a double process of listening to what is said and of meanwhile thinking hard but if herr lasker or herr hennel happens to be delivering an eloquent tirade against the government you can easily read upon the chancellor's grim face and in his nervous petulant movements the emotion which is agitating him he is not one of those nerveless men who can listen with a stolid face and contemptuously placid smile to the invectives of his antagonists irritable imperious yet thin-skinned and sensitive bismarck never seems to care to conceal the annoyance or anger so easily aroused in his breast by opposition at such a time you will see him contract his bushy brows look rapidly around the chamber as if to take stock of his enemies and finally rise to his feet amid a sudden hush and breathless attention in a delivery broken abrupt spasmodic with a voice husky and apparently always finding its breath with difficulty except at certain moments of high passion when it rings out strong clear and defiant with his big hands clutching the shining buttons of his military tunic or savagely twirling and twisting a paper or a pencil he proceeds to reply to the attack his round gray eyes flash brightly and fiercely his large frame sways to and fro his face grows red his legs are sometimes crossed and suddenly drawn wide apart and he goes on in the simplest clearest frankest language to justify his acts and repel the assertions of his antagonist every one is astonished at his frankness his blunt avowal of his motives his unequivocal declarations of future policy his merciless handling not only of his immediate opponent but of all his opponents and of men and courts outside of germany it is a part of his adroitness to seem imprudently frank his apparent imprudence and recklessness are 
we may be sure calculated beforehand but there can be no doubt that his wrath is genuine or that the greatest difficulty he encounters in debate is that of keeping in check his most unruly temper when we follow bismarck from the chancellerie and the reichstag from the palace and the council chamber to his homes in the friedrichstrasse and at warzen he appears to us under many fresh and more pleasing aspects for this grim iron-souled chief whose courage will determination and despotic temper are so irresistible on the public arena is really one of the most human of men he is still though often oppressed by well-nigh insufferable neuralgic pains as fond of a frolic as a boy he is far happiest in his home surrounded by a family than which there never was a family more tenderly and chivalrously beloved he has a great affectionate generous heart his ardent devotion to those who have won his love is in the mouths of all germany his home too is a temple in which the household gods are many in speaking of his quiet domestic sweet-tempered wife he once said she it is who has made me what i am at one of the most brilliant periods of his life he wrote to this congenial partner i long for the moment when established in our winter quarters we sit once more around the cheerful tea-table let the never be frozen as thick as it will these winter quarters were the massive three-story house number seventy six friedrichstrasse the chancellor's official residence a sentry's box at the front gate indicates its public nature within liveried attendants moving to and fro betray that this great man simple and robust as are his tastes must still maintain some show of state the broad stairway is adorned by two stone sphinxes which seem to symbolize bismarck's policy if not his character beyond are the larger apartments of the house the drawing and reception rooms while still more remote and only accessible to those especially honored by bismarck's friendship is the large plain curiously furnished library where he at once performs the burden of his labors and takes his chief comfort the windows of the library overlook an umbrageous park the room itself is garnished with suits of armor boxing gloves foils swords and other paraphernalia of war and the manly arts time was when bismarck used to sit there drinking big draughts of mixed porter and champagne smoking a bottomless student pipe and working like a giant till far into the earlier hours of the morning latterly tortured by neuralgia he has given up these midnight indulgences and labors and sits with his family in the common sitting-room it is not here in the friedrichstrasse however amid the bustle of the crowded city and swarms of officials and satellites that bismarck takes his chief delight it is only at varzin near by his ancestral home among the scenes of his mad and rollicking youth that he most fully enjoys the luxury of living when away he is constantly longing for varzin he once said i often dream that i see varzin all the trees that i know so well and the blue sky and i fancy that i am enjoying it all ample acres and all the appurtenances of a prosperous and well-kept landed estate surround the spacious pomeranian mansion of the chancellor the stables shelter many thoroughbreds the kennels are crowded with bismarck's favorite dogs the conservatories teem with rare fruits and flowers and in all these things the master takes a keen and watchful interest but he is most often found at varzin as at berlin in his study this is a six-sided apartment furnished with rugged simplicity an enormous chimney and open fireplace fill in one of the corners on either side of which rises a column bearing a coat of arms on an emblazoned shield bismarck is proud of his blood and his ancestry after the french war he added to his coat of arms the banners of alsace and lorraine and chose as his motto trinitate robur my strength in trinity 
an old family device and suggested a friend it may also signify my strength in the three-in-one god quite so replied the prince gravely that was what i meant a bust of the emperor surmounts the chimney while before it there are placed two stiff high-backed chairs the walls are adorned as bismarck everywhere is fond of adorning them with many curiosities there are tunisian sabres and japanese swords russian hunting knives and braces of pistols military caps and quaint bits of armour the furniture of the room comprises sofas divans and the chancellor's writing-desk covered with green cloth and having upon it a white porcelain inkstand and a two-armed student lamp on a small table at one side is a large bible evidently much used everything is solid plain and substantial like bismarck himself this feature of simple comfort is discernible indeed throughout the house nor is it without its mysterious staircase such a one leads from a corridor into unknown regions the castle keep once asked a friend pointing to the door that is my sally port said bismarck and he went on to explain that it led to a path in the woods whither the great man was fain incontinently to retreat when threatened by a raid of unwelcome guests many of bismarck's most attractive personal traits are hinted to us by his surroundings once within the serene atmosphere of barzen the stern chancellor becomes the devoted family man the enthusiastic sportsman the frank and talkative friend and even the genial wit those who have been privileged to hear his conversation declare it to be replete with brilliant sallies humorous hits and graphic descriptions at his ease he is one of the frankest most genial most entertaining of men adamant as he seems in public he has been known to feel so bitterly the stings of hostile sarcasm and criticism as to give way to fits of weeping when during the austrian war the german generals desired to push on and invade hungary bismarck strenuously opposed the project but his arguments were in vain chagrined at his failure to convince them he suddenly left the room went into the next threw himself upon the bed and wept and groaned aloud after a while he says there was silence in the other room and then the plan was abandoned his tears had conquered where his arguments had failed his mode of life is peculiar being often sleepless his usual hour of rising is ten in the morning his breakfast is simple consisting generally of a cup of tea two eggs and a piece of bread at dinner he eats and drinks like a true pomeranian copiously and freely his princely appetite indeed is described as being truly voracious his table groans with a superabundance of rich and indigestible food and dizzy concoctions of champagne and porter sherry and tea the german people said he on one occasion alluding to the many hampers of his known favourite meats fish and fruits sent him from all quarters are resolved to have a fat chancellor sometimes like lesser folks bismarck has fits of the blues and of brooding which can scarcely be wondered at when we consider his self-indulgence at table on these occasions he distresses those around him by the most forlorn reflections once he declared that he had made nobody happy by his public acts neither himself nor his family nor the country i have had he went on gloomily little or no pleasure out of all i have done on the contrary much annoyance care and trouble in brighter moods he takes all this back and revels with almost boyish exultation in the splendour of his state strokes and the new face he has put upon the world's events where is my dog was bismarck's first exclamation when on a recent visit to vienna he alighted from the railway train never did a man cherish a fonder affection for the brute creation than this king-maker and world-mover he watched by the side of his dying sultan as he might have done over a favourite child and begged to be left alone with him in the final hour 
when the faithful old friend gasped his last breath bismarck with tears in his eyes turned to his son and said our german forefathers had a kind belief that after death they would meet again in the celestial hunting-grounds all the good dogs that had been their faithful companions in life i wish i could believe that for children bismarck had an ardent fondness his bright little grandchildren are the very joy of his old age on every occasion he seems to take delight in humouring and pleasing the young curiously commingled in his large nature are sentiment and satire kindliness and humour one day he was taking a walk with his wife at the famous watering-place of kissingen as they were about to turn down a side path the chancellor saw just beyond a rustic family evidently anxious to catch a good glimpse of him the youngest daughter a girl of ten started forward and with an expression half timid half bold approached staring at him bismarck at once turned aside and sat down on a rustic bench by the road until the girl had passed when rising he bowed his most stately bow to her said gravely good morning miss and proceeded down the secluded path there can be no doubt of bismarck's sturdy personal courage one striking incident in his career has proved that to all time one day in eighteen sixty six as he was returning home from the palace through the unter den linden he was shot from behind by an assassin he turned short seized the miscreant and though feeling himself wounded held the man with iron grasp until some soldiers came up he then walked rapidly home sat down with his family and ate a hearty dinner after the meal was over he walked up to his wife and said you see i am quite well adding you must not be anxious my child somebody has fired at me but it is nothing as you see it was the first intimation she had had of the attempted tragedy these necessarily rapid glances at bismarck's career and character may fitly be brought to a close by referring to the depth and sincerity of his religious faith and feelings in an age when scepticism and atheism are especially rampant among his countrymen bismarck adhered stoutly to the sturdy creed of his fathers i do not understand he once wrote to his wife how a man who thinks about himself and yet knows and wishes to know nothing of god can support his existence out of very weariness and disgust i do not know how i bore it formerly if i were now to live without god as then i would not know in very truth why i should not put away life like a soiled robe this simple fervour of humble and deep-rooted faith seems to me to shed greater lustre on his full troubled but triumphant life than the conquest of austrian or frank the rebuilding of a fallen empire the sway of a power which bends all europe to its will or even that lofty mastery over event and circumstances which must record his name the highest on the illustrious roll of the statesmen of our century end of section forty seven this recording is in the public domain section forty eight of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume seven germany the netherlands and switzerland edited by eva march tappan section forty eight student life at the german universities about nineteen hundred by mrs alfred sidgwick english people who have been in germany at all have invariably been to heidelberg and if they have been there in term time they have been amused by the gangs of young men who swagger about the narrow streets each gang wearing a different coloured cap they will have been told that these are the core students and the sight of them so jolly and so idle will confirm their mental picture of the german student the picture of a young man who does nothing but drink beer 
fight duels sing volk's leader and trink leader and make love to pretty low-born maidens when you see a company of these young men clatter into the schloss garden on a summer afternoon and drink vast quantities of beer when you observe their elaborate ceremonial of bows and greetings when you hear their laughter and listen to the latest stories of their monkey tricks you understand that the student's life is a merry one but except for the sake of tradition you wonder why he need lead it at a seat of learning anything further removed from learning than a german corps student cannot be imagined and the noise he makes must incommode the quiet working students who do not join a corps not that the quiet working students would wish to banish the others they are the glory of the german universities in novels and on the stage none others appear the innocent foreigner thinks that the moment a young german goes to the alma mater of his choice he puts on an absurd little cap gets his face slashed buys a boar hound and devotes all his energies to drinking beer and ragging officials but though the corps students are so conspicuous in the small university towns it is only the men of means who join them for poor students there is a cheaper form of union called aberschenschaft when a young german goes to the university he has probably never been from home before and by joining a corps or a burschenschaft he finds something to take the place of home companions with whom he has a special bond of intimacy and a discipline that carries on his social education for the etiquette of these associations is most elaborate and strict the members of a corps all say thou to each other and on the alta heron abenda when members of an older generation are entertained by the young ones of to-day this practice still obtains although one man may be a great minister of state and the other a lad fresh from school the laws of a corps remind you of the laws made by english schoolboys for themselves they are as solemnly binding as educational and as absurd if a vandal meets a hessian in the streets he may not recognize him though the hessian be his brother but outside the town's boundary this prohibition is relaxed for it is not rooted in ill-feeling but in ceremony one corps will challenge another to meet it on the duelling ground just as an english football team will meet another in friendly rivalry all the students associations except the theological require their members to fight these duels which are really exercises in fencing and take place on regular days of the week just as cricket matches do in england the men are protected by goggles and by shields and baskets on various parts of their bodies but their faces are exposed and they get ugly cuts of which they are extremely proud as it is quite impossible that i should have seen these duels myself i will quote from a description sent me by an english friend who was taken to them in heidelberg by a corps student they take place he says in a large bare room with a plain boarded floor there were tables each to hold ten or twelve persons on three sides of the room and a refreshment counter on the fourth side where an elderly woman and one or two girls were serving wine the wine was brought to the tables and the various corps sat at their special tables all drinking and smoking the dressing and undressing and the sewing up of wounds was done in an adjoining room when the combatants were ready they were led in by their seconds who held up their arms one on each side the face and the top of the head were exposed but the body neck and arms were heavily bandaged the duelists were placed opposite each other and the seconds who also have swords in their hands stand one on each side ready to interfere and knock up the combatant's sword they say auf die mensur and then the slashing begins as soon as blood is drawn the seconds interfere and the doctor examines the cut if it is not bad they go on fighting directly if it needs sewing up they go into the next room and you wait an endless time for the next party i got awfully tired of the long interval sitting at the tables drinking and smoking while the fights were going on we all stood round in a ring 
there were only about three duels the whole morning there was a good deal of blood on the floor the women at the refreshment counter were quite unconcerned they didn't trouble to look on but talked to each other about blouses like girls in a post office the students drove out to the inn and back in open carriages it is a mile from heidelberg the duels are generally as impersonal as games but sometimes they are in settlement of quarrels i think any student may come and fight on these occasions but i suppose he has to be the guest of a corps a comers is a student's festival in which the professors and other senior members of a university take part and at which outsiders are allowed to look on the presiding students appear in wallum wicks or as we should say in their war paint with sashes and rapiers young and old together drink beer sing songs make speeches and in honour of one or the other they rub a salamander a word which is said to be a corruption of sauft a la mit einander this is a curious ceremony and of great antiquity when the glasses are filled at the word of command they are rubbed on the table at the word of command they are raised and empty and again at the word of command every man rubs his glass on the table the second time raises it and brings it down with a crash any one who brought his glass down a moment earlier or later than the others would spoil the salamander and be in disgrace in eckhart shuffle describes a similar ceremonial in the tenth century the men seize their mugs he says and rub them three times in unison on the smooth rocks producing a humming noise then they lifted them towards the sun and drank each man set down his mug at the same moment so that it sounded like a single stroke a comers is not always a gay festival it may be a memorial ceremony in honour of some great man lately dead then speeches are made in his praise solemn and sacred music is sung and the salamander an impressive libation to the dead man's manis is drunk with mournful effect in small university towns and it must be remembered that there are twenty-two universities in germany the students play a great part in the social life of the place german ladies have often told me that the balls they looked forward to with most delight as girls were those given by students when one corps would take rooms and pay for music wine and lights for supper tickets are issued on such occasions which the guests pay themselves the small german universities seem full of the students in term time especially in those places where people congregate for pleasure and not for work even in a town as big as leipzig they are seen a good deal filling the pavement occupying the restaurants going in gangs to the play but in berlin the german student of tradition the beer person the duellist the rollicking lad with his big dog is lost he is there you are told but if you keep to the highway you never see him and to tell the truth in germany you miss him he stands for youth and high spirits and that world of ancient custom most of us would be loath to lose in berlin if you go to the universität when the working day begins you see a crowd of serious well-mannered young men most of them carrying books and papers they are swarming like bees to the various lecture rooms they are as quiet as the elderly professors who appear amongst them they have no core caps no dogs no scars on their scholarly faces by their figures you judge that they are not beer persons they have worked hard for twelve years in the gymnasiums of germany they have no idle habits no interests so keen as their interest in this business of preparing for the future they are the men of next year's germany and will carry on their country's reputation in the world for efficiency and scholarship in of section forty eight this recording is in the public domain section forty nine of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by chad horner from ballyclare the world's story volume seven germany the netherlands and switzerland edited by eva march tapan section forty nine 
A Day with the German Emperor, 1898, by Maurice Ledet. The energy of the emperor is proverbial. He never rests and professes the deepest horror of idleness. Moreover, his capacity for work is prodigious. Amongst those who immediately surround him, there is even some fear that his health will some day suffer from his continual efforts to examine into all the affairs of the empire himself. To rest his brain, he indulges in all those physical exercises in which he excels. The emperor gets up at five o'clock in the morning. As soon as he is up, he takes a cold bath. His mother, who is a daughter of Queen Victoria and an Englishwoman, has given him a taste from his earliest childhood for cold water, which is so wholesome for those who can stand it. After his bath, he dresses quickly and breakfasts at half past six. Immediately after breakfast, the emperor goes into his study where piles of letters and quantities of documents await him. There are letters received during the night at the post office on which special messengers bring the first thing in the morning to the palace of Berlin or the palace of Potsdam. There are also reports in the handwriting of the ministers and of high authorities. The emperor, who himself sees to everything, has so much to do in reading all these documents that if he wishes to examine each in detail which with him is a principle he cannot allow himself an instant's rest it is very rarely that he postpones the consideration of any sort of business he sells everything at the hour he has appointed even though to do so he has to take an hour or two from his sleep the adjunctants on duty are at their posts at half past six the emperor discusses with them the orders for the day and at seven he usually goes to see his children he then betakes himself to the room where he receives for the most part the reports of the marshals then some conferences with the functionaries under the orders of the master of the household in these interviews the details of such and such a ceremony are discussed the program for some impending journey of the emperor made out and the probable expense calculated etc in the same way the emperor during his hours of work looks into the affairs of the imperial household examines the accounts approves of orders given by the grand marshal and in a word settles all questions relating to the daily domestic life on important occasions he receives the ministers the councillors with their reports the prefect of police generals and great functionaries it is the greatest delight to the emperor to receive the reports of these persons and to sign the papers they present to him the emperor goes into all these reports with so much zeal though they are coming all day long that he often says to those working with him i know i am giving you a lot of trouble but i cannot do differently i have a great task myself to accomplish and i cannot make my decisions quickly it frequently happens that the heads of the different departments bring him twenty papers to sign each of these is discussed and of the twenty perhaps only three or four are carried away signed for the others the sovereign is determined to have further information concerning them by nine o'clock in the morning the emperor has thus accomplished a good deal of business and if the weather and the season permit he goes out for a drive and afterwards takes a pretty long walk if the weather is unfavourable for driving he goes to the riding school and rides for three quarters of an hour the emperor is a good fencer a good rider and a good shot when he is on horseback he likes to meet with difficulties he not only jumps hedges and ditches but also banks called irish banks with the greatest ease on days where a military inspection takes place the emperor who has thus had to ride in the open air for a long time dispenses with his drive he remains in the saddle for five or six hours at a stretch willingly at about eleven the interviews and the reports begin again this is also the time when audiences are granted officers of high rank who have received promotion or great functionaries who have been accorded a rise are announced he also receives the envoys and representatives of foreign countries princes and great lords the emperor converses with each of them for a few minutes at levies the emperor pays his guests some original attentions during the course of a levy he will change his uniform five or six times 
thus for instance if the son of a deceased general of artillery comes to announce to william the second the death of his father the emperor does not fail to put on his artillery uniform to do honour to the officer who has died in his service he wears the uniform of a general of artillery of cavalry of infantry or the naval uniform according to the person he receives and the position that person occupies if the emperor receives foreign representatives of military attache of foreign powers he wears the uniform of the army of the country which the visitor represents or at least the orders belonging to that country the fatiguing ceremony lasts till about half past two the emperor then goes again to join his children who are already at table and takes his second breakfast with them he then visits certain great functionaries generals and ministers and discusses state affairs with them he visits an artist and sits for a picture or a bust he inspects the barracks and the public offices and if he has time he concludes the afternoon with a carriage drive which lasts till five or six o'clock at half past six he again receives persons who have some communication to make to him or who have come to consult him upon military or civil business he reads reports and signs papers which were presented to him in the morning but which he wished to think over finally at seven o'clock he dines with his family on leaving the table the emperor devotes some time to his children who have spent the day in their studies or in physical exercises then he returns to work in the evening as a novel recreation the emperor practices fencing towards ten he takes a light repast and then retires to his bedroom at a little after ten he summons his valet to help him to undress on a table beside his bed there are always placed paper and pencil in order that the emperor may make a note of anything that occurs to him before he goes to sleep or before he gets up in the morning such is one of the emperor's working days in ordinary circumstances in extraordinary circumstances william the second imposes yet greater labour on himself think for a moment of the additional work imposed on him by the visit of a king or any sort of prince all the business of the day is done by him no matter what happens even when the visit of some great personage obliges him to spend half the day at repast drives and walks and ceremonies on these occasions his time is so partialled out that it is often not till eleven o'clock in the morning that he can go into his study to glance at the newspapers or read a new scientific political or literary book it is past eleven at night before he can dispose himself to sleep even then he rises if need be at four o'clock and begins again without interruption the business of the state at the same time visits military manoeuvres inspections outside berlin occupy a great deal of the emperor's time during a journey he is never a moment idle in the salon carriage which is reserved for him he writes looks at reports signs papers etc by the evening after all the ceremonies at which he is obliged to be present after the speeches and the toasts which he has had to listen to and to which he has had to reply he is very tired but nevertheless when he is once more in his room he looks at papers runs through documents and appends his signature when he is away from berlin which is the seat of government he is careful to attend to all business with even greater promptitude and attention than usual during reviews and inspections the emperor is on horseback from five o'clock in the morning till two in the afternoon he has hardly time to take his hurried meals immediately afterwards he sets to work to study the business of state has a levee in the afternoon and assists at fresh ceremonies outwardly he does not show the least fatigue or the least effort there is a sort of coquetry in his way of having a pleasant word for each of his visitors in these exceptional circumstances the emperor has often not more than three hours for sleep the next day he is on horseback again at the earliest possible hour passionately fond of life by the sea he is particularly fond of the natural beauties of the north sea coast even during his pleasure trips he devotes a great part of his time to work at every place where he stops he finds dispatches letters reports for him and even on his yacht his active spirit obliges him to read and study it is true that he takes somewhat long voyages during the summer when the departments take their holiday but the government machine never stops and william the second has affairs to settle which require prompt execution in spite of all the work 
which the emperor imposes on himself he finds time to read most of the books of any importance which appear in europe whether literary scientific religious or philosophical a distinguished linguist having in particular a marvellous acquaintance with french and german he reads all these books not in translations but in the original therefore he is rarely at a loss when there is any discussion of a new book in order to be abreast of all these studies this reading and these various labours william the second is penetrated with the idea that only the most absolute regularity in the employment of time can enable him to solve the apparently unsolvable problems of how to have sufficient knowledge of everything which attracts human observation he was prepared for this life of work by the severe education he was subjected to he was in fact brought up in a hard school each day he had only half an hour to pursue his own tastes knowing the value of time it is seldom indeed that he puts anything off till the morrow a little theatrical in his manner even one might say capitaine footnote capitaine means literally strolling player but it is an untranslatable word and a footnote he has nevertheless a strong sentiment that the chief of the state should not only be the representative of authority but also the most active collaborator in the life of the country of which he is the head his mystical ideas have led him to believe that he holds his right to rule from the deity he is one of the last believers in divine right of which monsieur the comte de Chambord was the last representative in france End of section 49. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare. Section 50 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 50 The German Fatherland by Ernst Moritz Arndt Where is the German's fatherland? The Prussian land? The Swabian land? Where Rhine the vine-clad mountain laves? Where skims the gull the Baltic waves? Ah, no, no, no! His fatherland's not bounded so. Where is the German's fatherland? Bavarian land or Stygian land? Where sturdy peasants plough the plain? Where mountain suns bright metal gain? Ah, no, no, no! His fatherland's not bounded so where is the german's fatherland the saxon hills the zuider strand where sweet wild winds the sandy shores where loud the rolling danube roars ah no 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 his fatherland's not bounded so where is the german's fatherland then name then name the mighty land the austrian land in fight renowned the kaiser's land with honours crowned ah no 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 his fatherland's not bounded so where is the german's fatherland then name then name the mighty land the land of hoffer land of tell this land i know and love it well but no 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 his fatherland's not bounded so where is the german's fatherland is his the pieced and parcelled land where pirate princes rule a gem torn from the emperor's diadem ah no 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 such is no german's fatherland where is the german's fatherland then name o oh name the mighty land where e'er is heard the german tongue and german hymns to god are sung this is the land thy hermann's land this german is thy fatherland this is the german fatherland where faith is in the plighted hand where truth lives in each eye of blue and every heart is staunch and true this is the land the honest land the honest german's fatherland 
this is the land the one true land o god to aid be thou at hand and fire each heart and nerve each arm to shield our german homes from harm to shield the land the one true land one deutschland and one fatherland end of section fifty this recording is in the public domain recording by alan mapstone in oxford england Section 51 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Read for LibriVox.org by Christine. The Netherlands, Part 1 From the Roman Conquest to the Reformation. Historical Note The Low Countries were conquered by Caesar, but later the German tribes united and drove the Romans to the southward. When Charlemagne's empire fell to pieces, the Netherlands were first ruled by France, then by Germany. In 932, the northern part was given to one Count Dirk, the first Count of Holland. He and his successors ruled the land until 1299, when the throne fell to the house of Hainault. In order to obtain money for war, William IV of Hainault granted many privileges to the wealthy towns who were willing to become his creditors. This did much to break up feudalism and lessen the power of king and nobles. The next rulers were of the House of Bavaria. During their reign, windmills, which had been introduced a century earlier, came into general use, and the method of curing herring was discovered, leading to a valuable trade in the dry fish. The reign of the House of Burgundy began in the 15th century with Philip the Good. Commerce flourished, and free schools, art and literature met with generous encouragement. The Dutch learned how to refine salt, to weave linen and woolen, and to make handsome jewelry. They strengthened their dikes, and even if the Dutchman Koster did not invent printing, as the Dutch firmly believe, his countrymen were certainly the most enthusiastic practicers of the new art. Charles the Bold did his best to destroy the liberties of the country, and at his death the Dutch called together all the estates of the Netherlands to decide upon the wisest course. This was the first meeting of the States General. In 1477 this assembly issued the great privilege, the Dutch Magna Carta, through the marriage of the daughter of Charles the Bold to Maximilian of Austria in 1482, the land passed into the hands of the Habsburg family. End of section 51. This recording is in the public domain. Section 52 of Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 52. Besieging a Roman Camp, 54 B.C., by T. Rice Holmes. Whenever a Roman army made a halt, if for only one night, their camp was always carefully fortified with trench, rampart, and palisade. It was such a camp as this that was attacked by Ambriorix. He had been successful in a previous engagement, and now he induced the Atuatuki and the Nervi to join him in another venture. The Roman leader, Quintus Cicero, was a brother of the orator Cicero. In substance, this account is taken from the narrative of Caesar, the editor. Ambiorix told the chiefs exultingly of his success. Here was such a chance as they might never have again. Cicero's camp was close by. Why should they not do as he had done? Swoop down upon the solitary legion, win back their independence for good, and take a glorious revenge upon their persecutors. The chiefs caught at the suggestion. The small tribes that owned their sway flocked to join them. 
The Eberones, flushed with victory, were there to help, and the united host set out with eager confidence for the Roman camp. Their horsemen, hurrying on ahead, cut off a party of soldiers who were felling wood. Not the faintest rumor of the late disaster had reached Cicero, and the Gallic hordes burst upon him like a bolt from the sky. Their first onslaught was so violent that even the disciplined courage of the Romans barely averted destruction. Messengers were instantly dispatched to carry the news to Caesar, and Cicero promised to reward them well if they should succeed in delivering his letters. Working all night with incessant energy, the legionaries erected a large number of wooden towers on the rampart and made good the defects in the fortifications. The Gauls, who meanwhile had been strongly reinforced, returned in the morning to the attack. They succeeded in filling up the trench, but the garrison still managed to keep them at bay. Day after day the siege continued, and night after night and all night long the Romans toiled to make ready for the morrow's struggle. The towers were furnished with stories and embattled breastworks of wattle work. Sharp stakes, burnt and hardened at the ends, were prepared for hurling at the besiegers, and huge pikes for stopping their rush if they should attempt to assault. Even the sick and the wounded had to lend a hand. Cicero himself was in poor health, but he worked night and day, and it was not till the men gathered round him and insisted on his sparing himself that he would take a little rest. His complaints, his Epicurean studies, his abortive tragedies were forgotten. He remembered only that he was a Roman general. Meanwhile, the Nervian leaders, who had expected an easy triumph, were becoming impatient. They asked Cicero to grant them an interview. Some of them knew him personally, and they doubtless hoped that he would prove compliant. They assailed him with the same arguments that Ambriorix had found so successful with Sabinus. They tried to frighten him by describing the massacre of Atuatuca, and assured him that it was idle to hope for relief. But they would not be hard upon him. All that they wanted was to stop the inveterate custom of quartering the legions for the winter in Gaul. If he and his army would only go, they might go in peace whithersoever they pleased. Cicero calmly replied that Romans never accepted terms from an armed enemy. They must first lay down their arms. Then he would intercede for them with Caesar. Caesar was always just, and would doubtless grant their petition. Disappointed though they were, the Gauls were not disheartened. They determined to invest the camp in a scientific manner. From the experience of past campaigns, they had got a rough idea of the nature of Roman siege works, and now, with the quickness of their race, they proceeded to imitate them. Some prisoners who had fallen into their hands gave them hints. Having no proper tools, they were obliged to cut the turf with their swords, and use their hands and even their cloaks in piling the sod. But the workers swarmed in such prodigious numbers that in three hours they had thrown up a rampart ten feet high and nearly three miles in extent. They then proceeded, under the guidance of the prisoners, to erect towers, and to make sappers huts, ladders, and poles fitted with hooks for tearing down the rampart of the camp. The huts, which were intended to protect the men who had to fill up the trench and demolish the rampart, were partially closed in front and had sloping roofs built of strong timbers, so as to resist the crash of any stones which might be pitched on to them and probably covered with clay and raw hides as a protection against fire. On the seventh day of the siege there was a great gale. The besiegers took advantage of it to fling blazing darts and white-hot balls of clay, which lighted on the straw thatch of the men's huts, and the wind-swept flames flew all over the enclosure. With a yell of exultation the enemy wheeled forward their towers and huts, and planted their ladders. In another moment they were swarming up, but all along the rampart 
their dark figures outlined against the fiery background, the Romans were standing ready to hurl them down. Harassed by showers of missiles, half scorched by the fierce heat, regardless of the havoc that the flames were making in their property, every man of them stood firm, and hardly one so much as looked behind. Their losses were heavier than on any previous day. The Gauls, too, went down in scores, for those in front could not retreat because of the masses that pressed upon them from behind. In one spot a tower was wheeled right up to the rampart. The centurions of the third cohort coolly withdrew their men, and with voice and gesture dared the Gauls to come on. But none dared stir a step. A shower of stones sent them flying, and the deserted tower was set on fire. Everywhere the result was the same. The assailants were the bravest of the Gauls. Of death they had no fear. But they had not the heart to hurl themselves upon that living wall, and, leaving their slain in heaps, they sullenly withdrew. Still the siege went on, and to the wearied and weakened legion its trials daily increased. Letters for Caesar were sent out in more and more rapid succession. Some of the messengers were caught in sight of the garrison and tortured to death. There was, however, in the camp a Nervian named Vertico, who, just before the siege, had thrown himself upon the protection of Cicero, and had been steadfastly true to him. By lavish promises he induced one of his slaves to face the dangers which to the Roman messengers had proved fatal. The letter which he had to carry was fastened to a javelin and concealed by the lashing. He passed his countrymen unnoticed, made his way safely to Samarobriva, and delivered his dispatch. None of the other messengers had arrived, and so close was the sympathy between the peasants and the insurgents that Caesar had not heard a rumor of the siege. Everything now depended upon speed. Passing through the Nervian territory, Caesar learned from some peasants who fell into his hands that Cicero's situation was all but desperate. Immediately he wrote a letter in Greek characters, assuring him of speedy relief, and offered one of his Gallic horsemen a large reward to deliver it. He told him, in case he should not be able to get into the camp, to tie the letter to the thong of a javelin and throw it inside. Dreading the risk of apprehension, the man did as Caesar had directed, but the javelin stuck in one of the towers and remained unnoticed for two days. A soldier then found it and took it to Cicero, who read the letter to his exhausted troops. As they gazed over the rampart, they saw clouds of smoke floating far away over the west horizon, and knew that Caesar was approaching and taking vengeance as he came. That night Caesar received a dispatch from Cicero, warning him that the Gauls had raised the siege and had gone off to intercept him. Notwithstanding their heavy losses, they numbered, it was said, some sixty thousand men. Caesar made known the contents of the dispatch to the troops and encouraged them to nerve themselves for the approaching struggle. A short march in the early morning brought the legions to a rivulet, running through a broad valley, beyond which the enemy were encamped. Caesar had no intention of fighting a battle against such heavy odds on unfavorable ground. Cicero was in no danger, and he was therefore not pressed for time. He sent out scouts to look for a convenient place to cross the river. Meanwhile he marked out his camp on a slope, and constructed it on the smallest possible scale, in the hope of seducing the enemy to attack him. But the enemy were expecting reinforcements, and remained where they were. At dawn, their horsemen ventured across the river, and attacked Caesar's cavalry, who promptly retreated in obedience to orders. Sitting on their horses, the Gauls could see inside the camp. An attempt was apparently being made to increase the height of their rampart and to block the gateways. There was every appearance of panic. Caesar had told his men what to do, and they were hurrying about the camp with a pretense of nervous trepidation. The enemy hesitated no longer. 
and in a short time they were all across the stream. They had to attack uphill, but that mattered nothing against such craven adversaries. Not even a sentry was standing on the rampart. Criers were sent round the camp to say that if any man cared to come out and join the Gauls, he would be welcome till eight o'clock. The gates looked too strong to be forced, though there was really only a mock barricade of sods which could be knocked over in a moment. The Gauls walked right up to the ditch, and began coolly filling it up, and actually tearing down the rampart with their hands, when from right and left and front the cohorts charged. There was a thunder of hoofs, and reeling backward in amazement before a rush of cavalry, they flung away their arms and fled. Caesar prudently stopped the pursuit, lest his troops should become entangled in the outlying woods and marshes. But about three o'clock that afternoon, the legions reached Cicero's camp without the loss of a man. With keen interest, Caesar asked for details of the siege, and gazed with admiring wonder at the enemy's deserted works. When the legion was paraded, he found that not one man in ten was unwounded. Turning to Cicero, he heartily thanked him for the magnificent stand which he had made, and then calling out, one by one, the officers whom he mentioned as having shown especial bravery, he addressed to them a few words of praise. From some prisoners who had served under Ambriorix, he gleaned details of the massacre at Atuatuca. Next day he again assembled the men, and described to them what had befallen their comrades. The culpable rashness of a general officer had entailed a disaster, but they must not be downhearted, for providence and their own good swords had enabled them to repair the loss. Meanwhile the news of their leap had spread like wildfire. Before midnight it was known in the neighborhood of Labienus camp, more than fifty miles away, a number of loyal Romans hurried to congratulate the general, and a shout of joy at the gates of his camp told him what had occurred. Indutio Marus, who was on the point of attacking him, beat a hasty retreat. A large force from the maritime tribes of Brittany and Normandy was advancing against the camp of Roscius when an express came to warn them of Caesar's victory, and they precipitately fled. End of section 52。Section 53 of Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 53. The Rebellion of Civilis, 69 A.D. By Caius Cornelius Tacitus. One race of the people of the Netherlands, the Batavians, lived on an island at the mouth of the Rhine. They were brave and warlike, and finally they became allies of the Romans and joined the Roman armies. For a long while, they served the emperors as a bodyguard. Nevertheless, they did not forget their own land and their former freedom. And while Vitellius and Vespasian were contending for the sway of Rome, they seized the opportunity to revolt. Their leader was a Batavian called Civilis. He is said to have made a speech to the Batavians, the substance of which is given in the following extract. The Editor Civilis, under the pretext of a banquet, convened the nobles and bravest of the nation in a sacred grove, and when he saw that they were warmed with midnight revelry and mirth, he addressed them, first expatiating on the fame and exploits of the Batavians, and then enumerating the wrongs of his countrymen, the depredations of the Romans, and all the other evils of thraldom. Indeed, he said, they were no longer treated as allies, but as bond slaves. When would a lieutenant general come to govern them, though with a burdensome retinue and domineering authority? They were now turned over to prefects and centurions, 
who, as soon as they have gorged themselves with spoils and blood, are recalled, a fresh set of rapacious creatures sent out, and the same system of depredation carried on under various names. A levy was just at hand, by which children would be separated in a manner forever from their parents, brothers from brothers. The Romans were never, at any period, in so feeble a condition. Neither had they aught in their winter quarters besides old men and plunder. Let them only lift up their eyes, and they would see no reason to dread their shadowy, unsubstantial legions. On the other hand, they had themselves an efficient force of foot and horse. The Germans were their kinsmen. The Gauls sympathized with them. Not even the Romans' displeasure was to be apprehended in the war he advised, in which, if they failed, they could lay the blame on Vespasian, and if they succeeded, there was no account to be rendered at all. Having been heard with zealous approbation, he bound them all according to barbarian forms, and by the oaths and imprecations of their country. Then followed warfare. The following is an account of one of the engagements. Civilis pressed the siege of the old camp, keeping strict guard, that no secret intelligence of coming succors might reach the garrison. The management of the battering engines and other warlike preparations he delegated to the Batavians. The forces from beyond the Rhine, who demanded the signal for action, he ordered to advance and tear down the rampart, and when they were repulsed, he bade them renew the contest, as he had a redundance of men, and the loss of some of them would not be felt, nor did the knight put a period to the effort. The barbarians, having placed heaps of wood around and set fire to them, but took themselves to a repast concurrently with their operations, and as each grew warm with liquor, they rushed with bootless temerity to the assault. For indeed their darts were without effect from the darkness, while the Romans took aim at the barbarian line, which was exposed to full view, and singled out as marks whoever was conspicuous for his valour or the splendour of his decorations. Civilis saw the disadvantage, and ordered the fires to be put out, that all might be enveloped in darkness, and the fight carried on without distinction. Then, indeed, dissonant noises were heard, unforeseen accidents occurred. There was no room for foresight either in striking or avoiding blows. They faced about to the quarter whence the shout proceeded, and directed their weapons thither. Valor could profit nothing. Chance confounded all things, and the bravest often fell by the hand of the coward. The Germans fought with blind fury. The Roman soldiers, inured to danger, threw not their poles pointed with iron, nor discharged their massy stones at haphazard. Whenever the sound of the barbarians sapping the foundations of the walls, or of the scaling ladders applied to the ramparts, presented the enemy to their attack, they drove the assailants down with the bosses of their shields, and followed them up with their javelins. Many who made good their way to the top of the walls, they stabbed with daggers. After a night spent in this manner, the day disclosed a new mode of conflict. The Batavians had reared a turret, two stories high, which, as it approached the Praetorian Gate, where the ground was most even, was shivered to pieces by strong bars, brought forward for the purpose, and beams which were made to impinge upon it. Many of those who stood upon it were annihilated, and an attack was made upon the assailants, in their alarm and confusion, by a sudden and successful sally. At the same time, more machines were made by the legionary soldiers, who excelled in skill and ingenuity. One in particular struck the enemy with terror and amazement. It was an instrument poised in the air, and having an oscillatory motion, by which, when suddenly let down, one or more of the enemy were borne aloft before the faces of their comrades, and then, by turning the whole mass, were discharged within the camp. Civilis, abandoning the hope of storming the place, again had recourse to a leisurely blockade, employing himself in undermining the fidelity of the legions by messages and promises. 
At length the Gallic allies of Civilis deserted him, and even his own people ceased to trust him. Moreover, they had become completely discouraged, and had concluded that it was useless to try to oppose the Romans. There was nothing for him to do but to make the best terms of peace that he could. He and the Roman commander met on a bridge, if it could be called a meeting, for Civilis stood on one end and the Roman general on the other, and the centre of the bridge was broken away. Unfortunately, no one knows what they said, for the story stops here. History does not tell what become of Civilis. The Editor End of Section 53「Section 54 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 54. How Count William of Holland was made a knight. 1247 from the old chronicles the theory of the middle ages was that the king owned the whole country but as he could not cultivate it all or even defend it he gave large districts of it to his chief men each man when he received a share knelt before the king with uncovered head laid his hands in those of his sovereign and vowed to be his man and to serve him faithfully then the king kissed his vassal or liegeman and gave him a bit of turf and a twig to indicate that he was to hold the land and what grew upon it often when land was granted to a man he was required to make a small payment of money or produce this was not rent but merely an acknowledgment that the property was not his but his lord's it was sometimes nothing more than a measure of grain or a fish or two from some river flowing through the land the service required by the king was usually service in war when there was need of fighting he had a right to call out his vassals to fight for him but every vassal divided his land into portions and gave it to people who now became his vassals and vowed to be faithful to him each vassal then called out those who were under him and they were all obliged to go out to help do battle this was the feudal system in short the lord must protect and the vassal must serve it was a tenure of land on condition of service the editor after all had been made ready in the cologne cathedral the aforesaid squire william after a solemn mass was brought before the cardinal by the king of bohemia with the following words your eminence gracious father we present this chosen squire respectfully entreating that your reverence will accept his vow so that he may be worthily received into our knightly community the lord cardinal in full dress spoke to the squire starting out from the signification of the word knight every one who wishes to be called a knight must be constant noble generous spotless and strong constant in adversity noble of birth generous in honour spotless in courtly intercourse strong in manly courage but before you make your vow you shall first hear with mature consideration what duties the rule of the order of knighthood brings with it this then is the rule of the knightly order first of all with pious attention to hear mass daily for the catholic faith bravely to throw your life into the breach to save holy church and its servants from assailants to protect widows children and orphans in need to avoid unrighteous wars to refuse unjust reward to accept combat for the deliverance of any innocent person not to visit tournaments except for exercise in fighting respectfully to obey the emperor of the romans or his representative in temporal matters to leave the state unimpaired in power not to alienate the fiefs of kingdom and empire to live blamelessly before god and man if you zealously observe and diligently follow these laws of the knightly order so far as you can or know how hear then that on earth you will deserve honour for a time and after this life eternal rest in heaven when this was said the lord cardinal laid the squire's folded hands in a missal upon the gospel that had just been read thus speaking will you then in the lord's name piously accept the order of knighthood and to the best of your ability observe the rule explained to you word by word 
the squire answered to this i will the lord cardinal now handed the squire the vow which the squire read in the hearing of all as follows i william chief of the holland knighthood free feudatory of the holy empire swear in presence of my lord peter cardinal deacon of st george ad wellum arium and legate of the papal see on this gospel which i touch with my hand to observe the rule of the order of knighthood the cardinal answered may this pious vow be the true deliverance from your sins amen when this was over the king of bohemia gave a loud blow on the squire's neck with these words to the honour of almighty god i ordain you knight and receive you with congratulations into our company and remember that the saviour of the world in presence of the high priest annas was struck and mocked at before you in the presence of king herod was covered with a robe and laughed at and in presence of the whole people was crucified naked and wounded on the cross i counsel you to bear his suffering in mind i command you to take up his cross also i admonish you to avenge his death when this had all solemnly been accomplished the young squire began after a mass with blare of trumpet clangor of bell and beat of drum a thrice repeated combat of arms with the king of bohemia's son and afterwards fighting with the naked sword he ended his squireship celebrated with great splendour a feast of three days and showed his liberality by ample presents to all the noblemen End of section fifty four this recording is in the public domain Section 55 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7 Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 55 How Philip von Artevelde was made Governor of Ghent. 1386 by sir john froissart toward the end of the fourteenth century philip von artevelde was made governor of ghent and leader of the people in their war against the count of flanders he was at first successful but soon king charles the sixth of france came to the aid of the count philip's army was routed and he himself was slain the editor when peter dubois saw ghent thus weakened in her captains and soldiers and deserted by her allies that the principal inhabitants began to tire he suspected they would readily give up the war but that whatever peace or treaty they should enter into with the earl there would not be any possibility for him to save his life he therefore called to his recollection john lyon who had been his master and with what art he had worked he saw plainly he could not do everything himself not having sufficient weight nor knowledge to govern the town neither did he wish for the principal command, being solely desirous of leading every mad enterprise. He, in consequence, turned his thoughts to a man of whom the city of Ghent had not any suspicions, one of sufficient prudence, though his abilities were unknown, for until that day they had not paid any attention to him. His name was Philip von Artevelde, son of Jacob von Artevelde, who had ruled over all Flanders for seven years. Peter Dubois had heard it related by his master, John Lyon, and the old people of Ghent, that the whole country was never so well governed, feared, loved, and honoured as during the time of Jacob von Artevelde's reign, which lasted for seven years. The inhabitants added that if Jacob von Artevelde were alive, things would not be in the state they are now in. They should have a peace according to their wishes, and the earl would be too happy to forgive them. These words made an impression on Peter Dubois. He recollected that Jacob von Artevelde had left a son called Philip, a handsome and agreeable man, to whom the Queen of England, when she was at Ghent and during the time of the siege of Tournay, had stood godmother, and who, from respect to her, had been christened Philip. Peter Dubois came one evening to Philip's house, who resided with his mother, maintaining themselves honorably on their rents. Peter, having arranged in his own mind what he should say, thus opened the matter in the cause of his coming. "'If you will listen to me and follow my advice,' I will make you the greatest man in Flanders. How will you do this? replied Philip. I will tell you, for we are at this moment in the utmost want of a leader of a good name and fair character. By this means we shall rouse the men of Ghent through remembrance of your father's fame, for everyone says that Flanders was never so flourishing nor so much feared as during his lifetime. I will easily place you, if you be willing, in his situation, 
and when there you will govern according to my advice until you shall find yourself master of the business, which you will soon acquire. Philip, who was arrived at manhood, and naturally wished to advance himself in honor and wealth more than he then possessed, replied, Peter, you offer me great things, and, if I be placed in the situation you saw, I swear on my faith that I will never act without your advice. Peter asked, Can you be cruel and proud? For a great man among the commonalty, and in particular among such as we shall have to do with, will not be thought anything worth if he be not feared and dreaded, and at times renowned for his cruelty. It is thus that the Flemings wish to be governed, and among them men's lives should be no more valued, nor should they have more pity shown to them than swallows or larks, which are caught in the proper season for the table. By my troth, answered Philip, I know well how to act this part. All then goes well, said Peter. You are just such a one as I want, and the chief I look for. On saying this he took leave and departed to his own house. Night passed, and day returned, when Peter Dubois went to a square where there were upward of four thousand of his followers and others, assembled to hear the news, to discuss how matters ought to be carried on, and who should be the governor of the town. The Lord de Harzel was there, who chiefly conducted the affairs of Ghent, but he would not undertake to do anything out of the town. Some named him for governor, others were also nominated. Peter, who was listening attentively, having heard many names, raised his voice and said, "'Gentlemen, I have paid every attention to all you have said, and firmly believe that you have been induced, through your love and affection for the honor and wealth of the town of Ghent, to propose such who are worthy to have a share in the government of this city. But I know one who in no way is thinking of it, and if he would undertake the government, there could not be any one found of greater abilities nor of a more propitious name.' Peter Dubois was called upon to name him, which he did by saying, It was Philip von Artevelde who was christened at the font of St. Peter's in Ghent by that noble queen of England, Philippa, who was his godmother at the time when his father, Jacob von Artevelde, was at the siege of Tournay with the king of England, the Duke of Brabant, Duke of Gelders, and the Earl of Hainaut, which Jacob von Artevelde, his father, governed the town of Ghent and the country of Flanders better than has ever been done since, from all I hear from those who have it strong in their memories. Flanders had been for some time lost if, through his sense and good fortune, he had not regained it. Now it behooves us to love the branches from such a valiant man, preference to any other person. No sooner had Peter Dubois done speaking than the idea of Philip von Artevelde filled everyone's mind and encouraged them so much that they unanimously cried out, "'Let him be sought for!' We will not have any one but him for our governor. No, no, said Peter Dubois, we will not send for him. It will be much better we go to his house, for we do not at present know how he will take it. We ought not by any means to suffer him to excuse himself from accepting it. At these words those present took the road to Philip's house, followed by many others who had been informed of their intentions. When they arrived there, the Lord de Harzel, Peter Dubois, Peter Lanuite and about ten or twelve of the principal tradesmen addressed him, saying, That the good town of Ghent was in the greatest danger for want of a chief, with whom alliances might be formed both at home and abroad, and that all ranks of people in Ghent had given him their voices and chosen him to be their sovereign. For the good remembrance of his name and thy love they had borne to his father made him more agreeable to them than any one else for which reasons they entreated him affectionately to take on him the government of the town, with the management of their affairs both within and without, and they would swear to him obedience and loyalty as completely as to their lord. They likewise engaged to bring every one, how great soever he might be, under his obedience. Philip, after hearing everything they had to say, made the following prudent reply. Gentlemen, you require great things from me and I should imagine you have not weighed the matter so maturely as it ought to have been when you offer me the government of Ghent. You say the affection your ancestors had for my father has been your great inducement. When he had performed for them every service in his power, they murdered him. If I should accept the government in the manner you request, and be afterwards murdered, I should gain but a miserable recompense. Philip, said Peter Dubois, who caught at these words which seemed to make his choice doubtful, what has passed cannot now be amended. You will act from the advice of your counsel, and by thus continuing you will ever be so well advised that all mankind shall praise you. Philip answered, I should never wish to act otherwise. 
They then elected him, and, conducting him to the marketplace, he was there sworn into office. The mayors, sheriffs, and rulers of companies were also sworn to obey him. In this manner was Philip von Artevelde made sovereign of Ghent. He acquired great popularity at the commencement, for he spoke to everyone who had any business with him politely and prudently, so that he was beloved by all. End of section 55 This recording is in the public domain. Section 56 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Read for LibriVox.org by phone. The Childhood of Charles V. A Reading by Erasmus. By Eduard Jean Conrad Hamann. Belgian painter, 1819. Painting, page 302. In the year of Columbus's great discovery, Erasmus left the monastery and began life as a scholar, and a scholar he became, one of the first of his times. He refused all advancement in the church, and at first criticized the church and welcomed the ideas of Luther and the Reformation. However, he was never a reformer in the Lutheran sense, and remained a Catholic. He believed that the people needed nothing but teaching, and that as they grew wiser, the points which deserved criticism would be amended. Erasmus was made a counsellor in the royal household of Prince Charles, afterwards Charles V, and had to do with the education of the young prince. In his Christian Prince, which he wrote for Charles, he said, God has given you an empire without bloodshed. His will is that you preserve it ever free from blood. May it come to pass that through your goodness and wisdom we may at last have a rest from these mad wars. Peace will be made precious to us by the memory of evils past, and our gratitude to you will be double by the misfortunes of other times. Dr. Emerton says, All this to Charles of Burgundy, already most Catholic king of Spain, within a year to be elected Holy Roman Emperor, and destined for the next generation to turn Europe into a battlefield for objects in which no one of his numerous subject peoples had the remotest interest. In this picture, Charles is shown, at the age of eleven, seated on his throne in the Palace of Brussels. Beside him is his guardian Margaret, daughter of the Emperor Maximilian of Austria. This boy, who was destined to become the most powerful ruler of his age, had inherited the rich provinces of the Netherlands five years before this time. Five years later, he inherited from his mother the Kingdom of Spain with its vast possessions in America and in 1519 he was elected Emperor of Germany. End of section 56. This recording is in the public domain. Section 57 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone the Netherlands Part Two How Holland Won Her Freedom Historical Note At the death of Ferdinand of Aragon, Charles V of the House of Austria, who had inherited the Netherlands from his father, became also ruler of Spain. His reign was on the whole tolerable to the Netherlands. He had been brought up in their province, and they thought of him as one of themselves. With his son, Philip II, to whom Charles resigned his throne in 1556, the case was different. He was a gloomy, conscientious bigot, with neither sympathy nor liking for the liberty-loving Dutch. The doctrines of Martin Luther were making great headway in the country, and to combat them, Philip II introduced, or revived, the terrible Inquisition. Moreover, he filled the chief offices with Spaniards and quartered Spanish soldiers upon the people. Disturbances broke out, 
churches were sacked and although quiet was at last restored philip sent the duke of alva with twenty thousand veteran troops of spain to punish the unhappy provinces under the merciless rule of alva and his council of blood thousands of the dutch were tortured or put to death and thousands more fled the country when in fifteen sixty eight extraordinary taxes were imposed on the people the tenth penny from the price of every article sold and the hundredth part of every income and the inquisition declared the inhabitants of the netherlands heretics and at one stroke sentenced them all to death with a few named exceptions the provinces rose in revolt and embarked on one of the most memorable wars of all history in fifteen seventy nine the southern catholic provinces forming what is now belgium submitted to spanish rule in the same year the seven northern provinces united in what is called the union of utrecht william the silent prince of orange the rebel leader was made hereditary stadtholder in fifteen eighty four william was assassinated and his place was taken by his seventeen-year-old son maurice of nassau Morris proved to be a skilful general, and he was aided by a brilliant man of business, John of Barnevelt, who managed with the utmost wisdom the financial affairs of the provinces. In 1648, after a struggle of 80 years, the independence of the Dutch Republic was acknowledged. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain. Section 58 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 7. Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 58. The Beggars of Holland, 1566, by John Lothrop Motley. The people of the Netherlands had no desire to match their little strength against the mighty power of Spain, then the foremost nation of Europe, without first exhausting every peaceable means of maintaining their rights. In 1566, a party of nobles decided to present a petition setting forth their grievances to the Spanish king's half-sister, Margaret duchess of parma whom he had made regent of the country the editor it was about six o'clock in the evening on the third day of april fifteen sixty six that the long expected cavalcade at last entered brussels an immense concourse of citizens of all ranks thronged around the noble confederates as soon as they made their appearance they were about two hundred in number all on horseback with pistols in their holsters and Braderode, tall, athletic, and martial in his bearing, with handsome features and fair curling locks upon his shoulders, seemed an appropriate chieftain for that band of Batavian chivalry. The procession was greeted with frequent demonstrations of applause, as it wheeled slowly through the city till it reached the mansion of Orange Nassau. Here, Braderode and Count Louis alighted, while the rest of the company dispersed to different quarters of the town. "'They thought that I should not come to Brussels,' said Braderode, as he dismounted. "'Very well. Here I am, and perhaps I shall depart in a different manner.' In the course of the next day, Counts Kullenberg and Vandenberg entered the city with one hundred other cavaliers. On the morning of the 5th of April, the Confederates were assembled, at the Kohlenberg mansion, which stood on the square called the Saban, within a few minutes' walk of the palace. A straight, handsome street lad, from the house along the summit of the hill, to the splendid residence of the ancient dukes of Brabant, then the abode of the Duchess Margaret. At a little before noon, the gentlemen came forth, marching on foot, two by two, to the number of three hundred. Nearly all were young, many of them bore the most ancient historical names of their country 
every one was arrayed in magnificent costume it was regarded as ominous that the man who led the procession philip de below was lame the line was closed by Braderode and count louis who came last walking arm in arm an immense crowd was collected in the square in front of the palace to welcome the men who were looked upon as the deliverers of the land from spanish tyranny from the cardinalist and from the inquisition they were received with deafening huzzas and clappings of hands by the assembled populace as they entered the council chamber passing through the great hall where ten years before the emperor had given away his crowns they found the emperor's daughter seated in the chair of state and surrounded by the highest personages in the country the emotion of the duchess was evident as the procession somewhat abruptly made its appearance nor was her agitation diminished as she observed among the petitioners many relatives and retainers of the orange and egmont houses and saw friendly glances of recognition exchanged between them and their chiefs as soon as all had entered the senate room Raderode advanced made a low obeisance and spoke a brief speech he said that he had come thither with his colleagues to present a humble petition to her highness he alluded to the reports which had been rife that they had contemplated tumult sedition foreign conspiracies and what was more abominable than all a change of sovereign he denounced such statements as calumnies begged the duchess to name the men who had thus aspersed an honourable and loyal company and called upon her to inflict exemplary punishment upon the slanderers with these prefatory remarks he presented the petition the famous document was then read aloud its tone was sufficiently loyal particularly in the preamble which was filled with protestations of devotion to both king and duchess after this conventional introduction however the petitioners proceeded to state very plainly that the recent resolutions of his majesty with regard to the edicts and the inquisition were likely to produce a general rebellion they had hoped they said that a movement would be made by the seigneurs or by the estates to remedy the evil by striking at its cause but they waited in vain the danger on the other hand was augmenting every day universal sedition was at the gate and they had therefore felt obliged to delay no longer but come forward the first and do their duty they professed to do this with more freedom because the danger touched them very nearly they were the most exposed to the calamities which usually spring from civil commotions for their houses and lands situate in the open fields were exposed to the pillage of all the world moreover there was not one of them whatever his condition who was not liable at any moment to be executed under the edicts at the false complaint of the first man who wished to obtain his estate and who chose to denounce him to the inquisitor at whose mercy were the lives and property of all they therefore begged the duchess regent to dispatch an envoy on their behalf who should humbly implore his majesty to abolish the edicts in the meantime they requested her highness to order a general surcease of the inquisition and of all executions until the king's further pleasure was made known and until new ordinances made by his majesty with advice and consent of the states general duly assembled should be established the petition terminated as it had commenced with expressions of extreme respect and devoted loyalty the agitation of duchess margaret increased very perceptibly during the reading of the paper when it was finished she remained for a few minutes quite silent with tears rolling down her cheeks as soon as she could overcome her excitement she uttered a few words to the effect that she would advise with her counsellors and give the petitioners such answer as should be found suitable the confederates then passed out from the council chamber into the grand hall each individual as he took his departure advancing towards the duchess and making what was called the caracal in token of reverence there was ample time to contemplate the whole company and to count the numbers of the deputation after this ceremony had been concluded there was earnest debate in the council the prince of orange addressed a few words to the duchess with a view of calming her irritation he observed that the confederates were no seditious rebels but royal gentlemen well-born well-connected and of honourable character 
they had been influenced he said by an honest desire to save their country from impending danger not by avarice or ambition egmont shrugged his shoulders and observed that it was necessary for him to leave the court for a season in order to make a visit to the baths of aix for an inflammation which he had in the leg it was then that Berlaymont, according to the account which has been sanctioned by nearly every contemporary writer whether catholic or protestant uttered the guide which was destined to become immortal and to give a popular name to the confederacy what madam he reported to have cried in a passion is it possible that your highness can entertain fears of these beggars yeah is it not obvious what manner of men they are they have not wisdom enough to manage their own estates and are they now to teach the king and your highness how to govern the country by the living god if my advice were taken their petition should have a cudgel for a commentary and we would make them go down the steps of the palace a great deal faster than they mounted them the duchess finally agreed to send an envoy to philip who should lay before him the wishes of the hollanders she promised also to order the inquisitors to act modestly and discreetly whatever that might imply she declared that she could do nothing more meanwhile the next important step in Bredereau's eyes was a dinner he accordingly invited the confederates to a magnificent repast which he had ordered to be prepared in the Kohlenberg mansion three hundred guests sat down upon the eighth of april to this luxurious banquet which was destined to become historical the board glittered with silver and gold the wine circulated with more than its usual rapidity among the band of noble bacchanals who were never weary of drinking the healths of bread oil, of orange and of egmont it was thought that the occasion imperiously demanded an extraordinary carouse and the political events of the past three days lent an additional excitement to the wine there was an earnest discussion as to an appropriate name to be given to their confederacy should they call themselves the society of, of concord the restorers of lost liberty or by what other attractive title should the league be baptized Bredereau was however already prepared to settle the question he knew the value of a popular and original name he possessed the instinct by which adroit partisans in every age have been accustomed to convert the reproachful epithets of their opponents into watchwords of honor and he had already made his preparations for a startlingly theatrical effect suddenly amid the din of voices he arose with all his rhetorical powers at command he recounted to the company the observations which the seigneur de berlamont was reported to have made to the duchess upon the presentation of the request and the name which he had thought fit to apply to them collectively most of the gentlemen then heard the memorable sarcasm for the first time great was the indignation of all that the state councillor should have dared to stigmatize as beggars a band of gentlemen with the best blood of the land in their veins great road on the contrary smoothing their anger assured them with good humor that nothing could be more fortunate they call us beggars he said let us accept the name we will contend with the inquisition but remain loyal to the king even till compelled to wear the beggar's sack he then beckoned to one of his pages who brought him a leathern wallet such as was worn that at that day by professional medicants together with a large wooden bowl which also formed part of their regular appurtenances Red Road immediately hung the wallet around his neck, filled the bowl with wine, lifted it with both hands, and drained it at a draught. Long live the beggars! he cried, as he wiped his beard and set the bowl down. Vivent les gales! Then, for the first time, from the lips of those reckless nobles rose a famous cry, which was so often to ring over land and sea, amid blazing cities, on blood stained decks, through the smoke and carnage of many a stricken field. The humor of Bredereau was hailed with deafening shouts of applause. The Count then threw the wallet around the neck of his nearest neighbor, and handed him the wooden bowl. Each guest in turn donned the medicant's knapsack. Pushing aside his golden goblet, each filled the beggar's bowl to the brim, and drained it to the beggar's health. Roars of laughter and shouts of the vent les galeux shook the walls of the stately mansion. 
as they were doomed never to shake again the shibboleth was invented the conjuration which they had been anxiously seeking was found their enemies had provided them with a spell which was to prove in after days potent enough to start a spirit from palace to hovel forest or wave as the deeds of the wild beggars and the beggars of the sea taught philip at last to understand the nation which he had driven to madness when the wallet and the bowl had made the circuit of the table they were suspended to a pillar in the hall each of the company in succession then threw some salt into his goblet and placing himself under the symbols of the brotherhood repeated a jingling distich produced impromptu for the occasion by this salt by this bread by this wallet we swear these beggars ne'er will change though all the world should stare this ridiculous ceremony completed the rites by which the confederacy received its name but the banquet was by no means terminated the uproar became furious the younger and more reckless nobles abandoned themselves to revelry which would have shamed heathen saturnalia they renewed to each other every moment their vociferous oaths of fidelity to the common cause drained huge beakers to the beggar's health turned their caps and doublets inside out danced upon chairs and tables several addressed each other as lord abbot or reverend prior of this or that religious institution thus indicating the means by which some of them hoped to mend their broken fortunes while the tumult was at its height the prince of orange with counts horn and egmont entered the apartment they had been dining quietly with mansfeld who was confined to his house with an inflamed eye and they were on their way to the council chamber where the sessions were now prolonged nightly to a late hour knowing that hogstraten somewhat against his will had been induced to be present at the banquet they had come round by the way of kohlenberg house to induce him to retire they were also disposed if possible to abridge the festivities which their influence would have been powerless to prevent these great nobles as soon as they made their appearance were surrounded by a crew of beggars maddened and dripping with their recent baptism of wine who compelled them to drink a cup amid shouts of vivent le roi et le glow the meaning of this cry they of course could not understand for even those who had heard burlamont's contemptuous remarks might not remember the exact term which he had used and certainly could not be aware of the importance to which it had just been elevated as for horn he disliked and had long before quarrelled with Bredarode, had prevented many persons from signing the compromise and although a guest at that time of orange was in the habit of retiring to bed before supper to avoid the company of many who frequented the house yet his presence for a few moments with the best of intentions the conclusion of this famous banquet was made one of the most deadly charges which were afterwards drawn up against him by the crown the three seigneurs refused to be seated and remained but for a moment the length of a misere taking with them hogstrapton as they retired they also prevailed upon the whole party to break up at the same time so that their presence had served at least to put a conclusion in the disgraceful riot when they arrived at the council chamber they received the thanks of the duchess for what they had done such was the first movement made by the members of the compromise was it strange that orange should feel little affinity with such companions had he not reason to hesitate if the sacred cause of civil and religious liberty could only be maintained by these defenders and with such assistance the beggars did not content themselves with the name alone of the time-honored fraternity of medicants in which they had enrolled themselves immediately after the kohlenberg banquet a costume for the confederacy was decided upon these young gentlemen discarding gold lace and velvet thought it expedient to array themselves in doublets and hose of ashen gray with short cloaks of the same color all of the coarsest material they appeared in this guise in the streets with common felt hats on their heads and beggars pouches and bowls at their sides they caused also metals of lead and copper to be struck bearing upon one side the head of philip upon the reverse two hands clasped within a wallet with the motto faithful to the king even to wearing the beggar's sack these badges they wore around their necks or as buttons to their hats as a further distinction they shaved their beards close excepting the mustaches 
which were left long and pendant in the Turkish fashion. That custom, as it seemed, being an additional characteristic of medicants. Very soon after these events, the nobles of the League dispersed from the capital to their various homes. Frederode rode out of Brussels at the head of a band of cavaliers, who saluted the concourse of applauding spectators with a discharge of their pistols. Forty-three gentlemen accompanied him to Antwerp, where he halted for a night. The Duchess had already sent notice to the magistrates of that city of his intended visit, and warned them to have an eye upon his proceedings. The great beggar, as Hogstraten called him, conducted himself, however, with as much propriety as, as could be expected. Four or five thousand of the inhabitants thronged about the hotel, where he had taken up his quarters. He appeared at a window with his wooden bowl, filled with wine in his hands, and his wallet at his side. He assured the multitude that he was ready to die to defend the good people of Antwerp, and of all the Netherlands, against the edicts and the Inquisition meanwhile he drank their healths and begged all who accepted the pledge to hold up their hands the populace highly amused held up and clapped their hands as honest brederode drained his bowl and were soon afterwards persuaded to retire in great good humour end of section fifty eight this recording is in the public domain Section 59 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Watson. The World's Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 59. The Siege of Leyden. 1574, by John Lothrop Motley. This city was one of the most beautiful in the Netherlands, placed in the midst of broad, fruitful pastures which had been reclaimed by the hand of industry from the bottom of the sea. It was fringed with smiling villages, blooming gardens, fruitful orchards. The ancient and at last decrepit Rhine, flowing languidly towards its sandy deathbed, had been multiplied into innumerable artificial currents by which the city was completely interlaced. These watery streets were shaded by lime trees, poplars, and willows, and crossed by 145 bridges, mostly of hammered stone. The houses were elegant, the squares and streets spacious, airy, and clean, the churches and public edifices imposing, while the whole aspect of the place suggested thrift, industry, and comfort. Upon an artificial elevation, in the center of the city, rose a ruined tower of unknown antiquity. By some it was considered to be of Roman origin, while others preferred to regard it as a work of the Anglo-Saxon Hengist, raised to commemorate his conquest of England. Surrounded by fruit trees and overgrown in the center with oaks, it afforded from its moldering battlements a charming prospect over a wide expanse of level country, with the spires of neighboring cities rising in every direction. It was from this commanding height during the long and terrible summer days which were approaching that many an eye was to be strained anxiously seaward, watching if yet the ocean had begun to roll over the land. In 1574, the Spaniards, under Don Francis Valdez, besieged Leyden and built so many redoubts around the city that there was no hope of succor coming to it by land. Food was already becoming scarce when Philip offered to pardon his erring subjects if they would give up their religion and return to the Roman Catholic Church. Half starving as they were, they refused. William of Orange held the fortress of Poldermart. Between him and the besieged city, a precarious communication was kept up by carrier pigeons and venturesome messengers called jumpers. The Netherlanders were weak on land, but on the sea they were irresistible, and William believed that the only way to save the city was to break down the dikes, open the sluice gates, and allow the ocean to roll over the country. Then their fleet could sail over the submerged land and bring relief to the famishing city. The Hollanders agreed. Better a drowned land than a lost land, they cried. Money plate and jewelry poured in that the work might progress. The dikes were pierced, 
and the waters poured over the country. Admiral Boisset, with 800 sea beggars, as the rebel sailors were called, set out boldly on the new ocean to carry food to Leyden. But when almost within sight of the city, the boats ran aground. Eighteen inches of water were needed to float them, and there was no chance of getting it unless the wind should shift to the west and roll the ocean in through the gaps in the dikes. Meantime, the besieged city was at its last gasp. The burghers had been in a state of uncertainty for many days, being aware that the fleet had set forth for their relief, but knowing full well the thousand obstacles which it had to surmount. They had guessed its progress by the illumination from the blazing villages. They had heard its salvos of artillery on its arrival at North A. But since then, all had been dark and mournful again, hope and fear in sickening alternation, distracting every breast. They knew that the wind was unfavorable, and at the dawn of each day every eye was turned wistfully to the veins of the steeples. So long as the easterly breeze prevailed, they felt as they anxiously stood on towers and housetops that they must look in vain for the welcome ocean. Yet while thus patiently waiting, they were literally starving, for even the misery endured at Harlem had not reached that depth and intensity of agony to which Leyden was now reduced. Bread, malt cake, horse flesh had entirely disappeared. Dogs, cats, rats, and other vermin were esteemed luxuries. A small number of cows, kept as long as possible for their milk, still remained, but a few were killed from day to day and distributed in minute proportions hardly sufficient to support life among the famishing population. Starving wretches swarmed daily around the shambles where these cattle were slaughtered, contending for any morsel which might fall, and lapping eagerly the blood as it ran along the pavement, while the hides, chopped and boiled, were greedily devoured. Women and children all day long were seen searching gutters and dunghills for morsels of food, which they disputed fiercely with the famishing dogs. The green leaves were stripped from the trees, every living herb was converted into human food, but these expedients could not avert starvation. The daily mortality was frightful. Infants starved to death on the maternal breasts, which famine had parched and withered. Mothers dropped dead in the streets, with their dead children in their arms. In many a house the watchmen, in their rounds, found a whole family of corpses, father, mother, and children, side by side, for a disorder called the plague, naturally engendered of hardship and famine, now came, as if in kindness, to abridge the agony of the people. The pestilence stalked at noonday through the city, and the doomed inhabitants fell like grass beneath its scythe. From six thousand to eight thousand human beings sank before this scourge alone, yet the people resolutely held out, women and men mutually encouraging each other to resist the entrance of the foreign foe an evil more horrible than pest or famine. The missives from Valdez, who saw more vividly than the besieged could do the uncertainty of his own position, now poured daily into the city, the enemy becoming more prodigal of his vows, as he felt that the ocean might yet save the victims from his grasp. The inhabitants, in their ignorance, had gradually abandoned their hopes of relief, but they spurned the summons to surrender, Leyden was sublime in its despair. A few murmurs were, however, occasionally heard at the steadfastness of the magistrates, and a dead body was placed at the door of the burgomaster, as a silent witness against his inflexibility. A party of the more faint-hearted even assailed the heroic Adrian van de Werf with threats and reproaches as he passed through the streets. A crowd had gathered around him, as he reached a triangular place in the center of the town, into which many of the principal streets emptied themselves, and upon one side of which stood the Church of St. Pancras, with its high brick tower surmounted by two pointed turrets, and with two ancient lime trees at its entrance. There stood the burgomaster, a tall, haggard, imposing figure with dark visage and a tranquil but commanding eye. He waved his broad-leaved felt hat for silence, and then exclaimed in language which has been almost literally preserved, What would ye, my friends? Why do ye murmur that we do not break our vows and surrender the city to the Spaniards? 
a fate more horrible than the agony which she now endures. I tell you I have made an oath to hold the city, and may God give me strength to keep my oath. I can die but once, whether by your hands, the enemies, or by the hand of God. My own fate is indifferent to me, not so that of the city entrusted to my care. I know that we shall starve, if not soon relieved, but starvation is preferable to the dishonored death which is the only alternative. Your menaces move me not. My life is at your disposal. Here is my sword. Plunge it into my breast and divide my flesh among you. Take my body to appease your hunger, but expect no surrender, so long as I remain alive. The words of the stout Bergen master inspired a new courage in the hearts of those who heard him, and a shout of applause and defiance arose from the famishing but enthusiastic crowd. They left the place after exchanging new vows of fidelity with their magistrate and again ascended tower and battlement to watch for the coming fleet. From the ramparts they hurled renewed defiance to the enemy. Ye call us rat-eaters and dog-eaters, they cried, and it is true. So long, then, as you hear dog bark or cat mew within the walls, ye may know that the city holds out. And when all has perished but ourselves, be sure that we will each devour our left arm, retaining our right to defend our women, our liberty, and our religion against the foreign tyrant. Should God in his wrath doom us to destruction and deny us all relief, even then will we maintain ourselves forever against your entrance. When the last hour has come with our own hands, we will set fire to the city and perish, men, women, and children together in the flames, rather than suffer our homes to be polluted and our liberties to be crushed. Such words of defiance thundered daily from the battlements, sufficiently informed Valdez as to his chance of conquering the city, either by force or fraud, but at the same time he felt comparatively relieved by the inactivity of Boisset's fleet, which still lay stranded at North A. As well, shouted the Spaniards derisively to the citizens, as well can the Prince of Orange pluck the stars from the sky as bring the ocean to the walls of Leyden for your relief. On the 28th of September, a dove flew into the city, bringing a letter from Admiral Boisset. In this dispatch, the position of the fleet at North A was described in encouraging terms, and the inhabitants were assured that in a very few days at farthest, the long-expected relief would enter their gates. The letter was read publicly upon the marketplace, and the bells were rung for joy. Nevertheless, on the morrow, the veins pointed to the east. The waters, so far from rising, continued to sink, and Admiral Boisset was almost in despair. He wrote to the prince that if the spring tide, now to be expected, should not, together with a strong and favorable wind, come immediately to their relief, it would be in vain to attempt anything further, and that the expedition would of necessity be abandoned. The tempest came to their relief. A violent equinoctial gale, on the night of the 1st and 2nd of October, came storming from the northwest, shifting after a few hours full eight points, and then blowing still more violently from the southwest. The waters of the North Sea were piled in vast masses upon the southern coast of Holland, and then dashed furiously landward, the ocean rising over the earth and sweeping with unrestrained power across the ruined dikes. In the course of twenty-four hours, the fleet at North A, instead of nine inches, had more than two feet of water. No time was lost. The Kirkway, which had been broken through, according to the prince's instructions, was now completely overflowed, and the fleet sailed at midnight in the midst of the storm and darkness. A few sentinel vessels of the enemy challenged them as they steadily rowed towards Zuterwalde. The answer was a flash from Boisset's cannon, lighting up the black waste of waters. There was a fierce midnight battle, a strange spectacle among the branches of those quiet orchards, and with the chimney stacks of half-submerged farmhouses rising around the contending vessels. The neighboring village of Zuterwalde shook with the discharges of the Zeelanders' cannon, and the Spaniards assembled in that fortress knew that the rebel admiral was at last afloat and on his course. The enemy's vessels were soon sunk, and their crews hurled into the waves. On went the fleet, sweeping over the broad waters which lay between Zuterwalde and Zwieten. 
as they approached some shallows which led into the great mare the zealanders dashed into the sea and with sheer strength shouldered every vessel through two obstacles lay still in their path the forts of zutrawalda and lamon distant from the city five hundred and two hundred and fifty yards respectively strong redoubts both well supplied with troops and artillery they were likely to give a rough reception to the light flotilla but the panic which had hitherto driven their foes before the advancing patriots had reached zutrawalda hardly was the fleet in sight when the spaniards in the early morning poured out from the fortress and fled precipitately to the left along a road which led in a westerly direction toward the hague their narrow path was rapidly vanishing in the waves and hundreds sank beneath the constantly deepening and treacherous flood the wild zealanders too sprang from their vessels upon the crumbling dike and drove their retreating foes into the sea they hurled their harpoons at them with an accuracy acquired in many a polar chase they plunged into the waves in the keen pursuit attacking them with boat hook and dagger the numbers who thus fell beneath these corsairs who neither gave nor took quarter were never counted but probably not less than a thousand perished the rest effected their escape to the hague the first fortress was thus seized dismantled set on fire and passed and a few strokes of the oars brought the whole fleet close to lamen this last object rose formidable and frowning directly across their path swarming as it was with soldiers and bristling with artillery it seemed to defy the armada either to carry it by storm or to pass under its guns into the city it appeared that the enterprise was after all to founder within sight of the long expecting and expected haven Boisset anchored his fleet within a respectful distance and spent what remained of the day in carefully reconnoitering the fort which seemed only too strong in conjunction with Lederdorp, the headquarters of valdez a mile and a half distant on the right and within a mile of the city it seemed so insuperable an impediment that Boisset wrote in despondent tone to the prince of orange he announced his intention of carrying the fort if it were possible on the following morning but if obliged to retreat he observed with something like despair that there would be nothing for it but to wait for another gale of wind if the waters should rise sufficiently to enable them to make a wide detour it might be possible if in the meantime Leyden did not starve or surrender to enter its gates from the opposite side meantime the citizens had grown wild with expectation a dove had been dispatched by boisset informing them of his precise position and a number of citizens accompanied the burgomaster at nightfall towards the tower of hengist yonder cried the burgomaster stretching out his hand towards lamen yonder behind that fort are bread and meat and brethren in thousands shall all this be destroyed by the spanish guns or shall we rush to the rescue of our friends we will tear the fortress to fragments with our teeth and nails was the reply before the relief so long expected shall be wrested from us it was resolved that a sortie in conjunction with the operations of boisset should be made against lamen with the earliest dawn night descended upon the scene a pitch-dark night full of anxiety to the spaniards to the armada to Leyden. strange sights and sounds occurred at different moments to bewilder the anxious sentinels a long procession of lights issuing from the fort was seen to flit across the black face of the waters in the dead of night and the whole of the city wall between the cowgate and the tower of burgundy fell with a loud crash the horror-struck citizens thought that the spaniards were upon them at last the spaniards imagined the noise to indicate a desperate sortie of the citizens everything was vague and mysterious day dawned at length after the feverish night and the admiral prepared for the assault within the fortress reigned a death-like stillness which inspired a sickening suspicion had the city indeed been carried in the night had the massacre already commenced had all this labor and audacity been expended in vain suddenly a man was descried wading breast high through the water from lamen toward the fleet while at the same time one solitary boy was seen to wave his cap from the summit of the fort after a moment of doubt 
the happy mystery was solved. The Spaniards had fled, panic-struck, during the darkness. Their position would still have enabled them, with firmness, to frustrate the enterprise of the patriots, but the hand of God, which had sent the ocean and the tempest to the deliverance of Leyden, had struck her enemies with terror likewise. The lights which had been seen moving during the night were the lanterns of the retreating Spaniards, and the boy, who was now waving his triumphant signal from the battlements, had alone witnessed the spectacle. So confident was he in the conclusion to which it led him that he had volunteered at daybreak to go thither all alone. The magistrates, fearing a trap, hesitated for a moment to believe the truth, which soon, however, became quite evident. Valdez, flying himself from Lederdorp, had ordered Colonel Borgia to retire with all his troops from Laman. Thus the Spaniards had retreated at the very moment that an extraordinary accident had laid bare a whole side of the city for their entrance. The noise of the wall, as it fell, only inspired them with fresh alarm, for they believed that the citizens had sallied forth in the darkness to aid the advancing flood and the work of destruction. All obstacles being now removed, the fleet of Boisset swept by Laman and entered the city on the morning of the 3rd of October. Leyden was relieved. The quays were lined with the famishing population as the fleet rode through the canals, every human being who could stand coming forth to greet the preservers of the city. Bread was thrown from every vessel among the crowd. The poor creatures who for two months had tasted no wholesome human food and who had literally been living within the jaws of death snatched eagerly the blessed gift at last too liberally bestowed. Many choked themselves to death in the greediness with which they devoured their bread. Others became ill with the effect of plenty, thus suddenly succeeding starvation. But these were isolated cases, a repetition of which was prevented. The admiral, stepping ashore, was welcomed by the magistracy, and a solemn procession was immediately formed. Magistrates and citizens, wild Zealanders, emaciated burgher guards, sailors, soldiers, women, children... Nearly every living person within the walls all repaired without delay to the great church, stout Admiral Boisset leading the way. The starving and heroic city, which had been so firm in its resistance to an earthly king, now bent itself in humble gratitude before the king of kings. After prayers, the whole vast congregation joined in the thanksgiving hymn. Thousands of voices raised the song, but few were able to carry it to its conclusion, for the universal emotion, deepened by the music, became too full for utterance. The hymn was abruptly suspended, while the multitude wept like children. The scene of honest pathos terminated. The necessary measures for distributing the food and for relieving the sick were taken by the magistracy. A note dispatched to the Prince of Orange was received by him at two o'clock as he sat in church at Delft. It was of a somewhat different purport than that of the letter which he had received early in the same day from Boisset, the letter in which the admiral had informed him that the success of the enterprise depended, after all, upon the desperate assault upon a nearly impregnable fort. The joy of the prince may be easily imagined, and so soon as the sermon was concluded, he handed the letter just received to the minister to be read to the congregation. Thus all participated in his joy, and united with him in thanksgiving. End of section 59 Section 60 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 60 the Assassination of William the Silent, 1584, by John Lothrop Motley. The news of Andrew's death had been brought to Delft by a special messenger from the French court. On Sunday morning, the 8th of July, 1584, the Prince of Orange, having read the dispatches before leaving his bed, caused the man who had brought them to be summoned, that he might give some particular details by word of mouth concerning the last illness of the duke. The courier was accordingly admitted to the prince's bedchamber, and proved to be one Francis Guillon, as he called himself. 
This man had, early in the spring, claimed and received the protection of Orange on the ground of being the son of a Protestant at Besançon, who had suffered death for his religion, and of his own ardent attachment to the Reformed faith. A pious, psalm-singing, thoroughly Calvinistic youth he seemed to be, having a Bible or a hymn-book under his arm whenever he walked the street, and most exemplary in his attendance at sermon and lecture. For the rest, a singularly unobtrusive personage, twenty-seven years of age, low of stature, meagre, mean-visaged, muddy-complexioned, and altogether a man of no account, quite insignificant in the eyes of all who looked upon him. If there were one opinion in which the few who had taken the trouble to think of the puny, somewhat shambling stranger from Burgundy at all coincided, it was that he was inoffensive, but quite incapable of any important business. He seemed well-educated, claimed to be of respectable parentage, and had considerable facility of speech when any person could be found who thought it worth while to listen to him. But on the whole, he attracted little attention. Nevertheless, this insignificant frame locked up a desperate and daring character. This mild and inoffensive nature had gone pregnant seven years with a terrible crime, whose birth could not much longer be retarded. Francis Guillon, the Calvinist, son of a martyred Calvinist, was in reality Balthazar Girard, a fanatical Catholic whose father and mother were still living at Villefont in Burgundy. Before reaching man's estate, he had formed the design of murdering the Prince of Orange, who, so long as he lived, seemed like to remain a rebel against the Catholic king, and to make every effort to disturb the repose of the Roman Catholic apostolic religion. When but twenty years of age, he had struck his dagger with all his might into a door, exclaiming as he did so, Would that the blow had been in the heart of Orange! For this he was rebuked by a bystander who told him it was not for him to kill princes, and that it was not desirable to destroy so good a captain as the prince who, after all, might one day reconcile himself with the king. As soon as the ban against Orange was published, Balthazar, more anxious than ever to execute his long-cherished design, left Dole and came to Luxembourg. Here he learned that the deed had already been done by John Jorigi. He received this intelligence at first with a sensation of relief, was glad to be excused from putting himself in danger, and believing the prince dead, took service as clerk with one John Duprel, secretary to Count Mansfeld, governor of Luxembourg. Ere long, the ill success of Georgie's attempt becoming known, the inveterate determination of Gerard aroused itself more fiercely than ever. He accordingly took models of Mansfeld's official seals in wax in order that he might make use of them as an acceptable offering to the Orange Party, whose confidence he meant to gain. Various circumstances detained him, however. A sum of money was stolen, and he was forced to stay till it was found for fear of being arrested as the thief. Then his cousin and employer fell sick, and Gerard was obliged to wait for his recovery. At last, in March 1584, the weather, as he said, appearing to be fine, Balthazar left Luxembourg and came to Treves. While there, he confided his scheme to the regent of the Jesuit College, a red-haired man whose name has not been preserved. The dignitary expressed high approbation of the plan, gave Gerard his blessing, and promised him that, if his life should be sacrificed, in achieving his purpose, he would be enrolled among the martyrs. Another Jesuit, however, in the same college, with whom he likewise communicated, held very different language, making great efforts to turn the young man from his design, on the ground of the inconveniences which might arise from the forging of Mansfeld's seals, adding that neither he nor any of the Jesuits liked to meddle with such affairs, but advising that the whole matter be laid before the Prince of Parma. It does not appear that this personage, an excellent man, and a learned, attempted to dissuade the young man from his project by arguments drawn from any supposed criminality in the assassination itself, or from any danger, temporal or eternal, to which the perpetrator might expose himself. Not influenced, as it appears, except on one point, by the advice of this second ghostly confessor, Balthazar came to Tournay, and held counsel with the third, the celebrated Franciscan, Father Jerry, by whom he was much comforted and strengthened in his determination. His next step was to lay the project before Parma, as the excellent and learned Jesuit at Treves had advised. This he did by a letter, drawn up with much care, and which he evidently thought well of as a composition. One copy of this letter he deposited with the guardian of the Franciscan convent at Tournay, the other he presented with his own hand to the Prince of Parma. The vassal, said he, ought always to prefer justice and the will of the king to his own life. That being the case, he expressed his astonishment that no man had yet been found to execute the sentence against William of Nassau, except the gentle Biscayan since defunct. 
To accomplish the task, Balthazar observed very judiciously that it was necessary to have access to the person of the prince, wherein consisted the difficulty. Those who had that advantage, he continued, were therefore bound to extirpate the pest at once, without obliging his majesty to send to Rome for a chevalier, because not one of them was willing to precipitate himself into the venomous gulf which by its contagion infected and killed the souls and bodies of all poor abused subjects exposed to its influence. Gerard avowed himself to have been so long goaded and stimulated by these considerations, so extremely nettled with displeasure and bitterness at seeing the obstinate wretch still escaping his just judgment, as to have formed the design of baiting a trap for the fox, hoping thus to gain access to him and to take him unawares. He added, without explaining the nature of the trap and the bait, that he deemed it his duty to lay the subject before the most serene prince of Parma, protesting at the same time that he did not contemplate the exploit for the sake of the reward mentioned in the sentence, and that he preferred trusting in that regard to the immense liberality of his majesty. Parma had long been looking for a good man to murder Orange, feeling, as Philip, Granville, and all former governors of the Netherlands had felt, that this was the only means of saving the royal authority in any part of the provinces. Many unsatisfactory assassins had presented themselves from time to time, and Alexander had paid money in hand to various individuals, Italians, Spaniards, Lorrainers, Scotchmen, Englishmen, who had generally spent the sums received without attempting the job. Others were supposed to be still engaged in the enterprise, and at that moment there were four persons, each unknown to the others and of different nations, in the city of Delft seeking to compass the death of William the Silent. Shag-eared, military, hirsute ruffians, ex-captains of free companies and such marauders, were daily offering their services. There was no lack of them, and they had done but little. How should Parma, seeing this obscure, undersized, thin-bearded runaway clerk before him, expect pith and energy from him. He thought him quite unfit for an enterprise of moment, and declared as much to his secret counsellors and to the king. He soon dismissed him, after receiving his letters, and it may be supposed that the bombastic style of that epistle would not efface the unfavourable impression produced by Balthazar's exterior. The representations of Old Penn and others induced him so far to modify his views as to send his confidential counsellor, Asson le Ville, to the stranger, in order to learn the details of the scheme. Asson le Ville had, accordingly, an interview with Gerard, in which he requested the young man to draw up a statement of his plan in writing, and this was done upon the 11th of April, 1584. In this letter, Gerard explained his plan of introducing himself to the notice of Orange, at Delft, as the son of an executed Calvinist, as himself warmly, though secretly, devoted to the Reformed faith, and as desirous, therefore, of placing himself in the prince's service, in order to avoid the insolence of the papists. Having gained the confidence of those about the prince, he would suggest to them the great use which might be made of Mansfeld's signet in forging passports for spies and other persons whom it might be desirous to send into the territory of the royalists. With these or similar feints and frivolities, continued Gerard, he should soon obtain access to the person of the said Nassau repeating his protestation that nothing had moved him to his enterprise, save the good zeal which he bore to the faith and true religion guarded by the Holy Mother Church Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman, and to the service of his majesty. He begged pardon for having purloined the impressions of the seals, a turpitude which he never would have committed, but would sooner have suffered a thousand deaths except for the great end in view. He particularly wished forgiveness for that crime before going to his task, in order that he might confess and receive the Holy Communion at the coming Easter, without scruples of conscience. He likewise begged the Prince of Parma to obtain for him absolution from his holiness for this crime of pilfering, the more so as he was about to keep company for some time with heretics and atheists, and in some sort to conform himself to their customs. From the general tone of the letters of Gerard, he might be set down at once as a simple religious fanatic, who felt sure that, in executing the command of Philip publicly issued to all the murders of Europe, he was meriting well of God and his king. There is no doubt that he was an exalted enthusiast, but not purely an enthusiast. The man's character offers more than one point of interest as a psychological phenomenon. He had convinced himself that the work which he had in hand was eminently meritorious, and he was utterly without fear of consequences. 
He was, however, by no means so disinterested as he chose to represent himself in letters which, as he instinctively felt, were to be of perennial interest. On the contrary, in his interviews with Asson Leville, he urged that he was a poor fellow, and that he had undertaken this enterprise in order to acquire property, to make himself rich, and that he depended upon the Prince of Parma's influence in obtaining the reward promised by the ban to the individual who should put Orange to death. This second letter decided Parma so far that he authorized Asson Leville to encourage the young man in his attempt, and to promise that the reward should be given to him in case of success, and to his heirs in the event of his death. Assonville, in the second interview, accordingly made known these assurances in the strongest manner to Gerard, warning him, at the same time, on no account if arrested to inculpate the Prince of Parma. The counsellor, while thus exhorting the stranger, according to Alexander's commands, confined himself, however, to generalities, refusing even to advance fifty crowns which Balthazar had begged from the governor-general in order to provide for the necessary expenses of this project. Parma had made similar advances too often to men who had promised to assassinate the prince and then had done little, and he was resolute in his refusal to this new adventurer, of whom he expected absolutely nothing. Gerard, however, notwithstanding this rebuff, was not disheartened. I will provide myself out of my own purse, he said to Assonville, and within six weeks you will hear of me. Go forth, my son, said Assonville paternally, upon this spirited reply and if you succeed in your enterprise, the king will fulfill all his promises, and you will gain an immortal name beside. The inveterate deliberation, thus thoroughly matured, Gerard now proceeded to carry into effect. He came to Delft, obtained a hearing of Villers, the clergyman and intimate friend of Orange, showed him the Mansfeld seals, and was somewhat against his will sent to France to exhibit them to Marshal Biron, who, it was thought, was soon to be appointed governor of Cambrai. Through Orange's recommendation, the Burgundian was received into the suite of Noël de Caron, seigneur de Chauneval, then setting forth on a special mission to the Duke of Anjou. While in France, Gerard could rest neither by day nor night, so tormented was he by the desire of accomplishing his project, and at length he obtained permission, upon the death of the Duke, to carry this important intelligence to the Prince of Orange. The dispatches having been entrusted to him, he travelled post-haste to Delft, and to his astonishment the letters had hardly been delivered before he was summoned in person to the chamber of the prince. Here was an opportunity such as he had never dared to hope for, the arch-enemy to the church and to the human race whose death would confer upon his destroyer wealth and nobility in this world, besides a crown of glory in the next, lay unarmed, alone, in bed before the man who had thirsted seven long years for his blood. Balthazar could hardly control his emotions sufficiently to answer the questions which the prince addressed to him concerning the death of Anjou, but Orange, deeply engaged with the dispatches and with the reflections which their deeply important contents suggested, did not observe the countenance of the humble Calvinist exile, who had been recently recommended to his patronage by Villers. Gerard had, moreover, made no preparation for an interview so entirely unexpected, had come unarmed, and had formed no plan for escape. He was obliged to forego his prey when most within his reach, and after communicating all the information which the prince required, he was dismissed from the chamber. It was Sunday morning, and the bells were tolling for church. Upon leaving the house he loitered about the courtyard, furtively examining the premises so that a sergeant of halberdiers asked him why he was waiting there. Balthazar meekly replied that he was desirous of attending divine worship in the church opposite, but added, pointing to his shabby and travel-stained attire, that without at least a new pair of shoes and stockings he was unfit to join the congregation. Insignificant as ever, the small, pious, dusty stranger excited no suspicion in the mind of the good-natured sergeant. He forthwith spoke of the wants of Gerard to an officer, by whom they were communicated to Orange himself, and the prince instantly ordered a sum of money to be given him. Thus Balthazar obtained from William's charity what Parma's thrift had denied, a fund for carrying out his purpose. Next morning, with the money, he purchased a pair of pistols, or small carabines from a soldier, chaffering long about the price because the vendor could not supply a particular kind of chopped bullets or slugs which he desired. Before the sunset of the following day, that soldier had stabbed himself to the heart, and died despairing on hearing for what purpose the pistols had been bought. 
On Tuesday, the 10th of July, 1584, at about half-past twelve, the prince, with his wife on his arm, and followed by the ladies and gentlemen of his family, was going to the dining-room. William the Silent was dressed upon that day, according to his usual custom, in very plain fashion. He wore a wide-leaved, loosely-shaped hat of dark felt, with a silken cord round the crown, such as had been worn by the beggars in the early days of the revolt. A high ruff encircled his neck, from which also depended one of the beggar's medals, with the motto, Fidèle au roi jusqu'à la besace, while a loose surcoat of grey frieze cloth over a tawny leather doublet with wide slashed underclothes completed his costume. Gerard presented himself at the doorway and demanded a passport. The princess, struck with the pale and agitated countenance of the man, anxiously questioned her husband concerning the stranger. The prince carelessly observed that it was merely a person who came for a passport, ordering at the same time a secretary forthwith to prepare one. The princess, still not relieved, observed in an undertone that she had never seen so villainous a countenance. Orange, however, not at all impressed with the appearance of Gerard, conducted himself at table with his usual cheerfulness, conversing much with the burgomaster of Leoarden, the only guest present at the family dinner, concerning the political and religious aspects of Friesland. At two o'clock the company rose from the table. The prince led the way, intending to pass to his private apartments above. The dining-room, which was on the ground floor, opened into a little square vestibule, which communicated through an arched passageway with the main entrance into the courtyard. This vestibule was also directly at the foot of the wooden staircase leading to the next floor, and was scarcely six feet in width. Upon its left side, as one approached the stairway, was an obscure arch sunk deep in the wall and completely in the shadow of the door. Behind this arch a portal opened to the narrow lane at the side of the house. The stairs themselves were completely lighted by a large window, halfway up the flight. The prince came from the dining-room and began leisurely to ascend. He had only reached the second stair when a man emerged from the sunken arch, and standing within a foot or two of him, discharged a pistol full at his heart. Three balls entered his body, one of which, passing quite through him, struck with violence against the wall beyond. The prince exclaimed in French as he felt the wound, Oh my God, have mercy upon my soul! Oh my God, have mercy upon this poor people! These were the last words he ever spoke, save that when his sister, Catherine of Schwarzburg, immediately afterwards asked him if he commended his soul to Jesus Christ, he faintly answered, Yes. His master of the horse, Jacob von Maldre, had caught him in his arms as the fatal shot was fired. The prince was then placed on the stairs for an instant, when he immediately began to swoon. He was afterwards laid upon a couch in the dining-room, where, in a few minutes, he breathed his last in the arms of his wife and sister. The murderer succeeded in making his escape through the side door, and sped swiftly up the narrow lane. He had almost reached the ramparts from which he intended to spring into the moat when he stumbled over a heap of rubbish. As he rose, he was seized by several pages and halberdiers who had pursued him from the house. He had dropped his pistols upon the spot where he had committed the crime, and upon his person were found a couple of bladders, provided with a piece of pipe with which he had intended to assist himself across the moat, beyond which a horse was waiting for him. He made no effort to deny his identity, but boldly avowed himself in his deed. He was brought back to the house, where he immediately underwent a preliminary examination before the city magistrates. He was afterwards subjected to excruciating tortures, for the fury against the wretch who had destroyed the father of the country was uncontrollable, and William the Silent was no longer alive to intercede, as he had often done before, in behalf of those who assailed his life. End of section 60 this recording is in the public domain. Section 61 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7. Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 61. Sir Philip Sidney and the Glass of Water, 1586, by John Lothrop Motley. In 1581, the United Netherlands published their Declaration of Independence, and were about to make William the Silent their count, when he was assassinated. The Spaniards were delighted, 
for they thought that the Dutch, without him to lead them, could be overcome. The Dutch, however, had no idea of being overcome, and they felt especially courageous, for Queen Elizabeth had agreed to send them help, and she now ordered a fleet of fifty vessels to start for the Netherlands. The Earl of Leicester was in command, and with him was his nephew, Sir Philip Sidney, who was perhaps the best-loved man in England, the knight, without fear and without reproach. He met his death in the Battle of Zutphen. The Editor Sir Philip Sidney, in the last charge, rode quite through the enemy's ranks till he came upon their entrenchments, when a musket ball from the camp struck him upon the thigh, three inches above the knee. Although desperately wounded in a part which should have been protected by the quisses which he had thrown aside, he was not inclined to leave the field, but his own horse had been shot under him at the beginning of the action, and the one upon which he was now mounted became too restive for him, thus crippled to control. He turned reluctantly away, and rode a mile and a half back to the entrenchments, suffering extreme pain, for his leg was dreadfully shattered. As he passed along the edge of the battlefield, his attendants brought him a bottle of water to quench his raging thirst. At that moment a wounded English soldier, who had eaten his last at the same feast, looked up wistfully in his face, when Sidney instantly handed him the flask, exclaiming, "'Thy necessity is even greater than mine!' He then pledged his dying comrade in a draught, and was soon afterwards met by his uncle. "'Oh, Philip!' cried Lester in despair. "'I am truly grieved to see thee in this plight.' But Sidney comforted him with manful words, and assured him that death was sweet in the cause of his queen and his country. Sir William Russell, too, all blood-stained from the fight, threw his arms around his friend, wept like a child, and kissing his hand, exclaimed, Oh, noble Sir Philip, never did man attain hurt so honorably, or serve so valiantly as you. Sir William Pelham declared that Sidney's noble courage in the face of our enemies had won him a name of continuing honor. He, the Earl of Leicester, described Sidney's wound as very dangerous, the bone being broken in pieces, but said that the surgeons were in good hope. I pray God to save his life, said the Earl, and I care not how lame he be. Sir Philip was carried to Arnheim, where the best surgeons were immediately in attendance upon him. He submitted to their examination and the pain which they inflicted with great cheerfulness, although himself persuaded that his wound was mortal. For many days the result was doubtful, and messages were sent day by day to England that he was convalescent, intelligence which was hailed by the Queen and people as a matter not of private but of public rejoicing. He soon began to fail, however. Sidney was first to recognize the symptoms of mortification, which made a fatal result inevitable. His demeanor during his sickness and upon his deathbed was as beautiful as his life. He discoursed with his friends concerning the immortality of the soul, comparing the doctrines of Plato and of other ancient philosophers, whose writings were so familiar to him, with the revelations of scripture, and with the dictates of natural religion. He made his will with minute and elaborate provisions, leaving bequests, remembrances, and rings to all his friends. Then he indulged himself with music, and listened particularly to a strange song which he had himself composed during his illness, and which he had entitled La Cuisse Rompue. He took leave of the friends around him with perfect calmness, saying to his brother Robert, Love my memory, cherish my friends, above all, Govern your will and affections by the will and word of your Creator, and me beholding the end of this world with all her vanities. And thus this gentle and heroic spirit took its flight. End of section 61. This recording is in the public domain. Section 62 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The World's Story, Volume 7. Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappen. Section 62. How a Turf Boat Captured the City of Breda. 1590. By G. T. Hoare.
in the year 1590, the large, strongly built city of Breda, on the river Mark, was held by the soldiers of the King of Spain, or rather by Italians paid by him. These men were placed in a castle, surrounded by a deep moat or ditch, at the entrance of the town. While Prince Maurice, son of William of Orange, was anxiously considering how he should gain possession of the place, he was secretly visited by a boatman named Van der Berg, who was employed to supply the castle at Breda with dry turf for fuel, there being no wood or coal in the country. He said that his vessel was so constantly going in and out of the castle that it was hardly ever searched by the guard, and he proposed that some men should be concealed within it, and thus gain an entrance unperceived. To this plan Prince Maurice gave a ready consent. He chose sixty-eight men, in whose daring and patient determination he knew that he could trust, with four officers to take the command. On the night of the 25th of February, they came down at eleven o'clock to the ferry, where the boatman had agreed to meet them. Neither vessel nor man was to be seen, and they walked about for some hours, very cold, disappointed, and angry at Van der Berg for not having kept his promise. On their way back they met him, when he made the excuse that he had overslept himself. It was too late to attempt anything that night, but it was settled that they should be there the following evening. He seems to have grown afraid of the undertaking, for he did not come at the appointed time, but he sent his nephews, two boatmen who he declared were brave enough to dare any peril. On the 26th, the seventy Hollanders went on board the vessel, which appeared to be filled with blocks of turf, and packed themselves closely in the hold or lower part. The voyage was slow and most dangerous, for the winter wind, loaded with fog and sleet, blew straight down the river, bringing with it great blocks of ice. It became at length impossible to proceed farther. The patient soldiers, closely wedged together in the little hold, lay from Monday night till Thursday morning, bearing the pangs of hunger, thirst, and bitter cold, without a murmur. On the third morning there seemed no better prospect in store for them, for the east wind still raged with violence. Some food was, however, now quite necessary, so they stole on shore at a lonely place, where they refreshed themselves, and remained till night, when one of the boatmen came to say that the wind had changed and become favourable. Yet it was not till two days later that they ended their adventurous journey, and found themselves in the outer harbour of Breda. There was no going back now. The little band must either take the strong city and castle, defended by five companies of Italians, or die. The officer of the guard soon came on board to look at the turf, and arrange for its delivery. While he was in the cabin, he could be plainly seen and heard by the men below, the least sound made by them would have caused their instant discovery and destruction. Happily, he stayed only a few moments, and promised to send some soldiers to drag the vessel into the castle dock. Meanwhile, the turf boat struck upon a hidden rock in the river, and sprang a leak. Soon, the brave fellows in the hold were up to their knees in water. The boatmen worked away at the pumps to keep the vessel from sinking, and before long it was drawn into the inner harbour by a party of Italians from the shore. The deck was soon crowded with labourers unloading the turf, which was much needed, as there had been a great want of fuel. So rapidly did the work proceed that the prisoners began to fear that the daylight would soon shine in upon them, bringing discovery and death. To add to their danger, the whole party began sneezing and coughing, the consequence of the wetting they had received. One officer, whose cough was especially violent, begged his neighbours to stab him to the heart with his sword, lest the noise should betray his companions to the enemy. The bold boatmen, however, rendered this unnecessary by their presence of mind. 
the elder directed his brother to work the pump with as much clatter as possible so as to drown the sound of the coughing whilst he loudly assured the bystanders that the vessel was half full of water at length he said that he was tired and it was getting too dark to unload any more so giving the men some money he bade them go ashore and have some beer and finish their work the next morning the captain's servant stayed behind to complain that the turf was not so good as usual he was sure that his master would not like it ah replied the boatman coolly the best part of the cargo is underneath this is expressly reserved for the captain he is sure to get enough of it to-morrow before long the boat was left to itself shortly before midnight captain Herangier, the chief officer of the little band made a speech to his men reminding them that the time for retreat was now past the path to glory lay before them he bid them strike for their country and for themselves they were then divided into two parties one under himself to attack the guardhouse the other to gain possession of the arsenal belonging to the castle an arsenal is a place where guns powder and shot are stored with the utmost quietness they stole out of the ship and stood at last on the castle ground herangere went at once to the guardhouse to the question who goes there from a soldier on guard hearing footsteps in the darkness the captain replied a friend and seizing him by the throat commanded him on pain of death to give no alarm how many are there in the fort asked herangere three hundred and fifty whispered the frightened sentinel the dutchman not hearing the reply eagerly asked how many only fifty said their captain leaving out the three hundred to encourage them with the hope of an easy victory meanwhile there was a stir in the guardhouse the officer of the watch became alarmed and sprang out who goes there asked he a friend said herangere once more striking him dead with one blow the rest of the guard now turned out with torches the attacking party set upon them and soon drove them back into the guardhouse through the windows and doors of which they fired upon them soon there was not one of the enemy alive the other division of the hollanders had not been idle they had seized the arsenal and killed those who defended it the soldiers remaining in the castle were struck with fear and fled in disorder into the town spreading dismay and terror as they ran before dawn a party of the netherlands troops whose commander had been informed that the attempt was going to be made arrived before the gates of the town and soon after prince maurice himself with another large body of soldiers marched into it the fight was over about forty of the enemy's force were killed but not one man of the attacking party thus were five companies of italian soldiers utterly defeated and put to flight by the patient courage and determination of seventy hollanders end of section sixty two this recording is in the public domain section sixty three of germany the netherlands and switzerland read for librivox dot org by phone the netherlands part three the period of commercial greatness historical note the seventeenth century was the golden age of the dutch republic although its independence was not recognized until sixteen forty eight spain had practically abandoned the struggle forty years before the wealth and commerce of the netherlanders increased rapidly in 1602 the dutch east india company was organized and before many years their oversea possessions included territory in north and south america and a great part of the east indies the netherlands reached the height of their power and prosperity during the magistracy of jan de witt who was the grand pensionary chief executive of holland the richest of the dutch provinces from 1650 to 1672 
at this time the republic was the leading sea power and a great part of the commerce of europe was carried in her vessels it was jealousy of the growth of dutch trade that led england to pass the famous navigation acts which forbade any except english vessels manned chiefly by english sailors to bring to england the produce of asia africa or america in sixteen seventy two the netherlands were attacked by louis the fourteenth the french king and the conquest of holland was averted only by opening the dikes and flooding the country the dutch blamed jan de witt and his brother cornelius for the success of the french armies they were torn to pieces by a mob on the streets of the hague and william of orange was placed at the head of the state this prince afterwards became king of england through his marriage with the daughter of james the second during the eighteenth century the power of the netherlands gradually declined long years of peace and prosperity sapped the energy of the people change and development were hindered by a particularly clumsy form of government and by the close of the century the prosperity of the once powerful republic had almost vanished end of section sixty three this recording is in the public domain section sixty four of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume seven germany the netherlands and switzerland edited by eva march tappan section sixty four how a mud hole became a garden by william elliot griffiths in both the burgundian and the spanish eras the netherlands formed the richest part of the domains of their rulers yet there were no mines gems or pearls in the low countries whence then came the wealth beauty comforts and rich revenues let us see among the crusaders were men of taste who loved beauty and were charmed with the lovely things they saw in the east these lovers of the beautiful brought back seeds either in their brains in wallace or in ship's holds especially was this true as to flowers and fruits a taste for gardening was stimulated among the netherlanders and their part of the earth received a new embroidery of rich natural colours brilliant blooms foliage and perfumes never before seen or enjoyed in europe became common after the fall of constantinople in fourteen fifty three holland grew to be one of the gayest garden lands of europe the ranunculus or little frog family of plants the anemones tulips hyacinths narcissus and others were acclimated domesticated and became the dutchman's darlings especially did the bulbous flowers of the east like the tulips find a congenial soil in holland indeed the tulip not only drove the serious dutchman mad but in the sixteenth century all the world went wild over the bulbs of the harlem even to-day the polders or drained lands left by the pumped-out lake of harlem is the best for bulbs of any land in the world whereas in other parts of the netherlands farms do not usually pay over four per cent on the money invested the harlem bulb lands yield a revenue of twelve per cent per annum new varieties of these brilliant exotics are continually developed one of the latest named the abraham lincoln is the direct descendant of an asiatic ancestor brought westward three centuries ago in the sixteenth century obel the botanist of king james i of england published a book on the history of plants in it he declared that holland contained more rare plants than any other country in europe thirty-eight varieties of the anemone or wind flower dutch pasque bloemen or easter bloom were known dutch captains making voyages to tropical countries were ordered to bring home seeds bulbs roots and cuttings from their settlements in brazil the hudson river region south africa the spice islands formosa japan and asiatic lands many new plants were introduced first into holland 
and then into all the gardens of the western world hundreds of our common flowers trees or vegetables were once oriental exotics which the dutch chaperoned and brought out into occidental garden society leyden was one of the first cities in europe to establish botanical gardens and harlem early led in the florida culture and horticulture leyden for over a century under the renowned burhava was the floral capital of europe here first were domesticated buried children of the geranium family and the phosoidii with their fleshy leaves and showy flowers and other exotics from near the cape of good hope amsterdam's was the first garden in europe to have the coffee tree groningen and utrecht had great hothouses nordwick was famous for its roses this taste for flowers introduced at the time of the crusades made the dutch a nation of flower lovers skilled gardeners and inventive farmers window gardening was especially cultivated until to-day it is a national passion and habit on the canal boat in the floating homes on the inland rivers the farmhouse the humble village and the great city flowers are everywhere the dutch have always been famous for quick brains and active mental initiative when their own climate did not agree with an exotic they made a new climate that did they invented or greatly improved the green or hot house they first made use of forcing pits or beds sided or covered with boards or roofed with glass by which young plants were early raised from seed and kept from frost and cold until ready for transplanting no fewer than six thousand exotic plants were catalogued at leyden during the time of dr borhava who by his books or lectures trained most of the famous doctors of old and new england and of colonial new york this renowned physician taught the hothouse men of europe to adjust the slope of the glass according to the latitude so as to get the maximum power of the sun's rays one great florist in harlem had four greenhouses in which he kept the climates of the levant africa india and america from holland the science of botany was carried to sweden it was at the dutch university of harderwick that linnaeus obtained his degree and in holland he wrote the books on which his fame rests the plough in its modern form consisting of several distinct parts is a dutch invention at the government agricultural school at wageningen one may see the models of several eras showing its steady evolution into the wonderful tool of our day englishman and yankee have made many improvements but for some generations the dutch plough led the world not a few of the more important modern agricultural implements were invented by dutchmen as their names in old english works on husbandry clearly prove about the time of the truce with spain from sixteen o nine to sixteen twenty the hollanders began to drive a good trade in seeds bulbs and flowers later they supplied most of the courts of europe with early fruits they added greatly to the daily diet of civilized people they introduced garden vegetables and the artificial grasses into england they taught the eastern country folks how to drain their fens and raise two crops a year on the same field by the dutchman's aid the marshy land which raised sedge and malaria and compelled two rabbits to fight for one blade of grass became rich in turnips mutton and human beings quickly doubling in population and value most of the early english books on agriculture are by authors with dutch names or with the names more or less anglicized the dutchman's country being far north of the wine and oil line of europe and within the beer and butter line he gave early attention to dairy and hop field and all the products of the cow milk cream butter cheese meat hides and horns the dutchman led europe he did this because he studied soil and foods most carefully and treated his dumb cattle as if they were his friends to-day the traveller entering holland in chile may notices cows and sheep blanketed while in the pastures in friesland he sees that the fine breeds of cattle are housed under the same roof though not in the same room with their masters the dwelling and the stable are near to each other entertainment for man and beast being scrupulously clean and the latter within easy help of the former so much attention was paid to the hens which in old english as in dutch meant both sexes and to eggs and to butter making that the duke of alva imagined that the dutch would not fight for as he thought they were only men of butter beer or milk was the everyday drink in those early days when modern hot drinks tea and coffee were not known the beer mug stood on the table by the plate of every child as well as adult the dutchman first made use of hops to improve the quality of beer 
it was a great day when hops were introduced into england from the netherlands and the event was celebrated in street songs the pilgrims in the mayflower were teetotalers of necessity during their famous voyage for all their beer as well as most of their butter had been sold off to pay their debts to their harsh english creditors in america until after the revolution the new englanders could never raise crops or stock like their neighbors west of the hudson the best farmers and gardeners as well as stock raisers were the new netherlanders or their descendants in new york new jersey pennsylvania and delaware in a word that great movement of european humanity called the crusades and in which the dutch took a share was a powerful factor in their development being bright in mind quick in observation and active in brain the dutchman learned much and improved upon what he imported the festivals in honor of the foundation of the christian church in a village celebrated yearly were called kirkmas or kermis on these gay and joyful occasions the dutch cooks exercised all their ingenuity and many were the novelties to tempt the palate buckwheat for example had been used for ages in asia where in the form of mush porridge or steamed dough it was eaten by the peoples from india to japan the dutch named it beckwheat from which our english word buckwheat has been corrupted because it looks like the beech mast after many an experiment in dutch kitchens the luscious winter breakfast luxury which with butter and maple syrup delights so many americans was evolved one of the direct results of commerce stimulated by the crusades was the gingerbread thick spicy and aromatic cake was sold in the netherlands as early as the twelfth century gilded painted whitened with egg and cut into all sorts of comical shapes it was sold by tons at the fair and kermis our words cookie and cruller like the honey cakes of deventer muffins and waffles are of dutch origin the poffer cheese and other products of the batter dish and oven or toasting irons which were first made popular at the dutch kermis were imported into other countries with new names oriental fruits and nuts now called by the word wall or foreign as in walnut walloon wales wallabout bay etc were like hops borrowed by english-speaking folks from their more advanced and more highly civilized dutch neighbors who vastly improved table resources the dutch oven made life for the early new englanders very agreeable next to good food is good clothing more important in its influence on industry was the introduction of flax this native of egypt found a most congenial home in the netherlands it was patiently studied by men of science and cultivated with infinite care by the farmers with their eyes to its improvement in the quality of the fibre they were so far successful that flemish and dutch flax soon had a name all over europe in india as in america the plant had been cultivated for its seed in order to get oil rather than for its fibre out of which is made linen the dutch from the first paid attention to the development of the stalks and aimed to secure abundant and delicate floss linen manufactories were established and around these a score of trades sprang up spinners and spinsters webbers and websters dyers and bleachers burlers hatchelers and lace-makers are some of the english names for these in this new group of industries like a white rose in a bouquet which lights up the whole composition appeared one that deserves the name of a fine art rich and delicate as are the fabrics of the east lace is european the nuns invented needle sculpture or lace the stimulus to produce fine yarn for the lace-makers became so great that the flax produce of the southern netherlands was developed until it was without a rival in some instances the crop was so precious that in one year it exceeded the value of the ground on which it grew the cultivation of the new oriental flowers afforded novel patterns for the lace-makers while the cathedral builders and abbey masons made the stone blossom under the chisel and reared spires and tracery that were like the gossamer of spiders the nuns wrought with the needle and produced the loveliest works of art in lace these women of taste and skill did not merely copy flowers and spider webs but wrought out new forms and most tasteful combinations the art which probably arose in italy was quickly transferred to the netherlands the oldest form of this art industry is seen in point lace in which fairy like webs are woven by the needle over foundation pieces of linen exactly how this old point lace was made is not certainly known for the special art was lost in the sixteenth century yet the durability of the work is seen in the fact that many pieces of true point lace yet remain in europe the later kinds though still very expensive are less artistic in the first or inventive period the designer and the worker were one but later the worker was usually a copyist 
after the needle wrought lace came the pillow work or bobbin lace and last of all in our day the machine made lace when all classes can wear it because all purses can afford to buy it in italy and netherlands the two countries in which painting and flowers were most cultivated lace-making reached its acme of proficiency where the canvas first bloomed with colours laid on in oil there the parterres and the flax fields were richest and lace most lovely the dutch invented the thimble thus reinforcing the application of the needle and of linen to a thousand needs of life the names we still use for the various fabrics and patterns cambric from cambrai diaper from dapre and various places in the netherlands show their geographical origin the inventions of the shirt night-dress bed tick pocket handkerchief tablecloth napkin most of them in the thirteenth century and of netherlandish origin are landmarks in the history of european civilization the use and application of starch also a dutch invention was introduced in england in the time of queen elizabeth but dutch weavers had been brought over as early as twelve fifty three most of the old names of woollen hempen flaxen and cotton goods come from the low countries even our word tick in bed tick is only a mispronunciation of the dutch decken to cover it was a decided advance in household economy in cleanliness and in hygiene when the bed was lifted up from the floor and made snowy with linen and glorious with a canopy in the evolution of the modern bed no people have contributed more than the sedentary and home-loving dutch in the land where art first glorified domestic life they studied health cleanliness and comfort until a love for these became a passion at first linen sheets pillow and bolster cases pocket handkerchiefs and shirts were luxuries and only for kings and nobles even then the inventory or washing list of a queen or emperor in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries would have made a chinese laundryman laugh because of its scantiness instead of being fine and snow-white the first shirt was probably rough and dark-coloured the problem was to make linen white the dutch raised bleaching to the dignity of a fine art they persevered until the name hollands all over europe meant finest linen white as snow eight months were required to secure the purest white the tedious process consisted in spreading out the web or sheets of linen on the grass or bleaching ground and wetting it several times a day the grounds around harlem were especially fitted for this process they often looked as if a snowstorm had whitened the earth the old paintings show how much land was thus occupied some virtue in the water probably its power in connection with the sea air of liberating ozone in addition to the energy of the sun's rays was supposed to hold the secret of success much linen woven in great britain was sent to the netherlands to be blanched when sold at home it was marked finest hollands it was not until seventeen eighty five when a french chemist discovered chlorine and the virtues of bleaching powder that the time and space required in the old process were saved and the dutch fields became green again the old dutch family names of bleeker mangler and all the varieties of de witt de witte de witt etc like the english dwight walker webster etc are monuments of the long bygone days when the trades of the bleacher the smoother and the whitener flourished the latter tell of those occupations from which our english fathers so generally received their names while the dutch on the contrary took theirs largely from places landmarks and natural objects in the scenery it was not until the fifteenth century that family names were in use in northern europe End of section sixty four this recording is in the public domain Section 65 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7 Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 65. When the Pilgrim Fathers went to Holland. 1608. By William Bradford. In 1608, the Separatists, or Pilgrims, as they were afterwards called, a branch of the larger body of Puritans, left England on account of the intolerance with which they were treated, 
and settled at Leyden, to the number of one thousand or more, under their minister, John Robinson. William Bradford, author of the history from which the following selection is taken, was a prominent member of the party, and later, when the pilgrims were settled in the New World, served as governor of the colony. The editor. Being thus constrained to leave their native soil and country, their lands and livings, and all their friends and familiar acquaintance, it was much, and fought marvellously by many. But to go into a country they knew not, but by hearsay, where they must learn a new language, and get their livings they knew not how, it being a dear place, and subject to the miseries of war, it was by many fought an adventure almost desperate, a case intolerable, and a misery worse than death, especially seeing they were not acquainted with trades nor traffic by which that country doth subsist, but had only been used to a plain country life, an innocent trade of husbandry. But these things did not dismay them, though they did sometimes trouble them, for their desires were set on the ways of God and to enjoy his ordinances, but they rested on his providence and knew whom they had believed. Yet this was not all, for though they could not stay, yet were they not suffered to go, but the ports and heavens were shut against them, so as they were fain to seek secret means of conveyance and to bribe and thee the mariners, and give extraordinary rates for their passages. And yet were they oftentimes betrayed, many of them, and both they and their goods intercepted and surprised, and thereby put to great trouble and charge, of which I'll give an instance or two, and omit the rest. There was a large company of them purposed to get passage at Boston in Lincolnshire, and for that end had hired a ship wholly to themselves, and made agreement with the master to be ready at a certain day, and take them and their goods in at a convenient place, where they accordingly would all attend in readiness. So, after long waiting and large expenses, though he kept not day with them, yet he came at length and took them in in the night. But when he had them and their goods aboard, he betrayed them, having before hind complotted with the searchers and other officers so to do, who took them and put them into open boats, and there rifled and ransacked them, searching them to their shirts for money. Yea, even the women further them became modesty, and then carried them back into the town, and made them a spectacle and a wonder to the multitude which came flocking on all sides to behold them. Being thus first by the couch-pole officers rifled, and stripped of their money, books, and much other goods, they were presented to the magistrates, and messengers sent to inform the lords of the council of them, and so they were committed to ward. Indeed, the magistrates used them courteously, and showed them what favour they could, but could not deliver them till order came from the council table but the issue was that after a month's imprisonment the greater part were dismissed and sent to the places in which they came. The seven of the principal were still kept in prison and bound over to the Azizis. The next spring after there was another attempt made by some of these and others to get over at another place, and it so fell out that they light of a Dutchman at Hull, having a ship of his own belonging to Zealand, they made an agreement with him and acquainted him with their condition, hoping to find more faithfulness in him than in the former of their own nation. He bade them not fear, for he would do well enough. He was by appointment to take them in between Grimsby and Hull, where was a large common a good way distant from any town. Now against the prefect's time, the women and children with the goods were sent to the place in a small bark, which they had hired for that end, and the men were to meet them by land. But it so fell out that they were there a day before the ship came, and the sea being rough, and the women very sick, 
failed of the seamen to put it into a creek hard by, where they lay on ground at low water. Next morning the ship came, but they were fast and could not stir till about noon. In the meantime, the shipmaster, perceiving how the matter was, sent his boat to be getting the men aboard, whom he saw ready walking about the shore. But after the first boatful was got aboard, and she was ready to go for more, the master espied a great company, both horse and foot, with bills and guns and other weapons, for the country was raised to take them. The Dutchman, seeing it, swore his country's oath, sacrament, and having the wind fair, weighed his anchor, hoisted sail and away. But the poor men which were got aboard were in great distress with their wives and children, which they saw thus to be taken, and were left destitute of their helps, and themselves also, not having a cloth to shift them with more than they had on their backs, and some scarce a penny about them, all they had being on board the bark. It drew tears from their eyes, and anything they had they would have given to be in the shore again, but all in vain. There was no remedy, they must thus sadly part, and afterward endured a fearful storm at sea, being fourteen days or more before they arrived at their port, in seven whereof they neither saw sun, moon, nor stars, and were driven near the coast of Norway, the mariners themselves often despairing of life, and once with shrieks and cries gave over all as if the ship had been founded in the sea, and they sinking without recovery. But when man's hope and help wholly failed, the Lord's power and mercy appeared in their recovery, for the ship rose again and gave the mariners courage again to manage her. And if modesty would suffer me, I might declare with what fervent prayers they cried unto the Lord in this great distress, especially some of them, even without any great distraction, when the water ran into their mouths and ears, and the mariners cried out, We sink, we sink, they cried, if not with miraculous, yet with a great height of degree of divine faith. Yet, Lord, thou canst save, yet, Lord, thou canst save, with such other expressions as I will forbear. Upon which the ship did not only recover, but shortly after the violence of the storm began to abate, and the Lord filled their afflicted minds with such comforts as every one cannot understand, and in the end brought them to their desired haven, where the people came flocking, admiring their deliverance, the storm having been so long in sore, in which much hurt had been done, as the master's friends related unto him in their congratulations. But to return to the others where he left, the rest of the men that were in greatest danger made shift to escape away before the troops could surprise them, those only staying that best might be assistant unto the women. But pitiful it was to see the heavy case of these poor women in their distress, what weeping and crying on every side, some for their husbands that were carried away in the ship as it is before related, others not knowing what should become of them and their little ones. Others, again, melted in tears, seeing their poor little ones hanging about them, crying for fear and quaking with cold. Being thus apprehended, they were hurried from one place to another, and from one justice to another, till in the end they knew not what to do with them. For to imprison so many innocent women and children for no other cause, many of them, but that they must go with their husbands, seemed to be unreasonable, and all would cry out of them, and send to send them home again was as difficult, for they alleged, as the truth was, that they had no homes to go to, for they had either sold or otherwise disposed of their homes and living. To be short, after they had been thus turmoiled a good while, and conveyed from one constable to another, they were glad to be rid of them in the end upon any terms, for all were wearied and tired with them, though in the meantime they, poor souls, endured misery enough, and thus in the end necessity forced a way for them. But, that I be not tedious in these things, I will omit the rest, 
though I might relate many other notable passages and troubles which they endured and underwent in these their wanderings and travels, both for land and sea, but I haste to other things. Yet I may not omit the fruit that came hereby, for by these so public troubles, in so many eminent places, their cause became famous and occasioned many to look into the same, and their godly carriage and Christian behaviour was such as left a deep impression in the minds of many. And though some few shrank at these first conflicts and sharp beginnings, as it was no marvel, yet many more came on with fresh courage and greatly animated others. And in the end, notwithstanding all these storms of opposition, they all got over at length, some at one time and some at another, and some in one place and some in another, and met together again according to their desires with no small rejoicing. Being now come into the low countries, they saw many goodly and fortified cities, strongly walled and guarded with troops of armed men. Also they heard a strange and uncouth language, and beheld the different manners and customs of the people with their strange fashions and attires, all so far differing from that of their plain country villages, wherein they were bred and had so long lived, as it seemed they were come into a new world. But these were not the things they much looked on, or long took up their thoughts, for they had other work in hand, and another kind of war to wage and maintain. For though they saw fair and beautiful cities, flowing with abundance of all sorts of wealth and riches, yet it was not long before they saw the grim and grisly face of poverty coming upon them like an armed man, with whom they must buckle and encounter, and from whom they could not fly, but they were armed with faith and patience against him and all his encounters, and though they were sometimes foiled, yet by God's assistance they prevailed and got the victory. Now when Mr. Robinson, Mr. Brewster and other principal members were come over, for they were of the last, and stayed to help the weakest over before them, such things were fought on as were necessary for their settling and best ordering of the church affairs. And when they had lived at Amsterdam about a year, Mr. Robinson, their pastor, and some others of best discernment, seeing how Mr. John Smith and his company was already fallen into contention with the church that was there before them, and no means they could use would do any good to cure the same, and also that the flames of contention were like to break out in the ancient church itself, as afterwards lamentably came to pass, which things they prudently foreseen thought it was best to remove before they were any way engaged with the same, for they well knew it would be much to the prejudice of their outward states, both at present and in likelihood in the future, as indeed it proved to be. For these and some other reasons they removed to Leyden, a fair and beautiful city, and of a sweet situation, but made more famous by the university wherewith it is adorned, in which of late had been so many learned men. But wanting that traffic by sea which Amsterdam enjoys, it was not as beneficial for their outward means of living and estates. But being now here pitched, they fell to such trades and employments as they best could, valuing peace and their spiritual comfort above any other riches whatsoever. And at length they came to raise a competent and comfortable living, but with hard and continual labour. Being thus settled, after many difficulties, they continued many years in a comfortable condition, enjoying much sweet and delightful society and spiritual comfort together in the ways of God, under the able ministry and prudent government of Mr. John Robinson and Mr. William Brewster, who was an assistant unto him in the place of an elder, on to which he was now called and chosen by the church. So as they grew in knowledge and other gifts and graces of the Spirit of God, and lived together in peace and love and holiness, and many came to them from diverse parts of England, so as they grew, 
a great congregation. End of section 65. This recording is in the public domain. Section 66 of Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone The Surrender of Breda by Diego Rodriguez de Silva Belasquez Spanish Painter, 1599-1660 to Painting, page 368 in 1621, after a truce of twelve years, brave little Holland still refused to yield to Spain, and the war was renewed. Four years later, the Spanish general Spinola brought about the surrender of Breda. This town had been taken in 1590 by the stratagem of the turf boat, and now, in 1625, was forced to surrender to Spain. The illustration is a reproduction of one of the most famous of historical paintings. It is often called the Lances because of the wilderness of Lances at the right. It pictures the moment when the Dutch commander is presenting Spinola with the keys of the surrendered city. He bows submissively before the victorious foe, but Spinola, instead of grasping the keys, lays his hand in friendly wise upon the shoulder of his brave opponent. The figures in the picture are not at all numerous, but yet the idea of a large number of people is given by the masses of troops indicated in the middle distance. Behind Spinola are the Spanish troops with their lances. The background is a wide stretch of flat country bounded by the distant ocean. Here and there are fortifications. Near the head of the Spanish general's horse stands a man wearing a plumed hat. This represents the artist himself. End of section 66. This recording is in the public domain. Section 67 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The World's Story, Volume 7. Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappen. Section 67. The Escape of Hugo de Groot, 1621, by Frederick Spencer Bird. One of the greatest names in Holland, in connection with the literature of his time, is that of Hugo de Groot, or Grotius, as he is commonly called. When a mere youth, he is said to have successfully maintained theses in philosophy, mathematics, and jurisprudence. He has left behind him several volumes of Latin poems, theological works, and a standard treatise on international law called De Jure Belli et Pacis. The story of his escape from the castle of Louvestein, where he was sentenced to be imprisoned for life for the part he took in the political and theological disputes which agitated his native country, is well worth recording insofar that his devoted wife devised and helped to carry out the plan for regaining his freedom, the anecdote reminds one of the Earl of Nettsdale's escape from the Tower of London in 1715, which was effected by the aid of his countess. A Dutch Life of Grotius gives the full particular, from which I have selected the following. The castle of Louvestein is situated on the west side of the island of Bommel, where the waters of the rivers Val and Maas unite. Both nature and art have combined to render it a place of great strength, as may be seen by its position, and the thick high walls and double moats by which it is surrounded. 
fortunately for de groot his wife had obtained permission to share his confinement with him though under certain restrictions as to quitting and returning to the castle de groot entertained no hopes of being released and amid so many doors locks warders walls and moats saw no means of escape but his wife who had exhausted all legitimate efforts at her command to obtain his freedom and soften the hearts of his enemies at last hit on a plan which though fraught with great danger of detection was destined to be completely successful books were the chief solace of de groot in his captivity and a certain professor erpenius was in the habit of occasionally sending a chest containing volumes such as the prisoner liked best to the house of his brother-in-law one datselaar living at horken whence it was forwarded to de groot at Lüvestein. this chest was allowed to be carried to and from the castle as often as it was desired that the book should be exchanged the commander of the fortress at first gave orders that the contents of the chest should be examined each time it passed in or out but nothing having occurred to excite suspicion that any regulations were being infringed the order was not regularly carried out and the chest was frequently allowed to pass without being opened this did not escape the notice of madame de groot who immediately devised a plan for releasing her husband by conveying him as books from the castle trusting that providence would aid the attempt and that the relaxed vigilance of the warders might afford the much longed-for opportunity for effecting the groot's deliverance she at once communicated her plan to her husband who after some reflection expressed his willingness to risk the attempt and they lost no time in making an examination of the chest at first sight it seemed neither long nor deep enough to hold a man of the groot's size but on making a trial he found he could just lie in it in a cramped position by drawing up his legs and placing his arms straight by his sides he then tried to discover how long it would be possible for him to remain inside with the lid closed and whether he would have difficulty in obtaining the necessary supply of air to enable him to breathe freely to test this he lay shut up in the chest until the sand in the hourglass had run down twice then the experiment was deemed satisfactory and all fears of his being suffocated were removed matters being so far arranged it was decided that madame de groot should take into her confidence the wife of datselaar to whose house the chest would have to be conveyed this she took the first opportunity of doing and the result was favourable to their plan she then obtained leave as usual from the governor of the castle to send away on a certain day a chest of books which she stated her husband desired to exchange for others and now all that remained to be done was to obtain the cooperation of their faithful maid-servant elsje van houwening a girl of twenty who had been allowed to attend her mistress in the fortress they had every confidence in elsje's prudence and fidelity and therefore did not hesitate to communicate their secret to her she was asked whether she would accompany the chest and endeavour to have it safely conveyed to the house of datselaar at horken and she at once expressed her willingness to undertake the responsible and dangerous duty all preparations were quickly made and at length the eventful day arrived when he rose in the morning de groot prayed earnestly that god would permit the undertaking to be successful and having breakfasted and embraced his wife he got into the chest he was but scantily clad and there was so little space that his shoes had to be left out under his head to serve as a cushion the new testament was placed and other books were so packed about him as to prevent the possibility of his rolling about when the chest was moved madame de groot again took an affectionate leave of her husband and who shall say what were the feelings of that devoted woman as she took a parting glance at his face and shut down the lid hiding her emotion as well as she could 
she locked the chest and gave the key to her maid, who stood ready to start on her anxious journey. Madame de Grote then retired to bed and drew the curtains around her, having previously placed her husband's clothes on a chair close by, so that the warder, on entering, might suppose de Grote to be with her and asleep. A male attendant, who had been deputed to wait on de Grote, was then summoned, and on entering he asked what was wanted. "'I had thought to go myself to Horken, said Madame de Grote from behind the bed-curtains. "'But not feeling well, and the weather being so unsettled, I have decided to send Elsia instead. She will take the chest with her. Call a soldier to help to remove it.' The man retired, and shortly afterwards a warder and some soldiers entered. They saw de Groot's clothing on the chair near the bed, and having no suspicions concerning the safety of the prisoner, two or three of them took hold of the chest to carry it away. The task, however, was not so easy as was expected, and one soldier was heard to say to the others, "'What makes the chest so heavy? Is the Arminian,' meaning de Groot, inside thereupon madame de grote called out there are arminian books inside the soldiers then appeared to examine the chest as if to see whether any holes had been bored in it to admit air and having apparently satisfied themselves that all was right they again applied themselves to removing it half dragging and half lifting it they contrived to get it down the long staircase and through thirteen doors which one after the other had to be unbarred and unlocked to allow them to pass with their burden while the soldiers were resting one again said to another i am sure the arminian must be inside on which the wife of one of the men being present remarked i know that some years ago a bergverkoper traitor was carried out of the town in a box so the arminian can very well be inside a soldier then replied that if he thought the groot was concealed in the chest he would get a gimlet and bore him through the body elsje von Hauening, who had hitherto kept silent then quickly said in a tone of affected gaiety to do that you must get a boar that will reach from here to his chamber while this brief conversation was taking place, the wife of the governor, who was absent from the castle, made her appearance, and inquired what was the matter. The men remarked that the chest was unusually heavy, and asked her whether they should open it to see what was inside. She inquired whether her husband was generally in the habit of having it opened before it was taken away. The men answered that it had not been his practice to do so for a very long time. Then said the governor's wife, who evidently did not wish to appear more particular than her husband, Madame de Groot tells me it only contains Arminian books. Take the chest as it is to the ship. The order was obeyed, and the box was then carried down to the water's edge, where a small Dutch vessel lay moored. The skipper, Jan Wouterson was present, and he placed a plank to facilitate the conveyance of the chest on board. But the faithful Elsje, perceiving that the wood was thin, and fearing that her master's weight might cause it to break, exclaimed, What is this? Do you intend to use this thin plank to get the box on board? It may break and let it fall into the water, then all will be spoiled. The chest is full of valuable books which have been lent and must be taken great care of. Put a thick plank over the other. The skipper complied with her request, and to her great relief the chest at last was deposited safely on board. As a preconcerted signal between the maid and her mistress, who was anxiously watching from a window of the castle, the former threw her handkerchief over her head and waved it once or twice to show that all went well a sailor observing this inquired why she did it she readily replied that some one had dared her to venture on the water in such rough weather the wind being very high at the time 
and it was a signal that she was going. The chest had been placed on deck, but was left unsecured, and with perhaps an excess of caution, Elsia said to the skipper, "'Make this chest fast. It might fall overboard, in which case the books would not only be spoiled, but lost.' during the progress of the voyage the girl was again made anxious by seeing some men sitting on the box thus pressing down the lid and as she feared depriving its occupant of air they were also kicking it with their heels a proceeding that must have been anything but agreeable to the groot she begged them to seat themselves elsewhere declaring that besides books the chest contained china that would easily break at last the ship arrived safely at horkum when she was moored the skipper began to discharge the cargo and other goods were landed before the chest which might have remained on board a considerable time had not elsia persuaded the master to have it speedily removed a barrel was obtained and assisted by his son the skipper placed the chest on it they were wheeling it away when the former exclaimed father there was something alive inside this chest on which the skipper turning towards elsia who pretended not to have overheard the remark said do you hear what my son says he says there is something alive in the chest yes replied elsia in as careless a tone as she could assume books have life the matter then dropped and at length the chest with its precious contents was deposited at the house of datselaar where it was taken in as privately as possible by the back entrance the carriers having been paid and dismissed elsia went in search of the occupants of the house she found Dasselaar and his wife, with some other persons, in a front room, busily engaged in packing some goods. Going up to the woman, she whispered softly in her ear, "'I have my master here behind in a chest. You must see how you can get him away.' For a moment Frau Dasselaar looked both astonished and agitated on hearing the news, and her face became white as a sheet she however soon recovered her presence of mind and followed elsia into the room where the chest had been deposited before unlocking it the maid knelt down and in a loud whisper called master master several times but there being no reply she looked around sorrowfully to her companion and exclaimed alas my master is dead the other woman replied your mistress has done a clever thing formerly she had a live husband now she has but a dead one hearing their conversation the groot now tapped the lid of the chest with his hand and called out no i am not dead i did not know the voice the chest was then at once opened the groot had lain inside for about two hours and he came out of it looking like a corpse restored to life he was then asked to go upstairs and he ascended followed by vrouw datselaar and the girl observing the agitated manner and pale face of the former the groot asked her if she always looked so white no sir she replied but i am frightened to see you here you are no ordinary person the whole world knows you I am afraid of getting into trouble and that my husband will be arrested and set in your place the groot answered i have prayed so much to god who has thus far been with me and i have so heartily thanked him for permitting me to escape that if it be his will i am ready to return to my chest and be again conveyed back to prison the woman now more at her ease replied no we have you here now and whatever comes of it we will help you seeing that he could hardly stand she gave him a glass of spanish wine which appeared to revive him he then asked to speak with her husband she went to fetch him but on her telling him of the matter he replied in a fright i must know nothing of it i must neither see nor speak with mijnheer de groot 
or I shall be implicated. She then ran to the house of her brother-in-law, who, being let into the secret, obtained a suit of clothes from a labourer, in which the Groot disguised himself, and with the assistance of his kind friends, finally escaped to Antwerp, where he found refuge in the house of a clergyman named Nicolas Grevinkhoven, who had previously lived in Rotterdam. Madame de Groot, after some time, was permitted to join her husband, and the noble devotion of herself and of her trusty maid, Elsie van Houwening, will long live to be recorded in the annals of the Netherlands. End of section 67. This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 68. The Return of Spinoza, about 1653, by Israel Zangbill spinoza was a jewish philosopher of dutch birth his lack of faith in judaism led to his withdrawal from the synagogue the rabbis brought about his nominal banishment from amsterdam nevertheless he remained there for several years though in constant danger supporting himself by grinding glasses for telescopes the editor on his homeward way dark looks still met him but he faced them with cheerful candid gaze at the end of the narrow spuistrat the affairs of the broad market-place engrossed popular attention and the philosopher threaded his way unregarded among the stalls and the canvas-covered zealand wagons and it was not till he reached the pavel yern where he now sits securely in stone pencilling a thought as enduring that he encountered fresh difficulty there at his own street door under the trees lining the canal bank his landlord van der spick the painter usually a phlegmatic figure haloed in pipe clouds congratulated him excitedly on his safe return but refused him entry to the house here thou canst lodge no more here i lodge to-night said spinoza quietly if there be any law in holland law the folk will take the law into their own hands my windows will be broken my doors battered in and thou wilt be murdered and thrown into the canal his lodger laughed and wherefore an honest optician murdered go to good friend if thou hadst but stayed at home polishing thy spy-glasses instead of faring to utrecht customarily thou art so cloistered in that the good wife declares thou forgettest to eat for three days together and certes there is little thou canst eat when thou goest not abroad to buy provision what devil must drive thee on a long journey in this hour of heat and ferment not that i believe a word of thy turning traitor i'd sooner believe my maul stick could turn serpent like aaron's rod but in my house thou shalt not be murdered reassure thyself the whole town knows my business with stoop at least i told my bookseller and tis only a matter of hours truly he is a lively gossip ay said spinoza dryly he was even aware that a letter from the royal society of england awaits me van der spick reddened i have not opened it he cried hastily naturally but the door thou mayest open the painter hesitated they will drag thee forth as they drag the de witts from the prison spinoza smiled sadly and on that occasion thou wouldst not let me out now thou wilt not let me in both proofs that i have more regard for thee than thou for thyself if i had let thee dash out to fix up on the public wall that denunciation thou hadst written of the barbarian mob there had been no life of thine to risk to-day fly the town i beseech thee or find thicker walls than mine thou knowest i would shelter thee had i the power do not our other lodgers turn to thee 
in sickness and sorrow to be soothed by thy talk do not our own little ones love and obey thee more than their mother and me but if thou were murdered in our house how dreadful a shock and a memory to us all i know well your love for me said spinoza touched but fear nothing on my account i can easily justify myself there are people enough and of chief men in the country too who well know the motives of my journey but whatever comes of it so soon as the crowd make the least noise at your door i will go out and make straight for them though they should serve me as they have done the unhappy de witts van der spick threw open the door thy word is an oath on the stairs shone the speckless landlady a cheerful creature in black cap and white apron her bodice laced with ornamental green and red ribbons she gave a cry of joy and flew to meet him broom in hand welcome home herr spinoza how glad the little ones will be when they get back from school there's a pack of knaves been slandering thee right and left some of them tried to pump henri but we sent them away with fleas in their ears eh henri henri smiled sheepishly most pertinacious of all was a party of three an old man and his daughter and a young man they came twice very vexed to find thee away and feigning to be old friends of thine from amsterdam at least not the young man his lament was to miss the celebrated scholar he had been taken to see a bushel of questions they asked but not many pecks did they get out of me a flush had mantled upon spinoza's olive cheek did they give any name he asked with unusual eagerness it ends in and that stuck in my memory van den enda or such like the daughter was beautiful a goddess put in the painter huh said the vrouw give me the young man a cold marble creature is not my idea of a goddess tis a greek goddess said spinoza with laboured lightness they are indeed old friends of mine saving the young man who is doubtless a pupil of the old he is a very learned philologist this dr van den enda he taught me latin and greek goddesses flashed the vrouw affectionately spinoza tried to say something but fell a coughing instead and began to ascend to his room he was agitated and it was his principle to quit society whenever his emotions threatened to exceed philosophical moderation wait i have thy key cried the good wife pursuing him and oh what dust in thy room no wonder thou art troubled with the phthisis thou didst not arrange anything he cried in alarm a flick with a feather brush as i took in thy letters no more my hand itched to be at thy papers but see not one is in order she unlocked his door revealing a little room in which books and papers mingled oddly with the bedroom furniture and the tools and bench of his craft there were two windows with shabby red curtains on nails hung a few odd garments one of which the doublet anciently pierced by the fanatic's dagger merely served as a memento though not visibly older than the rest of his wardrobe who puts a mediocre article into a costly envelope was the philosopher's sartorial standpoint over the mantel on which among some old pipes lay two silver buckles his only jewellery was pinned a charcoal sketch of massaniello in shirt-sleeves with a net on his shoulder done by spinoza himself and obviously with his own features as model perhaps in some whimsical moment when he figured himself as an intellectual revolutionary a portfolio that leaned against a microscope contained black and white studies of some of his illustrious visitors which caught happily their essential features without detail the few other wall pictures were engravings by other hands spinoza sat down on his truckle bed with a great sigh of content desideratoque acquiescimus lecto footnote i rest upon the couch for which i have longed in the footnote he murmured then his eye roving around my spider's webs are gone he groaned i could not disarrange aught in sweeping them away deprecated the good wife thou hast disarranged me i have learnt all my wisdom from watching spiders he said smiling nay thou jestest 
in no wise the spider and the fly the whole of life is there tis through leaving them out that the theologies are so empty besides who will now catch the flies for my microscope i will not believe thou wouldst have the poor little flies caught by the great big spiders never did i understand what pastor cordis prated of turning the other cheek till i met thee nay tis not my doctrine mine is the worship of joy i hold that the effort to preserve our being is virtue but thou goest to church sometimes to hear a preacher a strange motive she added musingly christianity is not then true not true for me then if thou canst not believe in it i will not spinoza smiled tenderly be guided by dr cordis not by me the good wife was puzzled dost thou then think i can be saved in dr cordis doctrine she asked anxiously yes tis a very good doctrine the lutheran doubt not thou wilt be saved in it provided thou livest at peace with thy neighbours her face brightened then i will be guided by thee end of section sixty eight Section 69 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 69, The Rival Tulip Growers. 1672. By Alexandre Dumont. The famous tulip mania began in France in 1635, but raged more violently in the Netherlands. The usually staid and sensible Dutchman forgot everything but buying and selling tulip bulbs. The prices given for some of these were most absurd, as high as 5200 being paid for one bulb. At the height of the excitement shares were issued, and speculated in, for a single rare specimen even before the bulb existed. At length, the craze for speculation reached such a degree that a proclamation was issued by the government declaring all contracts concerning tulips to be invalid, and the frenzy came to an end, but not until the wealth of many families had been swept away. The Editor Just then the Tulip Society of Harlem offered a prize for the production of the large black tulip without a spot of color, a thing which had not yet been accomplished, and was considered impossible as at that time there did not exist a flower of that species approaching even to dark nut brown. It was, therefore, generally said that the founders of the prize might just as well have offered two millions as a hundred thousand guilders, since no one would be able to gain it. Footnote. In former times the value of the guilder varied according to the period and the place of issue. At present a guilder is worth forty-point-two cents. End of footnote. The tulip-growing world, however, was thrown by it into a state of most active commotion. Some fanciers caught at the idea without believing it practicable, but such is the power of imagination among florists that, although considering the undertaking as certain to fail, all their thoughts were engrossed by that grand black tulip, which was looked upon as chimero, as the black swan or the white raven were reputed to be in those days. Van Beryl was one of the tulip-growers who were struck with the idea. Boxtel thought of it in the light of a speculation. Then Beryl, as soon as the idea had once taken root in his clear and ingenious mind, began slowly the necessary sowings and operations to reduce the tulips, which he had grown already, from red to brown, and from brown to dark brown. By the next year he had obtained flowers of a perfect nut brown, and Boxtel espied them in the border, whereas he had himself, as yet, only succeeded in producing the light brown. Boxtel, once more worsted by the superiority of his hated rival, was now completely disgusted with tulip-growing, and, being driven half-mad, devoted himself entirely to observation. The house of his rival was quite open to view, a garden exposed to the sun, cabinets with glass walls, shelves, cupboards, boxes, and ticketed pigeonholes, which could easily be surveyed by the telescope. Boxtel allowed his bulbs to rot in the pits, his ceilings to dry up in their cases, and his tulips to wither in the borders, and henceforth occupied himself with nothing else but the doings at Van Barrel's. But the most curious part of the operations was not performed in the garden. It might be one o'clock in the morning when Van Barrel went up to his laboratory, into the glazed cabinet 
whither Boxtel's telescope had such easy access, and here, as soon as the lamp illuminated the walls and windows, Boxtel saw the inventive genius of his rival at work. He beheld him sifting his seeds, and soaking them in liquids which were destined to modify or to deepen their colors. He knew what Cornelius meant, when, heating certain grains, then moistening them, then combining them with others by a sort of grafting, a minute and marvelously delicate manipulation, he shut up in darkness those which were expected to furnish the black color, exposed to the sun or to the lamp those which were to produce red, and placed between the endless reflection of two water mirrors those intended for white, the pure representation of the limpid element. This innocent magic, the fruit at the same time of childlike musings and of manly genius, this patient, untiring labor, of which Boxtel knew himself to be incapable, made him, not as he was with envy, center all his life, all his thoughts, and all his hopes in his telescope. For strange to say, the love and interest of horticulture had not deadened in Isaac his fierce envy and thirst for revenge. Sometimes, whilst covering Van Burrow with his telescope, he deluded himself into a belief that he was leveling a never-failing musket at him, and then he would seek with his finger for the trigger to fire the shot which was to have killed his neighbor. But it is time that we should connect with this epoch of the operations of the one, and the espionage of the other, the visit which Cornelius de Witt came to pay to his native town. Just at this time Van Burrow receives a visit from his godfather, Cornelius de Witt, brother of the chief magistrate of Holland, who leaves him with a sealed package, the jealous tulip fancier suspects that this contains political papers, and forms a plot to prevent his rival from developing the precious black tulip. De Witt and his brother were accused of attempting the life of William of Orange. They were not pronounced guilty, but, nevertheless, they were torn in pieces by a furious mob. On the 20th of August, 1672, at one o'clock, Cornelius was, therefore, in his dry room, with his feet resting on the footbar of the table, and his elbows on the cover, looking with intense delight on three suckers which he had just detached from a mother bulb, pure, perfect, and entire, and from which was to grow that wonderful product of horticulture, which would render the name of Cornelius Van Barrel forever illustrious. "'I shall find the black tulip,' said Cornelius to himself, while detaching the suckers. "'I shall obtain the hundred thousand guilders offered by the society. I shall distribute them among the poor of Dort.' and thus the hatred which every rich man has to encounter in times of civil wars will be soothed down, and I shall be able, without fearing any harm either from Republicans or Orangists, to keep as heretofore my borders in splendid condition. I need no more be afraid, lest on the day of the riot the shopkeepers of the town and the sailors of the port should come and tear up my bulbs to boil them as onions for the families as they have sometimes quietly threatened when they happen to remember me having paid two or three hundred guilders for one bulb. It is, therefore, settled. I shall give the hundred thousand guilders of the prize Harlem to the poor. And yet, here Cornelia stopped and heaved a sigh. And yet, he continued, it would have been so very delightful to spend the hundred thousand guilders on the enlargement of my tulip bed, or even on a journey to the east the country of beautiful flowers. But alas, these are no thoughts for the present times when muskets, standards, proclamations, and beating of drums are the order of the day. Van Barrow raised his eyes to heaven and sighed again. Then turning his glance toward his bulbs, objects of much greater importance to him than all those muskets, standards, drums, and proclamations which he conceived only to be fit to disturb the minds of honest people, he said, these are indeed beautiful bulbs. How smooth they are, how well formed. There is that air of melancholy about them which promises to produce a flower of the color of ebony. On their skin you cannot even distinguish the circulating veins with the naked eye. Certainly, certainly not a light spot will disfigure the tulip which I have called into existence. And by what name shall we call this offspring of my sleepless nights, of my labor and my thought? Tulipa Negra Barleyanus. Yes, Barleyanus, a fine name. All the tulip fanciers, that is to say, all the intelligent people of Europe, will feel a thrill of excitement when the rumor spreads to the four quarters of the globe. The grand black tulip is found. How is it called? the fanciers will ask. Tulipa Negra Barleyanus. Why, Barleyanus? After its grower, Van Barrel, will be the answer. And who is this Van Berl? 
It is the same who has already produced five new tulips. The Jane, the John de Witt, the Cornelius de Witt, etc. Well, this is what I call my ambition. It will cause tears to no one. And people will still talk of my tulipa nigra balienis, when, perhaps, my godfather, this sublime politician, is only known from the tulip to which I have given his name. Oh, these darling bulbs! When my tulip has flowered, Beryl continued in his soliloquy, and when tranquillity is restored in Holland, I shall give to the poor only fifty thousand guilders, which, after all, is a goodly sum for a man who is under no obligation whatever. Then, with the remaining fifty thousand guilders, I shall make experiments. With them I shall succeed in imparting scent to the tulip. Ah, if I succeed in giving it the odor of the rose or the carnation, or what would be still better, a completely new scent, if I restored to this queen of flowers her natural distinctive perfume, which she has lost in passing from her eastern to her European throne, and which she must have in the Indian peninsula at Goya, Bombay, and Madras, and especially in that island which in olden times, as is asserted, was the terrestrial paradise, and which is called Ceylon. Oh, what glory! I must say I would then rather be Cornelius van Barrel than Alexander, Caesar, or Maximilian. Oh, the admirable bulbs! Thus Cornelius indulged in the delights of contemplation, and was carried away by the sweetest dreams. Suddenly the bell of his cabinet was rung much more violently than usual. Cornelius, startled, laid his hands on his bulbs and turned round. "'Who is there?' he asked. Uh, "'Sir,' answered the servant, "'it is a messenger from The Hague.' "'A messenger from The Hague? What does he want?' Uh, "'Sir, it is Cranky.' "'Cranky? The confidential servant of my inner John, De Witt? "'Good, let him wait.' "'I cannot wait,' said a voice in the lobby, "'and at the same time forcing his way in. "'Cranky rushed into the dry room.' This abrupt entrance was such an infringement on the established rules of the household of Cornelius van Barrel that the latter, at the sight of Cranky, almost convulsively moved his hand which covered the bulbs, so that two of them fell on the floor, one of them rolling under a small table and the other into the fireplace. Sounds, said Cornelius, eagerly picking up his precious bulbs. What's the matter? The matter, sir, said Cranky, laying a paper on the large table on which the third bulb was laying. The matter is that you are requested to read this paper without losing one moment. And Crakey, who thought he had remarked in the streets of Dort symptoms of a tumult similar to that which he had witnessed before his departure from The Hague, ran off without even looking behind him. All right, all right, my dear Crakey, said Cornelius, stretching his arm under the table for the bulb. Your paper shall be read, indeed it shall. Then, examining the bulb which he held in the hollow of his hand, he said, Well, here is one of them uninjured. That confounded Crakey, thus to rush into my dry room. Let us now look after the other. And without laying down the bulb which he already held, Beryl went to the fireplace, knelt down, and stirred with the tips of his finger the ashes, which fortunately were quite cold. He at once felt the other bulb. Ah, here it is, he said, and looking at it with almost fatherly affection, he exclaimed, Uninjured, as the first. At this very instant, and while Cornelius, still on his knees, was examining his pets, the door of the dry room was so violently shaken and opened in such a brusk manner that Cornelius felt, rising in his cheeks and his ears, the glow of that evil counselor which is called wrath. Now, what is it again? he demanded. Are people going mad here? Oh, sir, sir, cried the servant, rushing into the dry room with a much paler face and with much more frightened mien than Crakey had shown. Well, asked Cornelius, foreboding some mischief from this double breach of the strict rule of the house. Oh, sir, fly, fly, quick, cried the servant. Fly, and what for? Sir, the house is full of the guards of the states. And what do they want? They want you. What for? To arrest you. Arrest me? Arrest me, do you say? Yes, sir, and they're headed by a magistrate. What's the meaning of all this? said Van Barrel, grasping in his hands the two bulbs and directing his terrified glance toward the staircase. They are coming up! They are coming up! cried the servant. Oh, my dear child! My worthy master! cried the old housekeeper, who now likewise made her appearance in the dry room. Take your gold, your jewelry, and fly! Fly! But how shall I make my escape, nurse? said Van Barrel. Jump out of the window! 
Twenty-five feet from the ground? But you shall fall on six feet of soft soil. Yes, but I should fall on my tulips. Never mind! Jump out! Cornelius took the third bulb, approached the window, and opened it, but seeing what havoc he would necessarily cause in his borders, and, more than this, what a height he would have to jump, he called out, Never! and fell back a step. At this instant they saw, across the banister of the staircase, the points of the halberds of the soldiers rising. The housekeeper raised her hands to heaven. As to Cornelius Van Barrel, it must be stated to his honor, not as a man, but as a tulip fancier, his only thought was for his inestimable bulbs. Looking about for a paper in which to wrap them up, he noticed the fly-leaf from the Bible which Crakey had laid upon the table, took it without, in his confusion, remembering whence it came, folded in it the three bulbs, secreted them in his bosom, and waited. At this very moment the soldiers, preceded by a magistrate, entered the room. "'Are you Dr. Cornelius Van Barrel?' demanded the magistrate, who, although knowing the young man very well, put his questions according to the forms of justice, which gave his proceedings a much more dignified air. "'I am that person, Master Van Spenen,' answered Cornelius, politely bowing to his judge, "'and you know it very well. Then give up to us the seditious papers which you secrete in your house.' "'The seditious papers?' repeated Cornelius, quite dumbfounded at the imputation. "'Now don't look astonished, if you please.' "'I vow to you, Master Van Spenen,' Cornelius replied, "'that I am completely at a loss to understand what you want.' "'Then I shall put you in the way, doctor,' said the judge. "'Give up to us the paper which the traitor Cornelius de Witt deposited with you in the month of January last.' A sudden light came into the mind of Cornelius. Hello, said Van Spenen. "'You begin now to remember, don't you?' "'Indeed I do. "'But you spoke of seditious papers, and I have none of that sort.' "'You deny it, then?' "'Certainly I do.' The magistrate turned round, and took a rapid survey of the whole cabinet. "'Where is the apartment you call your dry-room?' he asked. "'The very same where you are now, Master Van Spenen.' The magistrate cast a glance at a small note at the top of his papers. "'All right.' he said, like a man who was sure of his ground. Then turning round to Cornelius, he continued, Will you give up those papers to me? But I cannot, Master Van Spenen. Those papers do not belong to me. They have been deposited with me as a trust, and a trust is sacred. Dr. Cornelius, said the judge, in the name of the States, I order you to open this drawer, and to give up to me the papers which it contains. Saying this, the judge pointed with his finger to the third drawer of the press near the fireplace. In this very drawer, indeed, the papers deposited by the warden of the dykes with his godson were lying, a proof that the police had received very exact information. "'Ah, you will not,' said Van Spenen, when he saw Cornelius standing immovable and bewildered, "'that I shall open the drawer myself.' And pulling out the drawer to its full length, the magistrate at first alighted on about twenty bulbs, carefully arranged and ticketed, and then on the paper parcel, which had remained in exactly the same state as it was when delivered by the unfortunate Cornelius de Witt to his godson. The magistrate broke the seals, tore off the envelope, cast an eager glance on the first leaves which met his eye, and then exclaimed with a terrible voice, "'Well, justice has been rightly informed after all.' "'How?' said Cornelius. "'How is this?' "'Don't pretend to be ignorant, my Herr Van Barrel.' answered the magistrate. Follow me. What's that? Follow you? cried the doctor. Yes, sir, for in the name of the states I arrest you. Arrests were not as yet made in the name of William of Orange. He had not been stadtholder long enough for that. Arrest me? cried Cornelius. But what have I done? That's no affair of mine, doctor. You will explain all that before your judges. Where? At the Hague. Cornelius, in mute stupefaction, embraced his old nurse, who was in a swoon, shook hands with his servants, who were bathed in tears, and followed the magistrate, who put him in a coach, as a prisoner of the state, and had him driven at full gallop to The Hague. End of section 69 Recording by Todd Section 70 of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the world's story volume seven germany the netherlands and switzerland edited by eva march tappan section seventy when william the third of england came home to his fatherland sixteen ninety one thomas babington macaulay william stadtholder of the united netherlands married mary daughter of james the second of england when james was deposed william and mary were called to england and pronounced sovereigns of that country the english appreciated what william did for them but they never liked him or understood him although he was adored by his subjects in holland the editor the passage was tedious and disagreeable during many hours the fleet was becalmed off the goodwin sands and it was not till the fifth day that the soundings proved the coast of holland to be near the sea fog was so thick that no land could be seen and it was not thought safe for the ships to proceed farther in the darkness william tired out by the voyage and impatient to be once more in his beloved country determined to land in an open boat the noblemen who were in his train tried to dissuade him from risking so valuable a life but when they found that his mind was made up they insisted on sharing the danger that danger proved more serious than they had expected it had been supposed that in an hour the party would be on shore but great masses of floating ice impeded the progress of the skiff the night came on the fog grew thicker the waves broke over the king and the courtiers once the keel struck on a sandbank and was with difficulty got off the hardiest mariners showed some signs of uneasiness but william through the whole night was as composed as if he had been in the drawing-room at kensington for shame he said to one of the dismayed sailors are you afraid to die in my company a bold dutch seaman ventured to spring out and with great difficulty swam and scrambled through breakers ice and mud to firm ground here he discharged a musket and lighted a fire as a signal that he was safe none of his fellow-passengers however thought it prudent to follow his example they lay tossing inside of the flame which he had kindled till the first pale light of a january morning showed them that they were close to the island of goree the king and his lords stiff with cold and covered with icicles gladly landed to warm and rest themselves after reposing some hours in the hut of a peasant william proceeded to the hague he was impatiently expected there for though the fleet which brought him was not visible from the shore the royal salutes had been heard through the mist and had apprised the whole coast of his arrival thousands had assembled at hans lair dyke to welcome him with applause which came from their hearts and which went to his heart that was one of the few white days of a life beneficent indeed and glorious but far from happy after more than two years passed in a strange land the exile had again set foot on his native soil he heard again the language of his nursery he saw again the scenery and the architecture which were inseparably associated in his mind with the recollections of childhood and the sacred feeling of home the dreary mounds of sand shells and weeds on which the waves of the german ocean broke the interminable meadows intersected by trenches the straight canals the villas bright with paint and adorned with quaint images and inscriptions he had lived during many weary months among a people who did not love him who did not understand him who could never forget that he was a foreigner those englishmen who served him most faithfully served him without enthusiasm without personal attachment and merely from a sense of public duty in their hearts they were sorry that they had no choice 
but between an english tyrant and a dutch deliverer all was now changed william was among a population by which he was adored as elizabeth had been adored when she rode through her army at tilbury as charles the second had been adored when he landed at dover it is true that the old enemies of the house of orange had not been inactive during the absence of the stadtholder there had been not indeed clamours but mutterings against him he had it was said neglected his native land for his new kingdom whenever the dignity of the english flag whenever the prosperity of the english trade was concerned he forgot that he was a hollander but as soon as his well-remembered face was again seen all jealousy all coldness was at an end there was not a boor not a fisherman not an artisan in the crowds which lined the road from hansler dyke to the hague whose heart did not swell with pride at the thought that the first minister of holland had become a great king had freed the english and had conquered the irish it would have been madness in william to travel from hampton court to westminster without a guard but in his own land he needed no swords or carbines to defend him do not keep the people off he cried let them come close to me they are all my good friends he soon learned that sumptuous preparations were making for his entrance into the hague at first he murmured and objected he detested he said noise and display the necessary cost of the war was quite heavy enough he hoped that his kind fellow-townsmen would consider him as a neighbour born and bred among them and would not pay him so bad a compliment as to treat him ceremoniously but all his expostulations were in vain the hollanders simple and parsimonious as their ordinary habits were had set their hearts on giving their illustrious countrymen a reception suited to his dignity and to his merit and he found it necessary to yield on the day of his triumph the concourse was immense all the wheeled carriages and horses of the province were too few for the multitude of those who flocked to the show many thousands came sliding or skating along the frozen canals from amsterdam rotterdam leyden harlem delft at ten in the morning of the twenty sixth of january the great bell of the town house gave the signal sixteen hundred substantial burghers well armed and clad in the finest dresses which were to be found in the recesses of their wardrobes kept order in the crowded streets balconies and scaffolds embowered in evergreen and hung with tapestry hid the windows the royal coach escorted by an army of halberdiers and running footmen and followed by a long train of splendid equipages passed under numerous arches rich in carving and painting amidst shouts of long live the king our stadtholder the front of the town-house and the whole circuit of market-place were in a blaze with brilliant colours civic crowns trophies emblems of arts of sciences of commerce and of agriculture appeared everywhere in one place william saw portrayed the glorious actions of his ancestors there was the silent prince the founder of the batavian commonwealth passing the muse with his warriors there was the more impetuous maurice leading the charge at newport a little farther on the hero might retrace the eventful story of his own life he was a child at his widowed mother's knee he was at the altar with mary's hand in his he was landing at torbay he was swimming through the boyne there too was a boat amidst the ice and the breakers and above it was most appropriately inscribed in the majestic language of rome what dost thou fear thou hast caesar on board the task of furnishing the latin mottoes had been entrusted to two men who till bentley appeared held the highest place among the classical scholars of that age spanheim whose knowledge of the roman medals was unrivalled imitated not unsuccessfully the noble consciousness of those ancient legends which he had assiduously studied and he was assisted by grivius who then filled a chair at utrecht and whose just reputation had drawn to that university multitudes of students from every part of protestant europe when the night came fireworks were exhibited on the great tank 
which washes the walls of the palace of the federation that tank was now as hard as marble and the dutch boasted that nothing had ever been seen even on the terrace of versailles more brilliant than the effect produced by the innumerable cascades of flame which were reflected in the smooth mirror of ice the english lords congratulated their master on his immense popularity yes said he but i am not the favourite the shouting was nothing to what it would have been if mary had been with me a few hours after the triumphal entry the king attended a sitting of the states-general his last appearance among them had been on the day on which he embarked for england he had then amidst the broken words and loud weeping of those grave senators thanked them for the kindness with which they had watched over his childhood trained his young mind and supported his authority in his riper years and he had solemnly commended his beloved wife to their care he now came back among them the king of three kingdoms the head of the greatest coalition that europe had seen during a hundred and eighty years and nothing was heard in the hall but applause and congratulations by this time the streets of the hague were overflowing with the equipages and retinues of princes and ambassadors who came flocking to the great congress first appeared the ambitious and ostentatious frederick elector of brandenburg who a few years later took the title of king of prussia then arrived the young elector of bavaria the regent of Württemberg, the landgraves of hesse castle and hesse darmstadt and a long train of sovereign princes sprung from the illustrious houses of brunswick of saxony of holstein and of nassau the marquis of castanaga governor of the spanish netherlands repaired to the assembly from the vice-regal court of brussels extraordinary ministers had been sent by the emperor by the kings of spain poland denmark and sweden and by the duke of savoy there was scarcely room in the town and the neighbourhood for the english lords and gentlemen and the german counts and barons whom curiosity of official duty had brought to the place of meeting the grave capital of the most thrifty and industrious of nations was as gay as venice in the carnival the walks cut among those noble limes and elms in which the villa of the prince of orange is embosomed were gay with the plumes the stars the flowing wigs the embroidered coats and the gold-hilted swords of gallants from london berlin and vienna with the nobles were mingled sharpers not less gorgeously attired than they at night the hazard tables were thronged and the theatre was filled to the roof princely banquets followed one another in rapid succession the meats were served in gold and according to that old teutonic fashion with which shakespeare had made his countrymen familiar as often as any of the great princes proposed a health the kettle-drums and trumpets sounded some english lords particularly devonshire gave entertainments which vied with those of sovereigns it was remarked that the german potentates though generally disposed to be litigious about etiquette associated on this occasion in an unceremonious manner and seemed to have forgotten their passion for genealogical and heraldic controversy the taste for wine which was then characteristic of their nation they had not forgotten at the table of the elector of brandenburg much mirth was caused by the gravity of the statesmen of holland who sober themselves confuted out of grotius and puffendorf the nonsense stuttered by the tipsy nobles of the empire one of these nobles swallowed so many bumpers that he tumbled into the turf fire and was not pulled out till his fine velvet suit had been burned in the midst of all this revelry business was not neglected a formal meeting of the congress was held at which william presided in a short and dignified speech which was speedily circulated throughout europe he set forth the necessity of firm union and strenuous exertion the profound respect with which he was heard by that splendid assembly caused bitter mortification to his enemies both in england and in france the german potentates were bitterly reviled for yielding precedence to an upstart indeed the most illustrious among them paid to him such marks of deference as they would scarcely have deigned to pay to his imperial majesty mingled with the crowd in his antechamber and at his table behaved as respectfully as any english lord-in-waiting in one caricature the allied princes were represented as muzzled bears some with crowns some with caps of state william had them all in a chain and was teaching them to dance 
in another caricature he appeared taking his ease in an armchair with his feet on a cushion and his hat on his head while the electors of brandenburg and bavaria uncovered occupied small stools on the right and left the crowd of landgraves and sovereign dukes stood at humble distance and castanaga the unworthy successor of alva awaited the orders of the heretic tyrant on bended knee End of section seventy this recording is in the public domain section seventy one of germany the netherlands and switzerland read for liberfox org by phone the netherlands part four little stories of netherland artists historical note in the netherlands were two schools of painting the flemish in the southern provinces or what is now belgium and the dutch in the northern the flemish school began with jan van eyck who revolutionized the art of oil painting before his death in fourteen forty and culminated in peter paul rubens fifteen seventy seven to sixteen forty and his pupil van dyck the golden age of dutch painters was the seventeenth century their art was bourgeois rather than aristocratic it centred about the home and aimed at decorating the house naturally then the smaller panel picture was the favourite genre subjects little scenes from everyday life were greatly liked and in these the dutch painters achieved perfection both in colour and in design the dutch also inaugurated landscape and animal painting and in still life their work has never been surpassed among the greatest names in the dutch school of painting are rembrandt sixteen o seven to sixteen sixty nine frans hals fifteen eighty to sixteen sixty six gerard terburg sixteen o eight to sixteen eighty one jan steen sixteen twenty six to sixteen seventy nine and jan van der meer sixteen thirty two to sixteen ninety End of section seventy one. This recording is in the public domain. Section seventy two of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. King Philip presenting Rubens to Velasquez by Leon E. Escusura, Spanish artist, eighteen thirty four to nineteen o one, painting page four hundred and six the visit of rubens to spain was paid in the character of an unofficial ambassador to bring about peace between england and spain he passed nine months in the latter country and was much admired by the art-loving philip the fourth the king had a studio prepared for him in the palace and here he painted several portraits of the sovereign and the royal family he became a special favorite of the king who greatly enjoyed seeing him at work and spent much time in his studio. Velasquez was at the head of the Spanish school of painting, and one of the mightiest painters of the world. King Philip was his faithful friend. He took delight in bringing the two painters together, and appointed Velasquez to guide the Fleming among the art treasures of the country. This illustration represents the meeting of the artists. The scene is the studio of the Spaniard. The king, occupying the center of the foreground, has just presented Rubens, who, hat in hand, is bowing to Velasquez. The Spaniard is giving him courteous greeting. He extends his right hand in welcome. His left still holds the palette. On the easel is a portrait of the Infanta, upon which he has been working. At the left stand the Infanta and her maid. At the right is the court jester, curled up in a great armchair. Before him is a greyhound, who is apparently quite as much interested in the historic scene as are any of the more famous actors. End of section 72. This recording is in the public domain. Section 73 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The World Story, Volume 7 Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland Edited by Eva March Teppen Section 73 Peter Paul Rubens 1577-1640 By Theodore Child Peter Paul Rubens, born 1577, died 1640, the greatest of all the Flemish painters, and a master to be classed with the greatest painters of all time. After having been taught Latin and generally well instructed by the Jesuit fathers, was placed by his mother as a page in the service of Madame Marguerite de Ligne, widow of the Comte de Lalaine. In those days it was a custom for boys and girls to pass a few years in some noble family, where they waited upon the lord and lady of the house, who, in return, attended to the completion of their education in the usages and refinements of social life. But he did not continue long as a page. He wanted to become a painter, and therefore entered the studio of a master. Indeed, he had successively three masters, of whom the chief was Otto van Veen, who is said to have given young Rubens a taste for allegory and erudition, to have taught him to love beautiful stuffs, and to have still further schooled him in fine manners. We may look upon this Otto van Veen as a specimen of those widely curious and superior men of the 16th century, who knew something about everything. He had frequented the courts of many princes, he had read everything that was to be read, he had travelled all over Europe, and his artistic tastes and general erudition doubtless gave him great moral influence over his pupil. We may imagine the worthy man directing the attention of young Rubens to the splendour of some rich brocade, or arranging a drapery of velvet or satin, in such a manner that the light played amusingly in the folds and creases. Meanwhile, he would doubtless expound to his pupil the secret of suave and elegant manners, the principles of graceful bearing, of appropriate gesture, of clear and pleasing enunciation, impressing upon him the fact that manners maketh man, and when those manners are good, contribute not a little to one's own happiness and to the happiness of all those with whom we may come in contact. In after life Rubens in every respect did honor to his master's teachings, and became not only a great painter and a model gentleman, but generally a very learned man, and withal a great collector of antiquities, of costumes, and beautiful objects of all sorts. It is interesting to note that he communicated these tastes to his son, Albert whose open, intelligent, and expressive face we see in the portrait at Dresden. Albert Rubens became distinguished as an antiquary and an authority on the coins and monies of the past, and wrote in Latin a learned and curious treatise on the costume of the ancients. When Rubens left the studio von Veen in the year 1600, he went, as was the custom, to Italy to complete his studies and his master gave him a letter to the Archduke Albert and the Infanta Isabella, introducing the young man as his favorite pupil. But as a contemporary Italian writer Bellori says, young Rubens himself possessed the strongest of recommendations. In the elegance of his bearing, his noble and affable manners, and the abundance and variety of his conversation. Thanks to these remarkable social qualities, Rubens in afterlife was charged by sovereigns with many delicate diplomatic missions. There is a story told that a disdainful ambassador at the court of Charles I, where Rubens had come on a diplomatic errand, seeing him at work at his easel, one day said with a curl of the lips, I see, monsieur, the ambassador amuses himself by playing the painter. On the contrary, replied Rubens, being a painter, I amuse myself sometimes by playing the ambassador. Nevertheless, this prince of painters and of gentlemen, as the English diplomatist Sir Dudley Carleton called Rubens, was never happier 
than when he was living calmly in a splendid house at Antwerp, with his wife and children. Furthermore, he was never happier in his art than in the figures that he painted with his wife or his children as models, especially his beautiful second wife, Hélène Froment, whom he often painted with her little son on her knees. End of section 73 This recording is in the public domain. Section 74 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The World's Story, Volume 7. Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappen. Section 74. Anton van Dyck, 1599-1641, by Clara Erskine Clement. The greatest painter among the pupils of Rubens was Anton or Antony van Dyck, or van Dyck as it is also spelled. He was born at Antwerp in 1599. His father was a silk merchant, and his mother was a lady of artistic tastes. Though she had twelve children, she yet found time to do much embroidery and tapestry work. She had a daughter named Susanna, and it may have been on account of this child that her finest work was a large piece on which the story of Susanna was represented. She was occupied with this before the birth of Antony, who was her seventh child, and during his early years she skilfully plied her needle and wrought her many-coloured silks into landscapes and skies, trees and houses, men and animals, with untiring patience and uncommon excellence. It is easy to understand that this mother must have rejoiced to find that Anthony had artistic talent, and it is probable that it was through her influence that he became a pupil under the artist Heinrich van Balen when he was but ten years old. He was still a boy, not more than seventeen, when he entered the studio of Rubens, just at a time when the great master was devoting himself to his art with his whole soul and had a large number of young students under his direction. Van Dyck soon became the favorite pupil of Rubens and was early allowed to do such work as proved that the great artist even then appreciated the genius of the brilliant and attractive youth, for such we are told that Van Dyck was. Among other things, Rubens entrusted to Van Dyck the labor of making drawings from his pictures, to be used by the engravers who made prints after his works, for which there was a great demand at this time. It was necessary that these drawings should be very exact, so that the engraving should be as nearly like the original works as possible. And the fact that Van Dyck, when still so young, was chosen for this important task, proves that he must have been unusually skilful and correct in his drawings. Rubens left his studio but rarely, and when he did so, his pupils were in the habit of bribing his old servant to unlock the door of his private room, that they might see what the master had done. The story goes that on one occasion, just that evening when Rubens was riding, the scholars, as they looked at his work, jostled each other and injured the picture, which was not yet dry. They were filled with alarm and feared expulsion from the school. After a consultation, they begged Van Dyck to restore the injured picture. With some hesitation he did so, and to the eyes of the pupils, it was so well done that they counted on escaping discovery. The keen eye of the master, however, detected the work of another hand than his own. He summoned all the pupils and demanded an explanation, and when he knew all that had happened, he made no comment. It has even been said that he was so well pleased that he left the picture as Van Dyck had restored it. Some writers say that this accident happened to the face of the Virgin and the arm of the Magdalene, 
in the great picture of the descent from the cross now in the antwerp cathedral but we are not at all certain of the truth of this statement when van dyck was ready to go to italy he made a farewell visit to rubens and presented him with three of his pictures one of these the roman seizing christ in the garden of getsemane rubens hung in the principal room of his house and was never weary of praising it the master returned his pupil's generosity by presenting him with one of his finest horses van dyck made his first stop at Sabelton, a village near brussels here he fell in love with a girl named anna van ophem and forgot italy and his art while gazing in her face and wandering by her side through the fair valley in which she dwelt but anna regretted his idleness and was curious to see the pictures that he could paint finally he yielded to her persuasions and painted two pictures for the parish church of Sabelton. one of these was a holy family in which the virgin was a portrait of anna while saint joachim and saint anna represented her father and mother this picture he gave to the church it has long since disappeared and it is said that it was used to make grain bags by french foragers the second picture for which he was paid represented saint martin of tours when he divided his cloak with two beggars the saint was a portrait of van dyck himself and the horse he rode was painted from that which rubens had given him the picture was very dear to the people of Sabelton, and when in seventeen fifty eight they discovered that the parish priest had agreed to sell it they armed themselves with pitchforks and other homely weapons and surrounding the church insisted that the picture should not be removed in eighteen o six however they were powerless before the french soldiers and though they loved their saint as dearly as ever he was borne away to paris and placed in the gallery of the louvre where he remained until eighteen fifteen when he was taken again to Sabelton and restored to his original place it is also said that in eighteen fifty a rich american offered twenty thousand dollars to any one who would bring this picture to him no matter how it was obtained some rogues tried to steal it but the watchdogs of Sabelton barked so furiously that the men of the village were alarmed and rushed to the church so quickly that the robbers scarcely escaped since then a guard sleeps in the church and saint martin is undisturbed and may always be seen there dividing his cloak and teaching the lesson of that christian charity for which his own life was remarkable on one occasion van dyck was at haarlem the home of frans hals a noted dutch portrait painter van dyck sent for him saying that a stranger wished his portrait painted and had but two hours to stay for it hals seized the canvas and finished the picture within the given time van dyck praised it warmly and said painting seems such a simple thing that i should like to try what i can do at it hals changed places with him and the visitor painted the second portrait as quickly as the first had been made when hals saw the picture he embraced the painter and cried you are van dyck no other could do what you have now done among van dyck's most distinguished portraits are those of charles i and his family perhaps the most pleasing of these is the picture of the three children of the king a subject which van dyck several times repeated end of section seventy four this recording is in the public domain section seventy five of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume seven germany the netherlands and switzerland edited by eva march tappan section 
seventy five rembrandt's the night watch by theophile gautier the night watch the largest work ever painted by rembrandt fills almost the whole of one side of a room in the museum at amsterdam that might be better lighted to remedy this the painting is mounted on a bracket that allows the picture to be drawn from the wall until the right line has been obtained before i speak of this marvel it may not be out of place to tell under what circumstances it was painted and what is the theme the artist has treated if there be anything that confirms the theory i have so often put forth and maintained namely that to painters of true genius the subject is a matter of utmost indifference it is assuredly the wondrous painting in the museum at amsterdam its name the night watch might lead people who have not seen it to imagine that it represents some mysterious and fantastic scene a nightmare of shadow and terror such as membrandt sketched so well but there is nothing so poetical about it the picture merely represents the assembling of the national guard of the day if one looks up wagonar the author of a history of amsterdam one finds that the militia was ordered on may fourth sixteen forty two to be ready for a review that was to take place on the evening of the nineteenth under penalty of a twenty-five gulden fine in case of absence the object was to receive the prince of orange who was to arrive accompanied by the daughter of charles i of england whom he had just taken in marriage it surely was impossible to give a painter a more insignificant and more prosaic subject modern efforts along this line suffice to indicate what such a subject now brings forth it must be borne in mind also that it was necessary to put the big wigs of the militia well in front and to attain resemblance in the case of each and every one for most of these faces and portraits and the queer names of their owners have been preserved it may be assumed that all these worthies had not received written summonses to turn out or else that the use of such notices was unknown to the good city of amsterdam for the beat of the drum seems to have surprised them in the midst of their occupations they are hurrying as though a single minute's delay would involve the twenty-five gulden fine they rush forth half-dressed one man is buttoning his jacket and another is drawing on his gloves as he goes the whole scene is filled with infinite movement disorder and rush the spartans under leonidas did not spring to arms to defend the thermopylae with greater courage than these worthy and debonair dutch citizens going to meet the prince of orange you are aware of the fanciful taste of the laden miller's son in the matter of the costumes he puts on his figures well he never was more amazingly startling than in this inoffensive meeting of militia men it is true that the costumes of the day lent themselves more readily to painting than do those of our times the jackets of embroidered leather the points the wide top boots the helmets the breastplates the neck plates the broad baldrics the swords with heavy shell guards all these even when worn by a militia man may furnish opportunities to the brush of a skilful painter what rembrandt has made of them is absolutely prodigious never was the fury of execution carried to such a pitch there is a temerity in the work of the brush a craze of impasto of which de Camp's most violent sketches do not give even a faint idea some of the gold lace is modelled in full relief some of the four shortened fingers have been done at one stroke of the brush while there are noses that fairly stand out of the canvas 
it is at once the strangest thing and one that redounds to the glory of rembrandt that this execution so incredible in its brutality is at the same time extremely delicate it is a finish obtained by fisticuffs and kicks but such as the most careful painters have never been able to attain from the chaos of broken touches from the tumult of shadows and lights from the masses of colour cast on as if at haphazard there springs supreme harmony rembrandt who of all men assuredly cared least for the greeks and romans and whose mighty triviality accepts unhesitatingly the meanest aspects of nature does not on that account as might easily be believed lack style and elevation of thought by means of the peculiar accent he imparts even to the objects he has most faithfully reproduced by the romantic quaintness of his costumes and the deep thoughtfulness of even the ugliest faces he paints he attains a monstrous beauty more easily felt than described his work has a formidable character that brings it up to the level of all masterpieces the fantastic and masterly manner in which he handles light and shade the sublime effects of chiaroscuro which he evolves make of him as poetical an artist as ever lived all he needs to move you and make you thoughtful for a whole day is an old man rising from his armchair and a star scintillating against a dark background these worthy dutchmen have been provided by his brush with curled-up moustaches and beards bristling eyebrows hands on hips martial poses and hectoring airs never did condottieri lansknechts or stradiotes look more surlily grim salvator rosa's brigands look like peaceful citizens by the side of these worthy militiamen the drummer in particular is beating his drum with relentless fierceness while he casts glances fit to make the earth quake with terror on the other hand nothing can be more engaging more fair more golden than the little maid dressed in yellow seen through an almost inextricable collection of legs and arms this painting so wagonar further tells us adorned as late as seventeen sixty four the court-room of the aforesaid militia what a pleasure it must have been in those days to fail to report for guard duty a man was summoned before the court and while he was being tried could gaze undisturbed upon the wondrous painting hung behind the bench of judges times have changed indeed where is the militia regiment that would dream of ordering a picture of delacroix and hanging it up in its court-room end of section seventy five this recording is in the public domain section seventy six of germany the netherlands and switzerland read for liberfox dot org by phone the night watch by rembrandt van rijn born at leiden sixteen o seven died in sixteen sixty nine painting page four hundred and fourteen the picture cannot be fully understood without some knowledge of its history painted for the hall of the amsterdam musketeers it was to take its place among others by contemporary painters as a portrait group in honour of the officers of the year and as a lasting memorial of their services the other pictures had been stiff groups about a table and the novelty of rembrandt's composition displeased some of the members of the guild each person who figures in the scene had subscribed a certain sum towards the cost of the picture for his own portrait and was anxious to get his money's worth consequently there were many who did not at all relish their insignificance in the background quite overshadowed by the glory of the captain and lieutenant they thought they would have shown to much better advantage arranged in rows in the following century it was removed to the town hall and in order to fit it into a particular place on the wall 
a strip was cut off each side of the canvas it is the loss of these margins which gives the composition the crowded appearance which so long seemed a strange fault in a great artist like rembrandt the original colours of the painting grew so dark with the accumulation of smoke in the hall that the critics supposed the scene occurred at night hence the incorrect name of the night watch was given to it since the picture was cleaned in eighteen eighty nine it is apparent that the incident occurred in the daytime and if you look carefully you can plainly see the shadow of captain cock's hand on the lieutenant's tunic estelle m hurl end of section seventy six this recording is in the public domain section seventy seven of germany the netherlands and switzerland read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. Rembrandt in his studio by Jean Leon Jerome, French artist, eighteen twenty four to nineteen o four, painting, page four hundred and sixteen. Rembrandt was at the head of the Dutch school of painting and was one of the world's greatest artists. He was thoroughly original. His one model was nature, but nature aglow with poetry and reproduced with a strong and virile touch his portrait painting was marvellously executed for here too came out the picturesque and also the realistic in etching he has never been excelled both because of his artistic excellence and also because of his rare skill in the technicalities of the art and in the use of its tools the accompanying illustration represents him at his work clara erskine clement says of him Rembrandt has a quick eye for all these marvellous effects of light, and he has painted just such things as he has seen, and nothing else. In each of his pictures there are particular points upon which to fix the eye, and though the whole is painted with exquisite skill, and the smaller details bear examination, just as the blades of grass and the smallest flowers in the landscape do, we have no wish to examine them. The one great interest holds our attention, and we are satisfied with that. The execution of the pictures of Rembrandt is marvellous. He painted some very ugly and even vulgar pictures. He disregarded all rules of costume and of the fitness of things in many ways. He parodied many ideal subjects, and he painted scenes from scripture history in which he put the exact portraits of the coarse and common people about him. But in spite of all these faults, his simplicity, truthfulness, and earnestness make his pictures masterpieces and we cannot turn away from them carelessly they attract us and hold us with a powerful spell end of section seventy seven this recording is in the public domain section seventy eight of germany the netherlands and switzerland read for librivox .org by phone the netherlands part five the netherlands in recent years historical note in the days of the american revolution the dutch were the firm friends of the struggling colonists but they were in difficulties at home the king of prussia made an excuse for interfering and before long prussia and england were the real rulers of the dutch republic then came a quarrel with the french who refused to make any terms with the Netherlands until the stadtholder, William V, had left the country. He did this, and now was founded the Batavian Republic. In 1807, Napoleon declared the land to be a kingdom, and made his brother Louis its sovereign. After the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, and the downfall of Napoleon, the Dutch freed themselves from French rule, formed a constitution, and invited the son of William V to become their monarch. This was done in 1814, and that was when the Dutch took Holland. This new ruler bore the title of King William I. He governed both the northern and the southern Netherlands, that is, Holland and Belgium. It would have needed the wisdom of Solomon to make two such dissimilar countries happy under the same laws. The Hollanders spoke Dutch, 
were interested in commerce and were protestants the belgians spoke french cared little for commerce but much for manufactures and were roman catholics the natural result was a separation between the two countries in eighteen forty king william resigned in favour of his son william the second who was succeeded by william the third during the reign of william the third business flourished harlem lake was drained new canals and dikes were built and there was general progress and prosperity in eighteen eighty his daughter was born the little wilhelmina who became queen at the age of ten and straightway won the hearts of her people end of section seventy eight this recording is in the public domain section seventy nine of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by philip watson the world's story volume seven germany the netherlands and switzerland edited by eva march tappan section seventy nine the american revolution in holland by hendrik wilhelm van loon when after a few years it seemed that the american colonies were actually going to start a new commonwealth entirely independent of the mother country large vistas of new commercial advantages opened themselves up to the dutch merchants up to the beginning of the revolution the american colonists had been obliged to trade directly with england alone and england had been careful that the colonists should not enter upon business which would compete with the business of her subjects at home if they gained their independence the colonists would then be able to deal with whomever they pleased and the republic hoped to get her share of the american trade during the last thirty years so many old fields of enterprise had been gradually lost to her that a new opening would be extremely welcome this practical sentiment was reciprocated in america those excellent colonists were at all times infinitely more practical than the european sentimentalist could imagine them to be they were practical politicians the theory of their revolution never for a moment allowed them to forget the bread-and-butter side of it their hard common sense never allowed them to go off into any extremes which did not stand fundamentally upon a sound basis of one dollar plus one dollar or two dollars the french revolution with its sublime indifference to the material side of life and with its exaggerated sentiment about uplifting the whole of the human race to its own ideals was conducted upon entirely different principles the american revolutionists knew what they wanted better than other rebels either before or after have known they did one thing at a time and did not waste their energies in senseless dreams of the far distant future for the moment their most imperative need was guns and materials of war generally they had no regular fleet and few merchant ships on the sea they were at the mercy of the english fleet the dutch smugglers were therefore of great benefit to them in supplying them with the necessities of war from the small island of st eustatius in the antilles a possession of the west india company a regular smuggling trade was maintained with american ports the island had a fine harbor and its storehouses were filled with millions of dollars worth of goods ready for transportation to forbidden harbors either spanish or american this trade was quite as detrimental to the interests of england as the american export of mules for south africa was detrimental to the interests of the late transvaal republic in august of the year seventeen seventy five therefore the british government instructed its representative in the hague to address himself to the estates general with the request that this smuggling from a dutch harbour should forthwith be ended the estates general expressed their regret at the matter and promised to attend to it at once they promulgated an edict which forbade the export of guns and all materials of war from dutch harbours for a period of six months a fine of one thousand guilders was threatened to be levied upon those who should act contrary to this law after the first six months this edict was prolonged for another half-year as for its practical results they were nil 
there was too much profit in the business to stop it with the mere threat of a fine furthermore all the tricks of this particular trade were well known and how could the estates general surmise that barrels of butter directed to a french port in reality contained powder and were bound for an american harbor they could have discovered this of course if they had really wished but they hesitated to interfere too seriously with a form of business activity which however objectionable brought so much gain to many of their fellow-citizens and to themselves when the british government noticed how ineffectual the estates general had been in preventing a continuation of this detrimental smuggling business it decided to take matters into its own hands and to defend its own interests as it thought best the english fleet in the caribbean sea was strengthened with a number of new ships and all dutch vessels were searched and if found to contain contraband of war were brought to english ports and there sold this did not improve the feelings between the two countries england resented the republic's indifference the republic resented england's interference france however looked on with interest and rejoiced in her need of soldiers england now asked holland for the loan of a certain scottish brigade which had been in the dutch service since fifteen seventy seven the dutch objected england might possibly forget to send them back and moreover by waiting a while a larger price might be commanded for their services finally the dutch agreed to grant england's request but on condition that the brigade should not be used outside of europe england decided that the troops were not necessary but she did not forget england had been most unhappy in the choice of her diplomatic representative in the hague sir joseph york belonged to that class of arrogant british diplomats who at all times and in all countries have by their overbearing behavior done so much to prevent a good understanding between their home country and the land to which they were accredited he was very honest and belonged to that order of honest people who always speak the truth when it does most harm and is least called for he represented a country which was then at the height of its glory the foremost nation of europe but he represented it in a country which was then rapidly going towards the lowest depths it would ever reach sir joseph unfortunately had the bad tact to let the hollanders continually feel their changed condition and was very apt to treat the estates general as if they existed only by sufferance of his british majesty the tradition of many centuries had established a privileged position for the british minister in the hague he was often called upon to be the unofficial adviser of the stadtholders who were so closely related to the british throne from the very beginning however sir joseph could not get along with the friends of the young stadtholders the stadtholder himself he soon considered a negligible quantity a man who had to be protected occasionally against his enemies who were also the enemies of england the stadtholder on his side was afraid of the grouchy old briton who would address him without any ceremony who would ask such pertinent questions that it was next to impossible to tell him a lie or to spar for time in which to get up an appropriate answer neither did william like to be reminded at all times of his complete dependence upon england for a secure hold upon his own high office the princess who had not yet played any political role being too much occupied with her nursery disliked the englishman from the beginning and always kept out of his way with the regents sir joseph got along even worse their high and mightiness each one a little potentate in his own small circle had to be handled with great care a mistake in the correct title by which they expected to be addressed might cause no end of annoyance sir joseph who went right ahead regardless of other people's feelings was continually stepping on everybody's sensitive toes instead of flattering the regents and cajoling them into complying with his wishes he used to tell them abruptly what he wanted and then would expect them to do as he desired whenever his requests were not immediately granted he used to rumble with the british thunder and threaten the republic with the terrible things that might happen if the just demands of his british majesty's government should be disregarded the regents retaliated by most exasperating slowness in all their dealings with sir joseph they never said no they never gave him a chance to call forth the storm which was to destroy them but neither did they ever say yes they let his excellency know that the matter was under discussion and then they gave him a few months in which to cool off his anger 
a proceeding which usually had an effect opposite to that intended. In this way, the misunderstanding between the two countries was continually increased. On the side of the Republic, there was a good deal of insolence and a prejudiced desire to see everything British in as bad a light as possible. On the side of England, there was a good deal of just cause for annoyance, but also an insolent disregard of the feelings of its neighbor. The only person who benefited by all this quarreling was the French minister. Daffre had been called back and had been succeeded by a young diplomat, the Duc de Vaugouillon. Paul-François de Goulin, Duc de Vaugouillon, son of the former governor of Louis the Fourteenth, was only thirty years old when he was sent to The Hague. What he lacked in experience he made up for by a charming personality and by a large personal fortune, which he used most liberally for his diplomatic purposes. He never bothered about the stadtholder. He did not even take the trouble to oppose him, but left him in peace and used all his influence towards establishing a firm friendship with the regents. To the regents his palace and his purse were open at all times, and around his excellent dinners he used to collect as many of them as were willing to come. Van der Capellen and his democratic friends he carefully avoided. It is true that a good many Frenchmen at that moment shared the Republic's popular enthusiasm for the Americans and for everything American, up to the wearing of hats and coats à l'Américain. But such enthusiasm was considered a pastime for fashionable people. For those who were not fashionable, the system of, by the grace of God, was considered good enough and was rigorously maintained. Even when in 1778 France entered into a treaty with the Americans, this was done not so much out of an abstract love for those principles which the Americans were supposed to defend, as in the hope of earning sweet revenge for the loss of Canada. His Excellency, the French ambassador, had not been sent to the Republic for sentimental reasons. His duty was to get the Republic away from England and to force her into an alliance with France. For France needed money, and with the impending expedition to America would soon need more, and the Republic possessed those indispensable funds. De Vaugouillon, therefore, took great pains to get into the right relationship with the banking interests of the country. In Amsterdam he had a host of friends. Gradually he established for himself the position of unofficial head of all those among the regents who opposed the stadtholder. Outwardly, however, he maintained correct relations with William, for the Prince of Orange was an excellent weapon with which to menace the regents. Should they show themselves unmanageable, de Vaugouillon could always threaten to throw France's influence in favor of their enemy, the stadtholder. In one word, the French minister did a very clever piece of balancing between the different parties. Wherever Sir Joseph, by his boorishness, had made new enemies, de Vaugouillon was sure to appear, and by the charm of his manner, turn the insulted parties into his firm and everlasting friends. Wherever the Dutch merchants were loud in their complaints about the British and denounced their brusque methods of dealing with the smuggling trade, they were informed of the benefits that would result if only they were willing to leave an ally who no longer behaved as such and throw their fate in with that of magnanimous France. Circumstances greatly favored the Frenchmen. In the West Indies, the relations between Dutch and English grew steadily from bad to worse. Not only had England increased her fleet in the Caribbean Sea, but she had also hinted to her merchants at home and abroad that a little privateering at the expense of the Dutch would not be punished with the gallows, and might even be looked upon with favor by the authorities at home. And the patriotic British shipowners from Bristol and Plymouth, and all the many seaports along the English coast, had caught the hint and had started chasing Dutch ships wherever they could find them. The Caribbean Sea was soon full of respectable buccaneers, who stomped and plundered whatever ships fell into their hands in the interest of the mother country. Let us at least pay tribute to their impartiality. They took quite as many French, Spanish, and Danish as they did Dutch ships. Whenever they could not find anything on the sea, they were apt to extend their opportunities to the South American continent. England still refused to recognize the United States as an independent nation, and wherever American ships were found in Dutch harbors, the English quietly declared them their prizes. Upon one occasion, an English privateer met an American merchantman going from Suriname to Virginia. The American ship fled and returned to the coast, where it was captured under the very nose of a Dutch fortress and a Dutch man-of-war. 
Loud was the well which the Dutch press made about this attack upon Dutch sovereignty, and the insult offered to the captain of the Dutch ship, who, when he tried to demand an explanation of the English captain, was told to get out or take care that he did not get shot too. The matter was immediately carried to the attention of Sir Joseph, but His Excellency had waited for just such an occasion to say what was in his mind. The Estates General, so he told them, might as well know once and for all that the King of England, his august master, had decided that in the future he would exercise what was merely his good right, everywhere and under all conditions. The King, therefore, intended to attack the rebellious Americans wherever His Majesty's arms or fleet could find them, and would inflict due punishment upon all those who either supported said Americans or who gave them hospitality. Finally, His Majesty thought that it would be of much greater advantage to his country to have open and duly recognized enemies than to have so-called allies who provided His Majesty's rebellious subjects with all the contraband of war they needed. Sir Joseph did not do things by halves. The hint which he gave was broad enough. The Republic in this period of her history was playing a miserable role. She openly encouraged the enemies of her ally in order to make some money. She so neglected her fortifications that her harbors were at the mercy of any English catboat that ventured to sail across the ocean. When in consequence of this dishonest policy the Republic finally got into trouble, she knew no way to get redress but by allowing her hired scribes to vilify England and to call the British minister a bore. Meanwhile, everybody in the Republic was asking everybody else, why is not something being done? Why does not the Stadtholder send out a fleet to protect our interests? Are we always going to be at the mercy of this British insolence? Just that sort of question was asked in Athens when Sparta destroyed its prosperity and in Rome when the barbarians swooped down upon the outlying provinces. Why is not something being done? As a matter of fact, the Stadtholder did try to do something. There were plans and discussions about sending a fleet of 20 ships to the Caribbean Sea to defend the Dutch colonies and protect the merchantmen against the English privateers. The first question was where to find 20 ships. The second, where to find the sailors with which to man the 20 ships. Not only was there a lack of funds with which to build ships, but the renewed activity in the smuggling business and the high wages paid to the sailors who engaged in it caused a scarcity of men for the fleet which no promise of a high enlistment premium could remedy. After many months of delay, however, eight ships were made more or less seaworthy and equipped for the trip across the Atlantic. In the last month of 1777, this small fleet, under command of Count Louis von Bylandt, sailed to South America with strict orders to protect only the legitimate trade. Bylant had no orders to suppress the illegitimate trade. Therefore, while he defended the Dutch merchantmen against the English privateers, he did nothing to stop the export of contraband goods to the United States. From an English point of view, therefore, the Dutch fleet was only another insult to Great Britain and had no other purpose than to encourage Mr. George Washington to continue in his rebellious conduct. Chance only prevented an open outbreak at that time. From both sides, everything was being done to create mutual ill will. As we have seen before, one of the governors of St. Eustatius, the big department store of the American Revolution, had been called back upon a number of complaints by the English and had been replaced by a certain de Graff. This de Graff, as we also have had a chance to remark, was a very common individual and saw his only duty in making the greatest profit in the shortest time. As he was a man of great commercial industry and no integrity whatsoever, his activities were all the more detrimental to the reputation of the island of which he happened to be governor. One of his first acts caused no end of irritation in England. On the 16th of November, 1776, a ship flying the American flag entered the harbor of St. Eustatius. The governor, though he knew that the American colonies were not yet recognized as an independent nation, ordered his men to find a gun that could be fired and to salute the new flag. Since the American Revolution has been successful and everything has come out as well as the most ardent American patriot could hope, this act of de Graff is lauded as the first honor which the nations of the world paid to the free and enlightened commonwealth of the West. At that moment, however, the act of de Graff was a decided breach of tact committed against a friendly nation, and it is no wonder that England resented it. 
When the matter was reported to The Hague via London, Sir Joseph in his usual way made a great to-do about it, even when making the most reasonable complaint, he had the unhappy faculty of irritating everybody to the point where they felt that they, and not he, were the persons who had suffered an injustice. In this case, however, the fact could not possibly be denied. The Estates General followed the only course open to them and ordered de Graff to be recalled. The investigation of his conduct was dragged along in the customary way. From all sides, pressure was being brought to bear upon the authorities not to let such a valuable man be lost. Soon, de Graff complained that his health, after so many years in the tropics, could not stand the strain of the Dutch climate. He was then allowed to return to his old home and was reinstated as governor of St. Eustatius. Neither England's remonstrance nor Sir Joseph's violence of language had done the slightest good. Everything remained as before. The Dutch smuggled, the English buccaneered. The stadtholder grew pale in the face and stammered apologies. Sir Joseph grew red in the face and bellowed revenge. Finally, events took their natural course, and war broke out between the Republic and England. End of section 79. This recording is in the public domain. Section 80 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The World's Story, Volume 7. Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappen. Section 80. Contrary Land. By Mary Mapes Dodge. Holland is one of the queerest countries under the sun. It should be called Old Land or Contrary Land, for in nearly everything it is different from other parts of the world. In the first place, a large portion of the country is lower than the level of the sea. Great dikes or bulwarks have been erected at a heavy cost of money and labor to keep the ocean where it belongs. On certain parts of the coast it sometimes leans with all its weight against the land, and it is as much as the poor country can do to stand the pressure. Sometimes the dikes give way or spring a leak, and the most disastrous results ensue. They are high and wide, and the tops of some of them are covered with buildings and trees. They have even fine public roads upon them, from which horses may look down upon wayside cottages. Often the keels of floating ships are higher than the roofs of the dwellings. The stork clattering to her young on the house-beak may feel that her nest is lifted far out of danger, but the croaking frog in neighboring bulrushes is nearer the stars than she. Water-bugs dart backward and forward above the heads of the chimney-swallows, and willow-trees seem drooping with shame, because they cannot reach as high as the reeds nearby. Ditches, canals, ponds, rivers, and lakes are everywhere to be seen. High, but not dry, they shine in the sunlight, catching nearly all the bustle and the business, quite scorning the tame fields stretching damply beside them. One is tempted to ask, which is Holland, the shores or the water? The very verdure that should be confined to the land has made a mistake and settled upon the fish ponds. In fact, the entire country is a kind of saturated sponge, or, as the English poet Butler called it, a land that rides at anchor and is moored, in which they do not live but go aboard. Persons are born, live and die, and even have their gardens on canal boats. Farmhouses, with roofs like great slouched hats pulled over their eyes, stand on wooden legs with a tucked-up sort of air, as if to say, We intend to keep dry if we can. Even the horses wear a white stool on each hoof to lift them out of the mire. In short, the landscape everywhere suggests a paradise for ducks. It is a glorious country in summer for barefooted girls and boys. 
such wadings, such mimic ship sailing, such rowing, fishing, and swimming. Only think of a chain of puddles where one can launch chip boats all day long and never make a return trip. But enough. A full recital would set all young America rushing in a body toward the Zuider Zee. Dutch cities seem at first sight to be a bewildering jungle of houses, bridges, churches, and ships, sprouting into masts, steeples, and trees. In some cities, vessels are hitched like horses to their owner's doorpost and receive their freight from the upper windows. Mothers scream to Lodewijk and Cassie not to swing on the garden gate for fear they may be drowned. Water roads are more frequent there than common roads and railways. Water fences, in the form of lazy green ditches, enclose pleasure ground, boulder, and garden. Sometimes fine green hedges are seen, but wooden fences such as we have in America are rarely met with in Holland. As for stone fences, a Dutchman would lift his hands with astonishment at the very idea. There is no stone there, except those great masses of rock that have been brought from other lands to strengthen and protect the coast. All the small stones or pebbles, if there ever were any, seem to be imprisoned in pavements or quite melted away. Boys with strong, quick arms may grow from pinafores to full beards without ever finding one to start the water rings or set the rabbits flying. The water roads are nothing less than canals intersecting the country in every direction. They are of all sizes, from the great North Holland ship canal, which is the wonder of the world, to those which a boy can leap. Water omnibuses, called treksruiten, constantly ply up and down these roads for the conveyance of passengers, and water drays, called pakschuiten, are used for carrying fuel and merchandise. Footnote. Canal boats. Some of the first named are over thirty feet long. They look like greenhouses lodged on barges, and are drawn by horses walking along the bank of the canal. The trekschuiten are divided into two compartments, first and second class, and when not too crowded, the passengers make themselves quite at home in them. The men smoke, the women knit or sew, while children play upon the small outer deck. Many of the canal boats have white, yellow, or chocolate-coloured sails. This last colour is caused by a preparation of tan which is put on to preserve them. End of footnote. Instead of green country lanes, green canals stretch from field to barn and from barn to garden, and the farms, or polders, as they are termed, are merely great lakes pumped dry. Some of the busiest streets are water, while many of the country roads are paved with brick. The city boats, with their rounded sterns, gilded prows, and gaily painted sides, are unlike any other under the sun, and a Dutch wagon with its funny little crooked pole is a perfect mystery of mysteries. One thing is clear, cries Master Brightside. The inhabitant need never be thirsty. But no, old land is true to itself still, notwithstanding the sea pushing to get in, and the lakes struggling to get out, and the overflowing canals, rivers, and ditches. In many districts there is no water fit to swallow. Our poor Hollanders must go dry, or drink wine and beer, or send far into the inland to Utrecht and other favoured localities, for that precious fluid older than Adam, yet young as the morning dew. Sometimes, indeed, the inhabitants can swallow a shower when they are provided with any means of catching it, but generally they are like the albatross-haunted sailors in Coleridge's famous poem of The Ancient Mariner. They see water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. 
great flapping windmills all over the country make it look as if flocks of huge sea-birds were just settling upon it everywhere one sees the funniest trees bobbed into fantastical shapes with their trunks painted a dazzling white yellow or red horses are often yoked three abreast men women and children go clattering about in wooden shoes with loose heels peasant girls who cannot get bows for love hire them for money to escort them to the kermis footnote fair End of footnote. and husbands and wives lovingly harness themselves side by side on the bank of the canal and drag their bakschuits to market another peculiar feature of holland is the dune or sand hill these are numerous along certain portions of the coast before they were sown with coarse reed grass and other plants to hold them down they used to send great storms of sand over the inland so to add to the oddities farmers sometimes dig down under the surface to find their soil and on windy days dry showers of sand often fall upon fields that have grown wet under a week of sunshine in short almost the only familiar thing we yankees can meet with in holland is a harvest song which is quite popular there though no linguist could translate it even then we must shut our eyes and listen only to the tune which i leave you to guess yanker didi doodle down didi doodle launter yankee viver voover van botermelk and taunter on the other hand many of the oddities of holland serve only to prove the thrift and perseverance of the people there is not a richer or more carefully tilled garden spot in the whole world than this leaky springy little country there is not a braver more heroic race than its quiet passive-looking inhabitants few nations have equalled it in important discoveries and inventions none has excelled it in commerce navigation learning and science or set as noble examples in the promotion of education and public charities and none in proportion to its extent has expended more money and labour upon public works holland has its shining annals of noble and illustrious men and women its grand historic records of patience resistance and victory its religious freedom its enlightened enterprise its art its music and its literature it has truly been called the battlefield of europe as truly may we consider it the asylum of the world for the oppressed of every nation have there found shelter and encouragement if we americans who after all are homeopathic preparations of holland stock can laugh at the dutch and call them human beavers and hint that their country may float off any day at high tide we can also feel proud and say they have proved themselves heroes and that their country will not float off while there is a dutchman left to grapple it there are said to be at least ninety nine hundred large windmills in holland with sails ranging from eighty to one hundred and twenty feet long they are employed in sawing timber beating hemp grinding and many other kinds of work but their principal use is for pumping water from the lowlands into the canals and for guarding against the inland freshets that so often deluge the country their yearly cost is said to be nearly ten millions of dollars the large ones are of great power their huge circular tower rising sometimes from the midst of factory buildings is surmounted with a smaller one tapering into a cat-like roof this upper tower is encircled at its base with a balcony high above which juts the axis turned by its four prodigious ladder-backed sails many of the windmills are primitive affairs seeming sadly in need of yankee improvements but some of the new ones are admirable they are so constructed that by some ingenious contrivance 
they present their fans or wings to the wind in precisely the right direction to work with the requisite power in other words the miller may take a nap and feel quite sure that his mill will study the wind and make the most of it until he wakens should there be but a slight current of air every sail will spread itself to catch the faintest breath but if a heavy blow should come they will shrink at its touch like great mimosa leaves and only give it half a chance to move them one of the old prisons of amsterdam called the rasp house because the thieves and vagrants who were confined there were employed in rasping logwood had a cell for the punishment of lazy prisoners in one corner of this cell was a pump and in another an opening through which a steady stream of water was admitted the prisoner could take his choice either to stand still and be drowned or to work for dear life at the pump and keep the flood down until his jailer chose to relieve him now it seems to me that throughout holland nature has introduced this little diversion on a grand scale the dutch have always been forced to pump for their very existence and probably must continue to do so to the end of time end of section eighty this recording is in the public domain recording by film section eighty one of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phone the world's story volume seven germany the netherlands and switzerland edited by eva march tappen section eighty one the festival of saint nicholas by mary mapes dodge we all know how before the christmas tree began to flourish in the home life of our country a certain right jolly old elf with eight tiny reindeer used to drive his sleigh load of toys up to our housetops and then bound down the chimney to fill the stocking so hopefully hung by the fireplace his friends called him santa claus and those who were most intimate ventured to say old nick it was said that he originally came from holland doubtless he did but if so he certainly like many other foreigners changed his ways very much after landing upon our shores in holland saint nicholas is a veritable saint and often appears in full costume with his embroidered robes glittering with gems and gold his mitre his crozier and his jewelled gloves here santa claus comes rollicking along on the twenty fifth of december our holy christmas morn but in holland saint nicholas visits earth on the fifth a time especially appropriated to him early on the morning of the sixth he distributes his candies toys and treasures then vanishes for a year christmas day is devoted by the hollanders to church rites and pleasant family visiting it is on st nicholas eve that their young people become half wild with joy and expectation to some of them it is a sorry time for the saint is very candid and if any of them have been bad during the past year he is quite sure to tell them so sometimes he carries a birch rod under his arm and advises the parents to give them scoldings in place of confections and floggings instead of toys it was well that the boys hastened to their abodes on that bright winter evening for in less than an hour afterwards the saint made his appearance in half the homes of holland he visited the king's palace and in the self-same moment appeared in annie bauman's comfortable home probably one of our silver half-dollars would have purchased all that his saintship left at the peasant bauman's but a half-dollar's worth will sometimes do for the poor what hundreds of dollars may fail to do for the rich it makes them happy and grateful 
fills them with new peace and love. Hilda van Gleck's little brothers and sisters were in a high state of excitement that night. They had been admitted into the grand parlor. They were dressed in their best, and had been given two cakes apiece at supper. Hilda was as joyous as any. Why not? St. Nicholas would never cross a girl of fourteen from his list, just because she was tall and looked almost like a woman. On the contrary, he would probably exert himself to do honor to such an august-looking damsel. Who could tell? So she sported and laughed and danced as gaily as the youngest, and was the soul of all their merry games. Father, mother, and grandmother looked on approvingly. So did grandfather, before he spread his large red handkerchief over his face, leaving only the top of his skullcap visible. His kerchief was his ensign of sleep. Earlier in the evening all had joined in the fun. In the general hilarity there had seemed to be a difference only in bulk between grandfather and the baby. Indeed, a shade of solemn expectation now and then flitting across the faces of the younger members had made them seem rather more thoughtful than their elders. Now the spirit of fun reigned supreme. The very flames danced and capered in the polished grate. A pair of prim candles that had been staring at the astral lamp began to wink at other candles far away in the mirrors. There was a long bell-rope suspended from the ceiling in the corner, made of glass beads netted over a cord nearly as thick as your wrist. It generally hung in the shadow and made no sign, but to-night it twinkled from end to end. Its handle of crimson glass sent reckless dashes of red at the papered wall, turning its dainty blue stripes into purple. Passers-by halted to catch the merry laughter floating, through curtain and sash, into the street, then skipped on their way with a startled consciousness that the village was wide awake. At last matters grew so uproarious that the grandsire's red kerchief came down from his face with a jerk. What decent old gentleman could sleep in such a racket? Mynheer van Gleck regarded his children with astonishment. The baby even showed symptoms of hysterics. It was high time to attend to business. Madame suggested that if they wished to see the good St. Nicholas, they should sing the same loving invitation that had brought him the year before. The baby stared and thrust his fist into his mouth as Mynheer put him down upon the floor. Soon he sat erect, and looked with a sweet scowl at the company. With his lace and embroideries, and his crown of blue ribbon and whalebone, for he was not quite past the tumbling age, he looked like the king of the babies. The other children, each holding a pretty willow basket, formed at once in a ring, and moved slowly around the little fellow, lifting their eyes, meanwhile, for the saint to whom they were about to address themselves was yet in mysterious quarters. Madame commenced playing softly upon the piano. Soon the voices rose, gentle, youthful voices, rendered all the sweeter for their tremor. Welcome, friend, St. Nicholas, welcome. Bring no rod for us to-night, while our voices bid thee welcome. Every heart with joy is light. Tell us every fault and failing, We will bear thy keenest railing. So we sing, so we sing, Thou shalt tell us everything. Welcome, friend, St. Nicholas, welcome, Welcome to this merry band. Happy children, greet thee, welcome, Thou art gladdening all the land. Fill each empty hand and basket, Tis thy little ones who ask it. So we sing, so we sing, Thou wilt bring us everything. During the chorus, sundry glances, Half in eagerness, half in dread, Had been cast towards the polished folding doors. Now a loud knocking was heard. The circle was broken in an instant. 
some of the little ones with a strange mixture of fear and delight pressed against their mother's knee grandfather bent forward with his chin resting upon his hand grandmother lifted her spectacles mynheer van gleck seated by the fireplace slowly drew his meerschaum from his mouth while hilda and the other children settled themselves beside him in an expectant group the knocking was heard again come in said madame softly the door slowly opened and saint nicholas in full array stood before them you could have heard a pin drop soon he spoke what a mysterious majesty in his voice what kindliness in his tones Karel van Gleck, I am pleased to greet thee, and thy honoured Frau Katrin, and thy son and his good Frau Annie. Children, I greet ye all, Hendrik, Hilda, Brom, Katie, Huygens, and Lucretia, and thy cousins, Wolfert, Diedrich, Maiken, Voost, and Katrina. Good children ye have been, in the main, since I last accosted ye. Dietrich was rude at the Harlem Fair last fall, but he has tried to atone for its sins. Maike has failed of late in her lessons, and too many sweets and trifles have gone to her lips, and too few stivers to her charity box. Dietrich, I trust, will be a polite, manly boy for the future, and Maike will endeavour to shine as a student. Let her remember, too, that economy and thrift are needed in the foundation of a worthy and generous life. Little Katie has been cruel to the cat more than once. St. Nicholas can hear the cat cry when its tail is pulled. I will forgive her if she will remember from this hour that the smallest dumb creatures have feelings and must not be abused. As Katie burst into a frightened cry, the saint graciously remained silent until she was soothed. Master Brown, he resumed, I warn thee that boys who are in the habit of putting snuff upon the footstove of the schoolmistress may one day be discovered and receive a flogging. Master Brown coloured and stared in great astonishment. But thou art such an excellent scholar, I shall make thee no further reproof. Now, Hendrik, didst distinguish thyself in the archery match last spring, and hit the duel, footnote, bullseye, end of footnote, though the bird was swung before it to unsteady thine eye. I give thee credit for excelling in manly sport and exercise, though I must not unduly countenance thy boat racing, since it leaves thee too little time for thy proper studies. Lucrezia and Hilda shall have a blessed sleep to-night. Their consciousness of kindness to the poor, devotion in their souls, and cheerful, hearty obedience to household rule will render them happy. With one and all I avow myself well content. Goodness, industry, benevolence, and thrift have prevailed in your midst. Therefore my blessing upon you and may the new year find all treading the paths of obedience, wisdom, and love. Tomorrow you shall find more substantial proofs that I have been in your midst. Farewell. With these words came a great shower of sugar plums upon a linen sheet spread out in front of the doors. A general scramble followed. The children fairly tumbled over each other in their eagerness to fill their baskets. Madame cautiously helped the baby down in their midst till the chubby little fists were filled. Then the bravest of the youngsters sprang up and burst open the closed doors. In vain they peered into the mysterious apartment. St. Nicholas was nowhere to be seen. Soon there was a general rush to another room, where stood a table covered with the finest and whitest of linen damask. Each child, in a flutter of excitement, laid a shoe upon it. The door was then carefully locked, and its key hidden in the mother's bedroom. Next followed good-night kisses, a grand family procession to the upper floor, 
merry farewells at bedroom doors, and silence at last reigned in the Van Gleck mansion. Early the next morning, the door was solemnly unlocked and opened in the presence of the assembled household, when, lo, a sight appeared proving St. Nicholas to be a saint of his word. Every shoe was filled to overflowing, and beside each stood many a colored pile. The table was heavy with its load of presents, candies, toys, trinkets, books, and other articles. Everyone had gifts, from grandfather down to the baby. Little Katie clapped her hands with glee, and vowed inwardly that the cat should never know another moment's grief. Hendrik capered about the room, flourishing a superb bow and arrows over his head. Hilda laughed with delight as she opened the crimson box and drew forth its glittering contents. The rest chuckled and said, Oh, and ah, over their treasures very much as we did here in America on last Christmas Day. With her glittering necklace in her hands and a pile of books in her arms, Hilda stole towards her parents and held up her beaming face for a kiss. There was such an earnest, tender look in her bright eyes that her mother breathed a blessing as she leaned over her. I am delighted with this book. Thank you, father she said, touching the top one with her chin. I shall read it all day long. Ay, sweetheart, said Meinheer, you cannot do better. There is no one like Father Katz. If my daughter learns his moral emblems by heart, the mother and I may keep silent. The work you have there is the emblems, his best work. You will find it enriched with rare engravings from Van de Venne. Considering that the back of the book was turned away, Mynheer certainly showed a surprising familiarity with an unopened volume presented by St. Nicholas. It was strange, too, that the saint should have found certain things made by the elder children and have actually placed them upon the table, labelled with parents' and grandparents' names. But all were too much absorbed in happiness to notice slight inconsistencies. Hilda saw, on her father's face, the rapt expression he always wore when he spoke of Jacob Katz, so she put her armful of books upon the table and resigned herself to listen. Old Father Katz, my child, was a great poet, not a writer of plays like the Englishman Shakespeare, who lived in his time. I have read them in the German, and very good they are. Very, very good but not like Father Katz. Katz sees no daggers in the air. He has no white women falling in love with dusky moors, no young fools sighing to be a lady's glove, no crazy princes mistaking respectable old gentlemen for rats. No, no, he writes only sense. It is great wisdom in little bundles, a bundle for every day of your life. You can guide a state with Katz's poems, and you can put a little baby to sleep with his pretty songs. He was one of the greatest men of Holland. When I take you to the Hague, I will show you the cloister kerk where he lies buried. There was a man for you to study, my sons. He was good through and through. What did he say? O oh Lord, let me obtain this from thee, to live with patience and to die with pleasure. Did patience mean folding his hands? No, he was a lawyer, statesman, ambassador, farmer, philosopher, historian, and poet. He was keeper of the great seal of Holland. He was a... Bah, there is too much noise here, I cannot talk. And Mynheer, looking with astonishment into the bowl of his meerschaum, for it had gone out, nodded to his vrouw and left the apartment in great haste. The fact is, his discourse had been accompanied throughout with a subdued chorus of barking dogs, squeaking cats, and bleating lambs, to say nothing of a noisy ivory cricket that the baby was whirling with infinite delight. At the last, little Huygens, taking advantage of the increasing loudness of Mynheer's tones, had ventured a blast on his new trumpet, 
and wolfert had hastily attempted an accompaniment on the drum this had brought matters to a crisis and well for the little creatures that it had the saint had left no ticket for them to attend a lecture on jacob Katz. it was not an appointed part of the ceremonies therefore when the youngsters saw that the mother looked neither frightened nor offended they gathered new courage the grand chorus rose triumphant and frolic and joy reigned supreme good saint nicholas for the sake of the young hollanders i for one am willing to acknowledge him and defend his reality against all unbelievers End of section eighty one this recording is in the public domain recording by phone section eighty two of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 82, In and Out of a Cab in Amsterdam, by F. Hopkinson Smith. It is raining this morning in Amsterdam. It is a way it has in Holland. The old settlers did not seem to mind it. But I am only a few days from the land of the orange and the olive. And, although those wet silvery grays and fresh greens are full of quality, I long for the deep blue skies and clear-cut meadows of sunny Spain. On this particular morning, I am in a cab and in search of a certain fish market. And Cabby is following the directions given him by a very round porter with a very flat cap and a deep bass voice. There is nothing so comfortable as a cab to paint in, if you only know how to utilize its resources. For me, long practice has brought it to a fine art. First, I have Cabby take out the horse. This prevents his shaking me. When he changes his tired leg, he is generally a spiral spring-fed beast and enjoys the relief. Then I take out the cushions. This keeps them dry. Then I close the back and off-side curtains so as to concentrate the light, prop my easel up against the front seat, spread my palette and brushes on the bare wooden one, hang my rubber water bottle up to the armrest, and began work. I have even discovered in the bottom of certain cabs such luxuries as knot or auger holes through which to pour my waste water. I then pass the umbrella staff to Cabby, calling particular attention to the iron spike, and explain how useful it may become in removing the inquisitive small boy from the hind wheel. One lesson and two boys makes a cabby inexpert. This is why I am in a cab and am driving down the Kaisergracht on this very wet morning in Amsterdam. Before the fat porter's directions could be fully carried out, however, I caught sight of an old bridge spanning a canal, which pleased me greatly, and before my friend on the box could realize the consequences, I had his horse out and tied to a wharf post and the interior of his cab transformed into a studio. In five minutes I discovered that a cabless horse and a horseless cab, presided over by a cabby armed with an umbrella staff, was not an everyday sight in Amsterdam. I had camped on the stone quay some distance from the street, and out of everybody's way. I congratulated myself on my location, and felt sure I should not be disturbed. On my left was the canal crowded with market boats laden with garden truck, on my right, the narrow street choked with the traffic of the city. Suddenly, the business of Amsterdam ceased. Everybody on the large boats scrambled into smaller ones and sculled for shore. Everybody in the street simultaneously jumped from cart, wagon, and doorstep, and in twenty seconds I was overwhelmed by a surging throng, who swarmed about my four-wheeler and blocked up my only window with anxious inquiring faces. I had been in a crowd like this before and I knew exactly what to do. Sphinx-like silence and immobility of face are imperative. If you neither speak nor smile, the mob imbibes a kind of respect for you, amounting almost to awe. Those nearest you who can see a little and want to see more, unconsciously become your champions, 
and expostulate with those who cannot see anything cautioning them against shaking the painter and obstructing his view this crowd was no exception to the general rule i noticed however one peculiarity as each amsterdammer reached my window he would gaze silently at my canvas and then say ah tikkenmeester soon the word went around and reached the belated citizens rushing up who stopped and appeared satisfied as they all exclaimed ah tikkenmeester at last commerce resumed her sway the street disentangled itself the market in cabbages again became active and i was left comparatively alone always excepting the small boy the variety here was singularly irritating they mounted the roof blocked up the windows clambered up on the front seat until cabby became sufficiently conversant with the use of the business end of my umbrella staff after which they kept themselves at a respectful distance finally a calm settled down over everything the rain fell gently and continuously the spiral spring beast rested himself on alternate legs and the boys contemplated me from a distance cabby leaned on the off window and became useful as a cup holder and i was rapidly finishing my first sketch in holland when the light was shut out and looking up i saw the head of an officer of police he surveyed me keenly my sketch and my interior arrangements and then in a gruff voice gave me an order in low dutch i pointed to my staff holder and continued painting in a moment the officer thrust his head through the off window and repeated his order in high dutch i waved him away firmly again referred him to the cabby then a war began on the outside in which everybody took a hand and in half a minute more the population of amsterdam had blocked up the wharf i preserved my egyptian exterior and proceeded unconcernedly to lay a fresh wash over my sky while thus occupied i became conscious that the spiral spring was being united once more to the cab this fact became positive when cabby delivered up the umbrella staff and opened the door i got out the gentleman in gilt buttons was at a white heat the mass meeting were indulging in a burning fire of criticism punctuated by loose cabbage leaves and rejected vegetables which sailed bomb-like through the air and the upshot of the whole matter was that the officer ordered me away from the quay and into a side street but why the streets of amsterdam were free i was out of everybody's way was breaking no law and creating no disturbance at this instant half of yesterday's cabbage came sailing through the atmosphere from a spot in the direction of a group of wharf rats struck the officer's helmet and rolled it into the canal a yell went up from the crowd cabby went down to the water for the headgear and the owner drew his short sword and charged on the wharf rats who suddenly disappeared i re-entered my studio shut the door and continued my work i concluded that it was not my funeral i remember distinctly the situation at this moment i had my water bottle in my hand refilling the cups mouthful of brushes palette on my lap an easel steadied by one foot suddenly a face surmounted by a wet helmet and livid with rage was thrust into mine and a three-cornered variety of dialect that would produce a sore throat in any one except a dutchman was hurled at me accompanied by the usual well-known move on gesture remembering the soothing influence exerted on the former mob i touched my hat to his excellency and said tikkenmeester the head disappeared like a shot and in an instant i was flat on my back in the bottom of the cab bespattered with water smeared with paint and half smothered under a debris of cushions water cups wet paper and loose sketches and in that position was unceremoniously jolted over the stones the majesty of the law had asserted itself i was backed up in a side street i broke open the door and crawled out in the rain his excellency was standing at the head of the spiral spring with a sardonic grin on his countenance the mob greeted my appearance with a shout of derision i mounted the driver's seat and harangued them i asked in a voice which might have been heard in rotterdam if anybody about me understood english a shabbily dressed threadbare young fellow elbowed his way towards me and said he did i helped him up beside me on the box and addressed the multitude my seedy friend interpreting i reviewed the history of old amsterdam and its traditions its reputation for hospitality its powerful colonies scattered over the world its love for art and artists then i passed to the greatest of all its possessions 
the new amsterdam of the new world my own city and asked them as amsterdamers or the reverse whether they considered i had been fairly treated in the city of my great-grandfathers i a painter and a new yorker i had come three thousand miles to carry home to their children in the new world some sketches of the grand old city they loved so well and in return i had been insulted abused bumped over the stones and made a laughing-stock i would appeal to them as brothers to decide whether these streets of amsterdam were not always open to her descendants and whether i was not entitled to use them at all times by virtue of my birthright another shout went up but this time a friendly one this being the case i proposed to reoccupy my position and finish my sketch if i had violated any law it was the duty of the officer to put me under arrest if not then i was free to do as i pleased and if the highly honorable group of influential citizens about me would open their ranks i would drive the cab back myself to the spot from which i had been so cruelly torn another prolonged shout followed the interpretation an opening was quickly made and i had begun to chafe the spiral spring with my shabby friend's umbrella when cabby rushed forward pale and trembling seizing the bridle and begged me piteously to desist my friend then explained that cabby would probably lose his license if i persisted although i might carry my point and his cab back to the quay this argument being unanswerable a council of war was held to which a number of citizens who were leaning over the front wheels were invited and it was decided to drive at once to the nearest police station and submit the whole outrage to the chief in two minutes we halted under the traditional green glass lamp so familiar to all frequenters of such places we saluted the sergeant and were shown up a winding iron staircase into a small room and up to a long green table behind which sat a bald-headed old fellow in undress uniform, smoking a short pipe. My threadbare friend explained the cause of our visit. The old fellow looked surprised, and touched a bell which brought in another smoker in full dress, whose right ear served as a rack for a quill pin, and who used it, the pin not the ear, to take down our statement. Then the chief turned to me and asked my name. I gave it. This he repeated to the secretary. Occupation? painter tiki meester said he to the secretary magic word i have you at last tiki meester is dutch for painter the chief read the secretary's notes signed them and said i should call again in ten days and he would submit a report report what do i want with a report your imperial highness it is now four o'clock and i have but two hours of daylight to finish this sketch I don't want a report. I want an order compelling the pirate who presides over the cabbage market district to respect the rights of a descendant of Amsterdam who is peacefully pursuing his avocation. Certainly, he so intended. I was at liberty to replace my cab and finish my sketch. The officer exceeded his instructions, but how? I did not want either to provoke a riot or get my cabby into trouble. Ah, uh, he understood. Another bell brought an orderly who conducted us downstairs, opened a side door, called two officers, placed one outside with Cabby, and the other inside with me and Threadbare. And we drove straight back to the quay and were welcomed by a shout from my constituents, compared to which all former cheering was a dead silence. I looked around for His Excellency, but he was nowhere to be seen. Verily, the majesty of the law had asserted itself. I do not think I made much of an impression as a painter in Amsterdam but i have always had an idea that i could be elected alderman in the cabbage market district end of section eighty two this recording is in the public domain section eighty three of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The World's Story, Volume 7 Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappen. Section 83 The Beloved Queen Wilhelmina, born in 1880, by William Elliot Griffiths. No sovereign was ever more beloved by her people than the girl Queen Wilhelmina 
who as the nineteenth century drew to a close was the last scion of the house of orange for all other heirs in the direct line had passed away the close tie of mutual affection between this illustrious family and the dutch nation is one of the grand things in history on the eve of the royal inauguration as queen emma announced in dignified and fitting terms her intended abdication in favour of her daughter so also wilhelmina wrote what reads like a love-letter to my people asking for their love and loyalty the new church in amsterdam as in the case of her three royal ancestors was the place chosen for her to take her oath of office and to receive the loyal vows of the ministers on the morning of inauguration day september sixth eighteen ninety eight the festivities were ushered in with music in the air in most of the large church spires are chimes of bells numbering from a score to a hundred the players frequently give concerts up in the air while every day the bells strike the hours halves and quarters the chimes ringing out a merry tune a stanza of a hymn an operatic air or some patriotic or lullaby song on the morning of september five initiating the national honeymoon the carillons in the steeples had begun early amsterdam looked more like fairyland than an ordinary city the shops were closed and crowds from all the country round filled the streets with a million of happy people good-natured and well-behaved the mother and daughter the king's widow and the queen left the hague and arrived in the capital city on the y early in the afternoon this was the beginning of the joyous entry wilhelmina sat with her mother in an open carriage smiling to the people and greeting them with wavings of her little lace handkerchief while their throats became hoarse with shouts of welcome arriving at the great square in front of the palace she rode round and entering the building soon reappeared on the veranda facing her in welcome were ranged the representatives of every branch of the military and naval service cavalry infantry artillery engineers marines and sailors besides a company of young gentlemen dressed in the uniform of the time of prince maurice in the seventeenth century these looked as gay and bright as a swarm of beetles or butterflies they were armed with long pikes and the shotmen had heavy muskets which when they fired they rested on prongs or supports their evolutions attracted much attention after the queen had greeted her loyal defenders and sabre rifle carbine and pike had been brought to a present the military filed out and disappeared for a few minutes the square was vacant then by the queen's own order and plan a signal was given and the people flowed in from the seven or eight streets leading into the dumb square and a mass of perhaps fifty thousand human beings filled the space again the queen appeared on the balcony greeting them all smiling and waving her handkerchief while the myriads shouted their delight the next day was the coronation walking from the palace to the new church crowded with the elite of the kingdom the young queen entered and took her seat in the throne chair a picture of radiant health and loveliness she was dressed in white with train skirt over which and hung from her shoulders were four yards of red velvet embroidered with gold she had a tiara of diamonds on her head jewels at her waist and the military cordon of the order of orange over her breast on the left stood a sultan rajas and vassal rulers her dark-skinned subjects from insolent the east indies and deputies from the colonies on the right were her ministers of state and her princely relatives and in front the members of the states general and chosen guests from the netherlands and from many nations just as the fair young queen rose to read her speech the clouds broke and the sunlight streamed in through the lofty orange memorial window 
making radiant her graceful form. Her enunciation was made with wonderful clearness, and she was heard all over the house. She said she would make the words of her royal father her own. The House of Orange can never, no, never, do enough for the Netherlands. At this, many eyes, even of stern men and grey-haired statesmen, overflowed. When she closed, with eyes and jewelled right hand uplifted to heaven, with the prayer, So help me truly, God Almighty, a thrill of joy and hope spread through all hearts. At the signal of the herald, all rose and shouted, Live the Queen! Mutual oaths of loyalty and of faithfulness to the Constitution were exchanged by the Queen and her legislators. The four banners, of the Netherlands, of the House of Orange, of North Holland, and of the city of Amsterdam, dipped in salutation to the sovereign, thus inaugurated, and the impressive ceremony was over. Then followed two weeks of royal and popular festivities and rejoicing. To honour their queen, the poor people of Amsterdam had contributed their money and bought a golden coach, superbly made and decorated, in which they expected her to ride to the ceremony. She, however, preferred to walk under a canopy the few feet between the doors of the palace and the church, but told them that she would reserve the golden coach until her wedding day. Those who kept carrier pigeons had sent from the cities, towns, villages, and hamlets all over the kingdom their trained birds to Amsterdam. They were released all at one moment, on the day given up to popular sports, in presence of the young queen, to carry home the news. In all the cities and towns there were decorations and celebrations, banquets and merry-making, with parades of the children. But in Amsterdam and at The Hague, the festivities reached the acme of glory. The streets, bridges, houses, and public buildings were adorned with the red, white, and blue of their rulers. The sailors, the soldiers, the mechanics, and all the different kinds of societies, and even the orphans and companies of boys and girls, wished to have some special ark, trophy, or token of loyalty in some form. The water feast at night, as became the country under the sea level, was perhaps the most brilliant of all the outdoor spectacles. On and over the canals were stretched tens of thousands of Japanese lanterns and coloured lamps. On the bosom of the river, craft of every sort, built on the models of many nations, floated and moved about. Their myriads of light were reflected in the water, increasing the splendour. In the gardens were thousands more of lamps, set in among the grass and flowers, while in front of the house were varied devices in star and flower, wreath and blazonry, the Lion of Holland, and the arms of the kingdom, provinces and cities, blossoming in jets of fire. During the following summer of 1899, the Peace Congress, called by the Tsar of Russia and assembling by invitation at The Hague, held its sessions at the house in the wood, built by Amalia von Solms, in memory of her husband, Prince Frederick Henry. Principles were discussed and rules laid down which must, in time, mitigate the horrors of war. In the great church at Delft, exercises were held in honour of Grotius, the Dutch scholar whose writings on international law had made the international court of arbitration possible. Our ambassador to Germany, Andrew D. White, delivered the oration. In the name of the United States, the great Pacific power, a wreath of silver-gilt leaves and palms, was laid on the grave of Grotius. During the war in South Africa between the Britons and the Boers, the Dutch looked on with intense sympathy, but took no part in the strife, they having long ago retired from the active politics of Europe content to do their part of the world's work in other ways than in war. At the polls, during the summer of 1900, the anti-revolutionary party triumphed over the liberals, and Dr. Abraham Kuyper was made premier. 
he was active in securing peace in south africa and the dutch gave hearty welcome to the boer generals who visited holland in nineteen o two on the sixteenth of october nineteen hundred wilhelmina wrote another little love letter an mein volk to my people announcing her engagement to duke hendrik of mecklenburg schweren on the seventh of february nineteen o one after riding in her golden coach to the great church in the hague they were united in marriage according to the ritual of the reformed dutch church by the court chaplain dr van der Fleer again for a fortnight the cities of the netherlands were in festal array by day and illuminated at night while the royal couple celebrated their honeymoon in recent years especially since the celebrations by the dutch people of the three hundredth anniversary of many a stirring event of the eighty years war of independence through the stimulus given to the study of dutch history by our own historian motley the endowment of chairs of history in the universities and the formation of historical societies there has been a revival of patriotic interest in the past the fruits of this feeling are seen in the numerous statues tablets and other works of art which make a tour in the netherlands so fascinating to the student who would know in detail the long and glorious study of the dutch people End of section 83. This recording is in the public domain. Section 84 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Read for LibriVox.org by Scotty Smith. Switzerland, Part 1. In Earliest Times. Historical Note. In the days of the Romans, Switzerland was occupied by the Rations and the Helvetians. The latter, weary of their narrow boundaries, set out for the fertile fields of Gaul, but in 58 B.C. were forced by Julius Caesar to return to their abandoned homes. In the same century, the Rations were subdued by the Romans. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Switzerland was conquered by the Franks. In the 7th century, St. Columban and a band of Irish monks converted the people to Christianity, and founded churches and monasteries, many of which endure to this day. When Charlemagne died, his realms were divided. One portion of Switzerland became part of the German kingdom, and another portion became part of Burgundy. In the eleventh century, the part that was under the rule of Burgundy passed into the hands of Germany, and was immediately dependent upon the empire. During the Dark Ages, feudalism flourished in Switzerland even more than in other countries of Europe, and the land was held by a great number of nobles and ecclesiastics. Prominent among these feudal lords were the Habsburgs, who steadily increased their territory and influence until, in the thirteenth century, they were the strongest power in the land. End of section 84. This recording is in the public domain. Section 85 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7. Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 85. The Siege of the Lake Dwellers by Sir Arthur Helps. In the summer of 1854, the water of the Swiss lakes was unusually low, and remains of piles and implements of stone and bone were discovered in great numbers, together with remains of grain, beans, apples, flax, basket work, ornaments, spears, lances, and the bones of many animals. It was plain that at some very early age people had lived in houses built upon these piles, and by carefully studying the remains, considerable knowledge of the folk themselves, their houses, and their ways of living has been obtained. The following extract is from a romance founded upon the supposed life in one of these lake villages. The Editor Immediately after Raelma's retreat into the town, the causeways were destroyed, the drawbridges pulled up, 
and every part of the town finally prepared for a state of siege. Before describing this siege, it is necessary to give some notion of the skill of the inhabitants of Ababa in the art of building. This is the more necessary as it is a fond idea of modern people that they are preeminent in that art. Overlooking the masses of falseness, pretentiousness, and inappropriateness which deform so large a part of their greatest towns. It would rather astonish them if they could see again ancient Mexico, Thebes, Memphis, Nineveh, Babylon, and Cusco, the last perhaps the grandest city that has ever been built upon this earth. The construction of these lake cities was also most remarkable. In the remains of one of them, there are this day to be seen the relics of about twenty thousand piles. Now the art of pile-driving is a most difficult one, and those who are skilled in it move from place to place where their services are wanted. But if we were to say to the inhabitants of any ordinary English town, build us with all the means and appliances that are at your command, but without any aid from specially skilled workmen, a town upon water which shall have for its basis twenty thousand piles, well, we should find from their difficulties and their failures what great mechanical and workmanlike skill would be requisite for such an undertaking, and should have a just respect for the powers, the skill, and the perseverance of the men of Ababa. Five days after the Battle of the Ramasa, the enemy commenced the siege. They naturally commenced it at the southern part of the town, which was the part nearest the shore. They had employed the intervening days in constructing rafts, which they did by tying together the smaller trees which they had hewn down in the great wood. A low, long building, devoted to barracks, formed the principal defense on the southern side of the town. It was, in fact, a long semi-enclosed balcony, for the most part open to the back, but having in front only those openings which admitted of missiles being thrown from them. Railma's plan of defense for this building was very singular. He meant for the enemy to take it, and to perish after they had taken it. The whole of the flooring was to fall into the water, and the enemy with it immediately after they had occupied it. But what showed his skill in its construction and his knowledge of human nature was that he had planned that this falling in of the flooring should take place in separate portions, separately. Between the piles there was generally a portion of the flooring that would enable thirty men to stand upon it and defend it, and each of these compartments was so constructed that, by the cutting of a single cord, it would descend into the water. Railma knew well that if all the men who were to defend this position knew that the flooring was suddenly, and perhaps without their knowledge, to descend into the water, they would be apprehensive of being left with the enemy and perishing with them. He also knew that if it depended upon the occupants of any particular compartment, or rather upon their captain, at what moment the flooring of that compartment should fall in, the men defending it would fight bravely to the last. To ensure and reward this bravery, he offered a reward of iron swords with amber handles to the survivors of that band of thirty men who should make the stoutest resistance. The enemy advanced upon their rafts to the attack with great determination and with great confidence of success. Their advance was covered by three thousand archers who occupied a small eminence just above the shore and whose missiles dealt death to many a brave defender who but for a moment exposed himself to their deadly shafts. The besieged on their part were not inactive. Many of the attacking party fell by their iron-pointed javelins. Many more were disabled by the boiling pitch poured down over them as they neared the fortress. Still they pressed on, and swarming up the low building, found entrance here and there. For fully an hour the attack and the defense were vigorously maintained. The time would have been much shorter, but that the archers who formed the covering party on the hill were no longer able to give assistance to their friends, when besiegers and besieged were commingled in the fight. At length the enemy gained entrance at all points, and then the stratagem of Railma had its full effect. 
the floorings everywhere descended almost simultaneously and nothing was to be heard but the cries of drowning men shouting helplessly for succor from their friends who were cut off from them thus ended the first day's siege with a signal failure on the part of the besiegers end of section 85 this recording is in the public domain Section 86 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 7, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 86 the flight of the helvetians fifty eight b c by eva march tappan once upon a time the helvetians as the people of switzerland were then called began to be restless on one side of their country was the rhine on another the lofty jura mountains and on the third lake geneva and the rhone river they were crowded they needed more land and as they were brave and successful warriors they saw no reason why they should not in the simple and direct fashion of those days march out to some fertile district and take possession of it so they began to make ready they bought wagons and oxen and they cultivated as much grain as possible and when the third year had come they were ready to set out on their march they burned their bridges for they set fire to their villages and strongholds and even to the provisions that they could not carry with them so that even if any of the people became discouraged they would have to fight their way onward for there would be only a desolated country behind them a most important question was which way they should march they could go between the jura mountains and the rhone but the pass was hardly wide enough for even a cart track moreover a high mountain overhung it and it would be an easy matter for a little group of the sequanians who dwelt in that region to stop them the other way was through the roman province this was much easier for the allobroges lived in the province and even if the allobroges should refuse to let them pass the helvetians were confident that they could force their way through but in rome was the wise general julius caesar gaul was under his control and he felt sure that no body of restless warriors would pass through the province without doing damage he did not refuse at once however but told the helvetians that he would consider the matter and in about a fortnight they might come for his answer then this wary young commander set to work to make ramparts and trenches and redoubts as fast as possible and by the time that the helvetians returned he was ready for them he told them that it was not the custom of the romans to allow people to march through their provinces and that if they tried to go through without permission he would see to it that they were prevented the helvetians did not give up their plan caesar had torn down the bridge over the rhone at geneva but some of them forded the river and others crossed it by lashing boats together and making rafts this was not of much use for the romans were on the opposite shore well prepared to meet them there was nothing to do but to try the narrow pass here they were fortunate for the sequani agreed that if the helvetians would promise to do no mischief they might march through their country so through the pass the helvetians went and soon they were in the country of the eduans they were no longer bound by promises of good behaviour and they captured the towns ravaged the lands and carried off the children as slaves to their hearts content the eduans however were good friends of caesar and had been honoured by the title of allies of the roman people and caesar made no delay in coming to help them the helvetians were crossing the river sone in the same fashion that they had crossed the rhone they had been at work for twenty days and only three-fourths of them had passed over caesar came upon those who had not yet crossed and attacked them then he made a bridge and in one day he and his men were on the other side of the river in just one day he had accomplished what the helvetians had been struggling for twenty days to do it is no wonder that they were alarmed nevertheless they had no idea of giving up they sent a messenger to caesar 
to say that they wished to be friends with the romans and if he cared to make peace with them they were perfectly willing to make their homes wherever he wished but if you persist in opposing us the envoy said in a lordly fashion remember that in the days when lucius cassius was consul the helvetians slew him and forced his army to pass under the yoke even if you did rout one division of our troops when they were separated from the others you need not despise us or exalt your own prowess you would do better to consider the possibility that the place where you may make your stand against us will perhaps receive a name because of a defeat of the romans caesar replied haughtily that when the gods intended to punish a man for his offences they often granted him a period of prosperity so that he might feel a reverse of fortune the more keenly he realized fully the damage that they had done to the romans there was no need of calling that to mind nevertheless if they would make up to the eduans and the allobroges for the harm that they had done and would bring hostages to himself for their good behaviour he would agree to make peace the helvetians are in the habit of receiving hostages not of giving them retorted the proud warrior and then he turned about and left the roman camp of course a battle ensued the helvetians were successful they marched jubilantly up the valley of the Sone, and caesar followed he tried to surprise them but his spies had brought him mistaken reports and he did not succeed finally they attacked him and then there was a battle indeed far into the night they fought and so many romans were slain that caesar remained on the field for three days to care for the wounded and bury the dead the helvetians fled but they might as well have stood still for caesar sent messengers to the people from whom they expected to get food forbidding them to supply it unless they wished him to look upon them as having become allies of his enemies the helvetians were then without food and in an enemy's country they could do nothing but surrender their envoys wept and lamented and fell at caesar's feet and besought him to make peace with them caesar bade them all to remain where they were and await his arrival they waited but in great fear of how he might punish them to avenge the wrong done to his allies when caesar came up with them he ordered them to surrender their arms and all the slaves that had deserted to them and to give hostages for their obedience they agreed of course for they could do nothing else but that night they talked the matter over and one of their four clans or divisions consisting of about six thousand men became so alarmed at the thought of their own helplessness without their arms that they slipped away in the darkness hoping to escape to the territory of the germans caesar soon found out what had happened he sent word to the tribes through whose lands they would pass to bring them back to him just how he punished them is not known for all that he said about it was that he treated them like enemies the others he sent back to switzerland and so ended the flight of the helvetians end of section eighty six this recording is in the public domain section eighty seven of germany the netherlands and switzerland this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter The World Story, Volume 7 Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 87 The Devil's Bridge Over the Rus By H. A. Gerber the old-fashioned stage road, which winds its way over the St. Gotthard, passes through Scholinen, Gershinen, the entrance to the St. Gotthard Tunnel, and over the new Devil's Bridge. This is built across the Rus at a time where steep rocks tower above and below it on all sides, and where the scenery is extremely wild and impressive. From the new bridge one can see the remains of a more ancient structure, of which the following legend is told as well as of all old bridges built in dangerous or difficult places, such as that of pont le over the Sarine in Fribourg, and the one in the ravine of the Morge in the Valais. Already in very olden times, the people of Uri had discovered that if they could only establish a safe road over the St. Gotthard mountain, they would be able to earn many a penny by trading with Italy. They therefore spared neither pains nor expense, 
and built one foot after another of the road, even piercing the hard rock in one spot to make what is still known as the Urner Loch, or Hole of Uri. Countless, apparently, insurmountable obstacles were gradually overcome, and the road, which had been begun on both sides of the mountain, was rapidly drawing close together near the banks of the Rus. There, however, the builders paused, appalled, on either bank, for it seemed quite impossible to bridge the awful chasm near the falls. A meeting was therefore called at Gershenen, where, although there was no lack of talking, smoking, and drinking, no satisfactory decision could be reached. A stranger, clad in black, with broad-brimmed hat and bold hair and feather, sat at a neighboring table and listened attentively to this discussion. Finally, seeing the meeting about to break up, he drew near the talkers, and taking a seat beside the principal magistrate in front of the fire, announced that he was a famous bridge-builder, and could span the stream before morning. He even offered to show them a fine bridge there at dawn, on the next day, provided they were willing to pay his price. One and all now exclaimed that nothing he could ask would seem too much, so the stranger in black quickly responded, "'Very well, then, it is a bargain.' "'Tomorrow you shall have your bridge, but in payment I shall claim the first living thing which passes over it. Here is my hand upon it.' Saying these words, he seized the hand of the astonished magistrate beside him, and before anyone could add another word, disappeared. The people gazed at one another in silence for a moment, then made furtive signs of the cross. As soon as the chief magistrate could speak, he loudly declared the stranger must be his satanic majesty in person. In support of this assertion, he declared that the stranger, while sitting in front of the fire, had boldly thrust his feet right into the red-hot coals, where he kept them while talking, as if the heat were agreeable to him, and added that he had distinctly felt sharp claws when the man in black shook hands with him to close the bargain. All now shuddered with fear, and a general wail of terror arose, but a tailor who was present at the meeting promptly bade his fellow citizens fear not, for he would settle the bill with their architect on the morrow. This offer was gladly accepted. The meeting was speedily dissolved, and all hastened home, because none of them cared to be out after dark while still under the spell of their recent encounter with the spirit of evil. That night no one slept in the neighborhood, for although the sky had been clear when they went to bed, a sudden storm arose and raged with fury until morning. Amid the roll of thunder, incessant flashes of vivid lightning and violent gusts of wind, they heard the splitting and falling of rocks, which seemed to roll all the way down the steep mountainside and crash into the valley. But when morning came, no signs of storm were left, and as soon as the sun had risen and they again dared venture out, all rushed forth in a body to see what had happened. When they drew near the roofs, they could not sufficiently express their wonder and admiration, for a fine stone bridge arched boldly over the swift stream. On the opposite sides to the black garb stranger, grinning fiendishly and encouraging the people by word and gesture to test his bridge by walking across it. Just then the tailor appeared, carrying a large bag. He advanced as if to cross first, but instead of setting foot upon the structure, deftly opened his bag, from which escaped rats and mice, closely followed by a few cats. The devil, for it was he, gave a yell of rage when he saw himself thus outwitted, and forgetting the part he had played until then, cast off his disguise and ran down Gershenin for a huge rock which he intended to hurl at the bridge so as to wreck it entirely before any other living creature could cross. On his way back, however, Satan met a little old woman, who, frightened by his black looks, made a sign of the cross which caused him to drop his burden and beat a hasty retreat into his own realm. To this day, however, the people still point out the huge boulder in which the marks of Satan's claws are still visible, and which is known as the Devil's Stone. According to another version, the devil no sooner saw himself outwitted than he seized handfuls of rock which he hurled at the bridge. But these missiles were all deflected by a cross which the tailor planted in the middle of the structure as soon as the animals reached the other side. These big stones now lie scattered in the bed of the Rus, and around the pillars of the bridge, where, to the devil's constant chagrin, they only serve to strengthen his construction. 
To avenge himself in a slight measure, however, the evil one posted one of his own imps in this valley. When travellers pass, this demon pounces down upon them unseen, and with a slight mocking whistle tosses them into the middle of the stream. This imp, known as the Hatfiend, or Hut Shelm, still haunts the valley, although centuries have passed since the devil played the part of engineer for the people of Uri. End of section 87 this recording is in the public domain. Section 88 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090. California, United States of America. Switzerland, Part 2. How the Swiss Gained Their Freedom. Historical Note. In the early part of the 13th century, the three forest cantons of Uri, Swage, and Interwalden were governed by the Counts of Habsburg, who, in the previous century, had risen from obscurity to the position of powerful landed proprietors. Legally, the inhabitants of the greater part of these districts were subject only to the German emperor, for whom the Habsburgs acted as stewards, and all attempts of the latter to exercise absolute authority over the cantons met with sturdy resistance. In 1273, Rudolf, the head of this family, was elected emperor, and a few years later became Archduke of Austria. The Swiss felt that their ancient liberties were endangered by the steadily increasing power of the Habsburgs, and a few days after the death of Rudolf, in 1291, the men of three cantons met together and formed an everlasting league for mutual protection. This league was the foundation of the Swiss Republic. For several years, the Habsburgs forbore to assert their authority in the cantons. And it was not until 1315 that Leopold of Habsburg, with the flower of Austrian chivalry, attempted to subdue the liberty-loving mountaineers. At Mortgarten, the Austrian army was completely defeated by a small band of Swiss and to this day a service is held each year on November 15th, in memory of the victory. After the Battle of Morgarten, the Swiss cantons renewed their union, and were gradually joined by one after another of the remaining districts. All attempts of Austria to reassert her authority were in vain, and by the close of the 15th century, Switzerland had entirely freed itself from Habsburg control. End of section 88 this recording is in the public domain. Section 89 of Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Marland in Switzerland. The World Story, Volume 7. Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 89. The Meeting at the Rutli, 1307, by Heinrich Jocker. This and the two following selections, dealing with the oppressions of the Habsburgs, come originally from chronicles written two or three centuries later, and must be regarded as legends rather than as history. The Editor. They, Gessler and Landenberg, did as imperial bailiffs had never done before, and took up their abode in the land. Landenberg went to the king's castle, near Sarnen in Obwalden, and Gessler built for himself a tower in the country of Uri. The taxes were increased, the smallest offences punished by imprisonment and heavy fines, the country people treated with haughtiness and contempt. Gessler, passing on horseback before Stauffacher's new house in the village of Steinen, cried out insultingly, "'Shall peasants be allowed to build so finely?' And when Arnold Anderholden, of Melchthal in Unterwalden, was condemned for some slight offence to lose a yoke of fine oxen, Landenberg's servants took the oxen from the plough and said, "'Peasants may draw the plough themselves.' But young Arnold, Irritated by this insult, struck the servant and broke two of his fingers. Then he fled into the mountains. In revenge, 
Landenberg put out both the eyes of Arnold's old father. Whoever, on the contrary, adhered to the bailiff and did his will, was treated with indulgence and was always in the right. But all did not escape, who, trusting in the protection of the bailiff, thought themselves entitled to do evil, and, as there was no longer any justice to be had in the land, each man helped himself, and this occasioned many disorders. But the bailiffs laughed and persisted in their tyranny. They not only trod underfoot the chartered franchises of the people, sanctioned by emperors and kings, but disregarded the everlasting right to life which God has given to every man. While the oppressors laughed and the oppressed groaned in the valley of the Volstatten, the wife of Werner Stauffacher in the village of Steinen said to her husband, how long shall the oppressors laugh and the oppressed groan? Shall foreigners be masters of this soil and heirs of our property? What are the men of the mountains good for? Must we mothers nurse beggars at our bosoms and bring up maid servants for foreigners? Let there be an end to this. Thereupon, Werner Stauffacher, without a word, went down to Brunnen on the lake and over the water to Uri, to Walter I in Attinghausen. With him he found concealed Arnold of Melchthal, who had fled across the mountain from the wrath of Landenberg. They talked of the misery of their country, and of the cruelty of the foreign bailiffs whom the king had sent to them, in contempt of their hereditary franchises and liberties. They also called to mind that they had in vain appealed against the tyranny of the bailiffs before the king, and that the latter had threatened to compel them, in spite of the seals and charters of former emperors and kings, to separate from the empire and submit to Austria. That God had given to no king the right to commit injustice, that they had no hope but in God and their own courage, and that death was much more desirable than so shameful a yoke. They therefore resolved that each should talk with trustworthy and courageous men in his own district, to ascertain the disposition of the people, and what they would undertake for security and liberty. Subsequently, as they had agreed, they met frequently by night, at a secret place on the lake. It lay about midway between Ori, Schweiz, and Unterwalden, in a small bushy meadow at the foot of the rocks of Seelisberg, opposite the little village of Brunnen. It is called Rutli, from the clearing of bushes, there they were far from all human habitations. Soon each brought the joyful news that death was more desirable to all the people than so shameful a yoke. When, on the night of the 17th of November, 1307, they came together, and each of the three had brought with him to the meadow of the Rutli ten true and honourable men, determined to hold the ancient liberty of their fatherland before all, and life as nothing, the pious three raised their hands to the starry heavens and swore to God the Lord, before whom kings and peasants are equal, faithfully to live and to die for the rights of the innocent people. To undertake and carry through everything in unison and not separately. To permit no injustice, but also to commit no injustice. To respect the rights and property of the Counts of Habsburg, and do no harm to the imperial bailiffs, but also to prevent the bailiffs from ruining the country. And the thirty others raised their hands and took the oath, like the three, to God and all the saints, manfully to assert liberty, and they appointed New Year's night for the work. Then they separated, each returned to his valley and to his cabin, and tended his cattle. End of section 89 this recording is in the public domain.